Hello, True Crimeers. I'm filming this like I'm holding a phone, but I'm actually holding my camera filming this because, well, laziness exists. But here's the thing. Um, I'm going to be cheating this week, and my Friday video is going to be the compilation video for the February TikTok stuff. Because, well, I, I just needed a bit of a mental break. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to go like three or four days without filming any true crime stuff. I have like eight or nine drafts over on TikTok that I can just upload that I filmed, you know, previously. I'm just, you know, I need a mental respite. Uh, I gotta sit back and, and watch some, you know, stupid movies and comedy shows and stuff like that just to clear my head. I'm fine. I'm not like in a bad state or anything. I just need to clear my head. So yeah, sorry, this is gonna be a cheat week and there won't be a, a Friday story just a Friday worth of like over five hours of short videos that most of you probably haven't seen from me. I'm f this is this is uh, this is being uploaded on uh, Friday, March first, two thousand twenty-four. If you're watching this in the distant future, but I will have a video uploaded this Monday, my normal, you know, single story video. So any whoozy what's a what's a whoozy what's a what's a whoozy whoozy what's a what's a whoozy what's it's. Yeah, good luck with the captions on that one. Anyway, enjoy, don't enjoy, hate the next five hours of your life because it's all sadness for the most part. I am a very awkward person. Anyway, here's, this is the case of a lot of cases. Viewer discretion. Oh, is advice. An attack on a Greyhound bus would lead to seven people dying. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the 2001 Greyhound bus attack. Viewer discretion is advised. The story happened on October 3rd, 2001 on a Greyhound bus that was going from Chicago, Illinois, all the way to Orlando, Florida. The bus was being driven by this man here, Garfield Sands. He actually took over the route when it hit Indianapolis and then he was going to take it to Atlanta and then a new bus driver would take over but it would never get to its final destination. On the bus was this man here, Demir Igrik. Demir was originally from Croatia, but he came to the United States roughly two years or so before this incident. In Croatia, he was known as someone who had a very violent temper, substance abuse issues, and was extremely erratic. He was also someone who had suffered from some mental health issues, but he decided to never get treatment. And then he found himself aboard a Greyhound bus. Reportedly throughout the trip, he would get up from his seat and approach the driver, Garfield. He asked them like, where are we? Or like, hey, what time is it? He never seemed out of sorts or angry or anything. And then all of a sudden at about four o'clock in the morning, Egrick got out of his seat. He approached the driver with a box cutter and he slit his throat. This happened while he was driving, you know, on the freeway at top speeds. Egrick then takes control of the wheel and he purposely veers it off the side of the road, which causes the bus to flip and crash and slide down a hill. And I believe the bus had rolled over completely one full time. Several passengers would be thrown from the bus because they have pretty large windows and several other passengers had been crushed by the bus. At the initial scene when first responders arrived, there were six people pronounced dead. One other person who was rushed to the hospital would later die from their injuries. One of those deaths was Demir Egrick himself. Oh well. Unbelievably, Garfield Sands actually survived both the, the cutting of his throat and the crash. I mean, he was in the same place that Demir was when the bus crashed, right up the front. And he survived, which is, it's just, that's just incredible. That is a hell of a fighter right there, for sure. As a matter of fact, he was really the hero here because he managed to, when the crash happened, he crawled his way out of the bus and crawled 200 feet, you know, in order to flag down help. There was no motive discovered for why he did this. When this happened, it was about three weeks after the 9-11 attacks. And so all Greyhound buses had stopped operating when this happened, thinking this may have been another form of attack. But then they were able to rule that out. 
but this was at a time when we were all already on edge. This was random. It's stories like this that makes it terrifying to do anything or ever leave your house. He said she was too beautiful to hurt while she was sleeping. Then I just wanted her to be quiet. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Alyssa Wiles. Viewer discretion is advised. Alyssa Dawn Wiles was born on February 15th, 1999, and she was living in Duncan, Oklahoma. Alyssa was a freshman at Duncan High School where everyone described her as a really good student. She never got in trouble. Alyssa loved to dance. She was described as very hardworking, someone who never gave up, and she was just a really sweet young girl. At one point, she was dating this, Michael Anthony Ray. He, at the time, was 16 years old. She was 14. He was described as kind of a lonely kid, depressed. His dad wasn't around much because he was in the military. But he was just someone that Alyssa had dated but didn't want to date anymore. And so she broke up with him. On June 10th, 2013, here at the Wiles house in Oklahoma, Alyssa's dad said she he peeked in on her while she was sleeping around 7.30 in the morning, and then he left the house. He comes back 45 minutes later and his 14-year-old daughter was dead. She was covered in blood and it appeared she had been stabbed. As a matter of fact, she was stabbed four different times. One in the middle of her back, one on her left shoulder, one in her left armpit, and then one in her left palm, which would indicate she was trying to fight back. It didn't take them long to figure out who did this and why. 16-year-old Michael Anthony Ray was brought in for questioning where he confessed to killing her. He was really mad that she broke up with him and she he planned to kill her. He told police that he busted the door down. He walked into her room and he said, quote, she was too beautiful to hurt while she was sleeping. Then I just wanted her to be quiet. He then flees the home. He takes his clothing off. He burns it. He runs it over with a lawnmower, but he was caught anyway. And then he confessed. They also learned that he had, I think, a 13-year-old friend who was basically there as well to serve as the lookout. The friend was charged with accessory to murder, but his name was never revealed, at least as far as I can tell. And I don't know exactly what his conviction or sentence was. But Michael here would plead guilty to first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. This came just a couple of years after the Supreme Court had ruled that it was unconstitutional to sentence juveniles to life sentences without parole. But the ruling said they could still be sentenced to life without parole in certain cases. And this was one of those cases. Hopefully that never changes and this thing is in prison for the rest of his freaking life. Because of him, they'll never know what Alyssa would have grown up to be, who she would have grown up to be but at least she got the justice she deserved. Murdered for advising a friend to break up with her boyfriend. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Anna Cardwell. Viewer discretion is advised. It was February 15th, 2012, near Holtville, Alabama. Paula Cardwell had been out that morning doing some errands, and then she finally got home. When she got home, she noticed that her daughter's vehicle was no longer parked in the driveway which was weird because usually Anna would tell her if she was going somewhere, but she didn't this morning. Paula walks into the garage and that's when she notices a bloody palm print on a door frame. Then there were some blood drops kind of near the door. And then there was a trail of bloody footprints leading from the garage door towards the kitchen. As she got closer to the kitchen, she saw much larger pools of blood. And then she found her daughter. 20-year-old Anna Cardwell was dead on the kitchen floor, just covered in blood. Anna Catherine Cardwell was born on June 18, 1991, and she lived her whole life in Alabama. She graduated from Holtville High School in 2010, and then she was currently attending Southern Union College. Anna was really close with her family. She had a brother. She loved spending time with her family, and the only times that she wasn't spending time with them was either when she was in school or she was with her giant group of friends. She made friends really, really easy. She had a very infectious, like bubbly personality. But how did we get from this to her bloody body on the floor of her kitchen? It was determined that she had been shot four times, three times in her back and then once through her head. There was indications inside the house that she had gotten away from her attacker at one point, but then maybe in the last second was grabbed by her killer and brought back into the house. There was cash, like lots of cash, just out in the open in the house, not taken. 
There were prescription pills out in the open, not taken. The only thing missing from the house, in fact, was Anna's car. There was also no sign of sexual assault, so figuring out the motive was difficult. Not too soon afterwards, her vehicle was found. It was found in the parking lot of this Winn-Dixie grocery store. But initially, it didn't really lead them to any suspects. Could this have been her boyfriend? She did have a boyfriend at the time. As a matter of fact, she was with him on the Valentine's Day, the day before she was found. But according to her mom, her boyfriend was not in the house when she left that morning. It was just Anna in the house that morning. Sure, he could have come back, but... Police were able to look at him and they were able to rule him out pretty quickly. And then they found out about this man, Joshua Kaspari. He was the ex-boyfriend to her friend. Josh here was considered controlling, manipulative, demanding, and aggressive towards his girlfriend Lacey, a very good friend of Anna's. It got to a point where Anna advised Lacey, you should just break up with him. And Josh found out that Anna said that and it made him extremely angry. Police then question his mom, and Josh's mom tells them that she picked him up from that Winn-Dixie parking lot on the morning of February 15th. They then talk to Josh's roommate. His name is Cody Abernathy. He needs to brush his hair. Well, he says that he had dropped Josh off near Anna's home on the morning of February 15th. As a matter of fact, he dropped him off at this location. Josh had been sitting behind these branches and bushes that stared directly at the Cardwell home. Cody said he did whatever Josh told him to do because everybody was scared of Josh, that Josh could flip and go crazy at any moment. At any rate, this was enough evidence now that they needed to arrest Josh Kaspari and get a warrant to search his home. As they're questioning him, they find several guns inside of his house, one of them being a 9mm, which they discovered is the exact gun that was used to shoot Anna Cardwell. As a matter of fact, it was a gun that he had stolen along with Cody from a retired police officer's home named Larry Mann. Larry Mann didn't see their faces, but he knew that they were white males, probably in their 20s. But one of those guns that was stolen from him was also the gun, the one that was used to kill Anna. So they had all these, like, connections. After discovering that Anna had told his girlfriend that she needed to break up with him, he got really pissed. So he planned to go to Anna's home where he hid here, staring at the house, waiting for everyone to leave the house with Anna just remaining in there alone. Then he goes in and he says he confronts her and he takes out a gun and she gets scared and she tries to take it away from him and the, the gun goes off and it shoots her. It, it, was, a, it was an accident. Uh, no, Josh, you shot her three times in her back when she wasn't facing you, and then once in her head. It was more than obvious that at the crime scene that she was trying to get away from him. But hey, Josh, nice try. He was charged with capital murder, and he would be convicted and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Cody Abernathy, by the way, was charged with involvement in the robbery with the guns and also hindering prosecution because he never came forward on his own with regards to what he knew about Anna's, you know, murder. And Cody was sentenced, I think, like five to ten years in prison, so. Ooh. Oof. But Josh here, he will never breathe free air again. Womp. Womp. Under poor working conditions, they would be crushed to death in one of the worst deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. This particular story happened on February 1st, 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee. It was an extremely rainy, downpour kind of day. Robert Walker, pictured here along with a co-worker, Echel Cole, they worked on a garbage truck. This was during, of course, the 60s at a time when black workers, such as these two gentlemen, were treated with a lot of racial discrimination. The sanitation workers there in Memphis, Tennessee, around this time had a very high population of black employees. They were expected to work in horrible weather conditions without any form of protection. They were given no pension. They were given no workers' compensation. They did not have the options for life insurance. Now, back in the day, this is how garbage truck uh, workers would tend to sit on the back of the trucks. And like I said, on February 1st, 1968, it was a massive downpour. And so Echo Coles and Robert Walker took refuge because the only place they had to do so was actually inside the truck. 
they had to remain back there because they had to be the ones to, you know, load in the trash. This is not a photo of them, but they had been sitting in the back when according to the driver and the other passenger up front, the mechanisms that would crush the garbage, it's, it came on all of a sudden by itself, it seems like. So as they heard this going on, they stopped the truck, got out, and they were trying to smash the stop button to prevent this from going down more. But it wasn't working, it malfunctioned. The driver said it looks like almost one of the two men was able to get out, but he was actually dragged back in by the mechanism. And so Echo Cole and Robert Walker were both crushed to death. They had been pulled into this crushing mechanism and their bodies were essentially just destroyed. They would later say that it was an incredibly gruesome task to remove their bodies from the back of the, the truck. Their widows received no insurance benefits. The city only offered the widows one month's pay for each of them and $500 for funeral expenses total. The black community in Memphis, Tennessee, well, they pooled money together. $100,000 that were able to collect for the widows. The United Auto Workers donated $25,000. The city of Memphis said, oh well. This caused a sanitation strike to happen just 10 days after the incident. The strike consisted of the primarily black sanitation workers in Memphis. They obviously demanded better pay and benefits, better working conditions, safer working conditions. Martin Luther King became heavily involved in this. He actually marched with the sanitation workers, but then he was assassinated the day before the second march. They ended up getting union recognition and wage increases, but not much. Wife and mother just suddenly goes missing and it has to be the husband, right? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Anna Machievska. Viewer discretion is advised. Anna Machievska was originally from the Warsaw, Poland area, but in 1997, she would end up leaving Poland and coming here to the United States. Now, initially, she came here with her boyfriend, but a short time after they arrived here, they broke up. Now, Anna ends up attending the University of Louisville in Kentucky. She gets two bachelor's degrees. She's pursuing her master's degree, and she's trying to get that degree in actuarial mathematics. Anna was incredibly intelligent. Now, Anna eventually would meet this guy here, Alan Gould. They met during a ski trip, they hit it off, they ended up dating, and then they got married in 2006. Anna would then soon give birth to their son. She got pregnant again in 2016, but sadly, she ended up having a miscarriage and it took a very heavy mental toll on her, obviously. She didn't feel like her husband was really supporting her em emotionally at this point, and their marriage just kind of seemed to be waning a little bit. By the time her son is four years old, Anna is wanting to get him a uh, dual citizenship so that he can go visit, you know, his relatives in Poland, because she wants him to, to meet them and, you know, learn her culture out there. But Alan's like, I don't want him having dual citizenship, and he very much opposed this. On March 28th, 2017, Anna would call her mom because she says, I want to plan a surprise visit to her dad in Poland because his birthday was coming up. She told her mom that it would be her and definitely, you know, their son and Alan may tag along as well. But then on March 29th, 2017, Anna sends this text message to her mom. It translated to, sorry, can't come, Anna kisses. Then on March 30th, the following day, Anna's father gets this text message, which translated to Daddy, wishing you a happy birthday. We love you, Anna, Alan, and then their son's name. Immediately, Anna's parents realized something was wrong. Her parents pictured here said, the text messages were written in very broken Polish. Anna is Polish. That's where she's from. She doesn't speak in broken Polish. That's her language, her primary language. So how on earth and why were these texts sent so poorly? They didn't think Anna was sending those text messages at all. And so her mom is trying to call Anna to have actual conversation with her, but Anna's not answering her phone now. Then she finds out that Anna hasn't shown up to her job in like two or three days. As a matter of fact, between April 3rd and April 7th, she doesn't show up to work at all. But her work does get text messages from her. These messages state that Anna is very sick and she just can't come in. On April 10th, according to Alan, she is now feeling better to go to work. Now, mind you, nobody has actually seen her since the end of March, but he says that she gets up and she leaves the house in a panic to get to work, but then she never shows up at her job. And at that point, Anna's employer just says, we're reporting her missing because something is wrong. 
So her work reports are missing before her husband on April 11th. Alan informs her parents a little bit later that day, and then the following day, Alan finally reports his wife missing. So police begin looking into this right away because obviously she fell off the face of the earth, she had a child that she left behind, and just all of the behavior seemed very, very fishy, seemed very suspicious. And then on May 8th, 2017, here at the Charlestown Meadows Condos in Malvern, Pennsylvania, did I forget to mention where this actually happened? I think I did, Malvern, Pennsylvania. Anna's 2011 blue Audi is found parked in that complex's parking area. It's also found backed into a spot. I covered a case very recently with the same situation. Anna had no idea how to park into a spot backwards. And so everyone felt that this was not her who did this. The car did not yield any physical evidence that the police have at least announced. On that same note, Anna's cell phone, her wallet, her passport, all of her belongings were still at the house. Police searched the entire area surrounding those condos where her car was found because there was a big wooded area behind it. They found absolutely nothing. On July 20th, police finally got a warrant to search their home, in which Alan was said to cooperate with that warrant. And if they found something in that home, I'm not 100% sure. They've kept a lot of that kind of quiet and private. But after the search, Alan has not cooperated with police whatsoever. He won't even talk to them. Won't answer questions, won't give them the things they need. Very suspicious. Now, apparently Anna had a second home and that was like used more for storage. In 2019, police got a warrant. They searched it high and low, top to bottom, and they pulled several things from this home. And that is when police in Pennsylvania announced this is no longer considered a missing persons case. This is now a homicide investigation, even though her body was not found. What police uncovered from these searches is still pretty much unknown, but it was enough for them to classify that this was now a homicide, that she was murdered. And meanwhile, her husband will not cooperate with police and they're at a standstill. There is currently a $30,000 reward being offered for any information that helps lead to her whereabouts. And so if you have information, please call 610-486-6280. A breakup would lead to a murder. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Ashley Doolittle. Viewer discretion is advised. Ashley Doolittle was born and raised in Colorado, and she was living in Berthid, Colorado at the time of the story. She would eventually become a rodeo queen. She absolutely loved horses. She said that horses were her life. She had won like horse riding competitions. She just, she just loved it. She was also described as always having a smile. She was funny, she was kind, she was humble. Ashley was one of the good ones, genuinely the good ones. She had started to date another teenager named Tanner Flores. You know, at first they seemed to have a good relationship. This is a photo they took in 2016, just before their senior prom. And they had been dating for about a year or so before this case happened. In early June of 2016 though, Ashley decided that it was time to break up with Tanner. Tanner was controlling. He could be emotionally abusive and he seemed to have a temper and he was not happy with the idea of breaking up. On June 9th, 2016, Tanner asked to meet Ashley to discuss their relationship, and she agreed to meet him. So they would meet at the Alon Hagler Reservoir, and Ashley was expected home around 7.30 p.m. that night. She never got home. Her mom became worried, and so she went to the reservoir, and she found Ashley's vehicle. But Ashley was nowhere to be found. So the mom contacts Tanner's family and she finds out that Tanner has been missing since about 3.30 p.m. that afternoon, the same time frame as Ashley. And also missing from his home was a 22 caliber revolver that only he and his father knew the code to the safe to get. Police would get a bunch of tips that led them 300 miles away. It brought them to this home in Western Slope. It was the home of Tanner's deceased grandfather. On the property, they found Tanner, and they found this truck, Tanner's truck. There was blood inside the truck, and in the bed of the truck was the body of Ashley Doolittle wrapped in blankets. She had been shot in the head. Tanner would confess to killing her, but he would end up pleading not guilty to first-degree murder. He said this was a heat of passion thing, that it was not planned. Bullshit, because you got a gun before you went. He said they were talking in his truck, when I guess she just wasn't really listening to him or paying attention to him, and so he took the gun and just shot her. He said she twitched, and so he shot her again to make sure she died. He said he expected it to be instant the first time. 
there was actually a chance that Ashley could have survived had he not shot her again. Ashley, who was beloved in the community, was laid to rest, while Tanner was charged with first-degree murder and second-degree kidnapping. He was found guilty of all charges, and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. And the intelligent, the beautiful, and the funny Ashley, she got justice. This is the One Minute Missing Persons case of Barbara Lee Norton. Viewer discretion is advised. This particular story happened in Willits, California, which is in the Northern California area. At the time of this case, Barbara Lee Norton was 53 years old. On April 8th, 2014, a friend of Barbara's would report her missing after not seeing or hearing from her in a week. When police investigated Barbara's apartment, they found her purse, her wallet, her cell phone. Everything, all left behind. Barbara was nowhere to be found. The apartment did not look like any foul play had occurred, and nothing seemed to be stolen. Barbara was someone who was known to disappear for a couple of days or maybe even a couple of weeks, but always came back and always brought her cell phone and money. Her last text message she ever sent was to a friend and all it said was, take care. Barbara does not have a car. She walked everywhere. If you have information, please call 707-463-4086. She allegedly set her house on fire to kill her husband, but it would be her children that became collateral damage. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Billy Joe Smallwood. Viewer discretion is advised. Billy lived with her husband Wayne and their three children on base at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Her husband Wayne, pictured here, was in the army. They had three children: nine-year-old Sam and two-year-old Rebecca. And their third child, their youngest, is named Nevea. It was March 29th, 2007, when firefighters were called to their home on base. Their two-story home was completely engulfed in flames. Wayne was injured because he had jumped out of a second floor window to his own safety. And then Billy Joe Smallwood and her daughter Nevea, they had both escaped the flames as well. However, there were two victims still inside the home. Nine-year-old Sam and two-year-old Rebecca. When firefighters were able to finally get the uh, fire under control, they found the bodies of Sam and of Rebecca. Both were deceased. At first, Billy tried to say that it was an intruder who broke into the house and did this. She said that, that she had received a call, I guess the night before, from someone threatening to kill her husband, Wayne. And then lo and behold, the following day, the house is set on fire and her two kids are killed. Police dug into the phone records. They could not find that call whatsoever. They basically proved that phone call never happened. In the burned out remains of the home, they found a mostly melted gas can. They checked the purchase of that gas can and it was made literally the day of the fire. By who? By Billy. I believe it was in their living room, which is where the point of origin of the fire had started. And they did determine that this was arson that gasoline was used to intentionally start the fire. Police also learned in their investigation that Wayne had once prior been arrested for domestic abuse against Billy. Billy did claim that he was verbally and physically abusive to her, which it doesn't sound like many people dispute that at all. Wayne had a $400,000 life insurance policy on him. And in their investigation, they would determine that Billy Joe started the fire on purpose with the intent of killing her husband to get that $400,000. However, what she didn't plan for was that Wayne would jump out of the window to save himself. And obviously you cannot predict how a fire is going to act. And she was able to escape with one of her kids, but the other two would perish in the fire. So Billy Joe Smallwood was arrested and charged with her connections to the house fire. She went to trial and the evidence was pretty overwhelming against her. And while it wasn't her intent to kill her kids, she did. She was convicted and she was sentenced to 25 years in federal prison. Let this be a lesson that throwing rocks at moving vehicles can actually be fatal. This is another craziest deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here was 32-year-old Kenneth White. He was the father to a five-year-old boy, and he was engaged to be married. He was described simply as a good man and a good father who was just doing whatever he could to support his family. He was well-loved, and he was extremely hardworking. But he would be taken away from his child and his fiancée because of some stupid kids. 
It was October 18th, 2017 in Vienna Township, Michigan on the I-75 freeway. Five teenagers had placed themselves on the overpass, but before they did that, they found a bunch of giant rocks, loaded them into their pickup truck, drove to the bridge and said, hey, let's play a game. Let's throw rocks at the cars on the freeway and every time you hit one, you get a point. We're not talking like little tiny pebbles and little rocks here. They were throwing six pound and 20 pound rocks onto moving vehicles on the freeway. Well, one of those rocks would collide with the vehicle that Kenneth White was in. Kenneth was in the passenger seat. His coworker was driving them both home. The six pound rock launched through the window directly at Kenneth and it smashed him in his skull. There was immediate just blood pouring out of his head when this happened. The driver pulled over, called 911 in a, in a panic. Kenneth was rushed to the hospital, but unfortunately he would not survive. Kenneth died of severe blunt force trauma. His skull had been crushed. These five teenagers, when the incident happened, they went, oops, they got into the truck and they drove off and they went to a restaurant to go eat some food. Then they found out on the news that they were investigating, you know, this incident. And so they started to text each other, don't talk to anyone, don't tell anyone. If we stay quiet, they won't catch us. However, the truck they drove was captured on camera. And so it led police to one of them, which was able to get them a warrant. They found footage of them at the restaurant they ate at afterwards. They saw all of the text and communications they did with one another. And so they were all essentially arrested and they were charged with connections to this case. Four out of the five of them were minors at the time. So the, those, those four pled guilty to manslaughter and the judge was like, I want them sentenced as adults. The prosecution was like, we're cool with just as juveniles. And eventually the appeals court overturned that judge. And so they were sentenced as juveniles. They all got one year probation. The actual rock thrower, Kyle Anger, was an adult at the time. So he was sentenced to three to 20 years in prison. He served 39 months and he was released. A young girl was stolen from here and she was found here. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Brittany Locklear. Viewer discretion is advised. Brittany was born on October 14th, 1992 in Rayford, North Carolina. Growing up, Brittany was described as just a really good, well-behaved kid who absolutely loved everyone she met. And her family would say that she actually really, really loved going to church. However, there's not much more information about her because she was only allowed to live for five years. So Brittany lived here in Rayford, North Carolina, which is located in Hoke County, and it has a pretty small population. At the time, she was a kindergartner and she was attending West Hoke Elementary School, and that was her destination on this particular morning. It was January 7th, 1998. Brittany, who was five years old, and her mom would go out to the bus stop right outside their home. Brittany was dressed in a green and white shirt. She had on green denim overalls, a little green hair tie, and green and white sneakers. And then just before walking to the bus stop, she would put on her little red riding hood jacket. She was ready for the school day. The bus stop is located right here. Her home was just behind it, about 500 feet. As the mother and daughter were waiting for the bus, Connie, Brittany's mom, would go back to the house real quickly because she needed to use the restroom. The bus stop was within line of sight of the house. A few minutes later, her mom comes back and Brittany is gone. She assumed the school bus had picked her up. But to make sure, I guess she would then go to the school or call the school, but they told her that Brittany was not there. So Connie called 911 immediately. When she called, they told her, we've already gotten calls about your daughter. This is because several witnesses observed Brittany being kidnapped off the side of the road. A man driving a pickup truck skidded to a halt, snatched her, and then drove off with her in a matter of moments. So then a citywide search began. Hundreds of volunteers would help search for the little girl. They would end up finding her backpack, but not Brittany. But at 2 p.m. the following day, Brittany was found. The five-year-old girl's deceased body was found just here in this ditch. This was three miles away from her home. She had no clothes on, and it was likely she was sexually assaulted and her cause of death was drowning. Police began searching for known sex offenders in the area, but they came up with nothing. At one point, they suspected Brittany's stepfather, but he was completely cooperative. They also had DNA found with Brittany, and that DNA did not match him. 
In 2002, they found a photo of Britney inside of a firefighter's locker. So they kind of suspected him. They tested his DNA, not a match. Why he had that photo, I don't know. By 2015, they finally developed a full DNA profile on the suspect, but it's never matched a single person. And her murder has gone unsolved. If you have any information, please call 1-866-439-2683. Hello, so I actually wanted to make a correction to the video where this comment comes from. So uh, if you don't know what case I'm referring to, just click the comment, watch the video, and you can come back here if you want to. So you asked, um, why didn't anyone go tell the mom? So that's where the correction that I need to make comes in. But I believe at least one of the neighbors did tell the mom once the mom came out back to the bus stop. But the mom, I think, was in kind of like a state of shock. And so she was like, uh, what? Like, almost like she didn't believe them. And that's why the mom went to the school to see if her daughter got there. When I was reading one of the articles, I completely like either misread or just like completely missed one little section. <laughs> so yeah, the one of the neighbors at least told the mom and then the mom went to the school and then that's how she found out. So, and then in terms of like the actual kidnapping portion, you know, why didn't anyone try to stop? It's because it happened like that. It happened in an instant and people were too far away to stop this from happening. Hence why they would immediately go into their house and call 911. And then obviously one of them told the mom so. But that is the correction. I apologize for that. But uh, there you go. All right. She was stolen in broad daylight, but would she ever be found? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Brooke Wilberger. Viewer discretion is advised. Brooke was born in Fresno, California on February 20th, 1985. And I believe she was one of six total kids. At one point, the family relocated to the Eugene, Oregon area, and Brooke had graduated from Elmira High School there. Right after high school, she would go to Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. Brooke was described as happy-go-lucky. She was very family-oriented. She absolutely loved being around her siblings. And her family said that while she loved being like the girly girl, and she was kind of like your all-American girl, she also liked to tough it out, and she loved to play sports. She was incredibly athletic. Brooke was just someone that everybody just seemed to get along with really, really easy. In May of 2004, Brooke was on summer vacation, and so she would end up going to Corvallis, Oregon, and uh, staying with one of her sisters. Her sister and her sister's husband were managers of this apartment complex, the Oak Park Apartments in Corvallis, and Brooke took on a summer job doing some work for them at the complex. She primarily did a lot of, like, cleaning and whatnot. And on May 24th, 2004, that's exactly what Brooke was doing. She was outside, I guess, wiping down some lampposts, and then she was seen going into an apartment to clean it. And then, in the middle of the day, in broad daylight, Brooke was just gone. She never came back to her sister's place. She never made it to her lunch break with her sister. Nobody saw her leave. Nobody heard anything. She just vanished. So they felt very uneasy about it. So they called 911. And the police began searching for her immediately. The reason why is because they found her broken flip-flops outside of an apartment she had been cleaning. And her mop bucket that was there and everything. And it looked as if someone had, like, just taken her. Witnesses said they saw a green van speeding away from the area around that time. But police were not able to find who owned that green van. They had almost no evidence. And they couldn't find her. Despite massive searches, despite everyone in, in the community all out and about looking for her and they're just not finding her at all. Other than her flip-flops, there was no sign of a struggle where she was allegedly taken from. They never found like blood or clothing or anything. Where did Brooke go? Who took her? Did someone take her? In November of 2004 in New Mexico, this man would be arrested. He was arrested for kidnapping and sexually assaulting a Russian foreign exchange student in New Mexico. She got away from him and she had a very vivid description of the man and he was recognized by locals and by the authorities and so he was quickly arrested. His name was Joel Patrick Courtney. Now, Joel would get convicted eventually of that kidnapping and sexual assault and he was sentenced to 18 years in prison. Now, when police were looking into him in New Mexico, they realized he had once been a resident of Corvallis, Oregon. This was during the time when Brooke had disappeared. And so they communicated with the police in Corvallis of like, hey, this, you know, you might want to look at this guy just in case. Police found out that Joel Courtney drove a green van. 
a green van in which he still owned. And when he was then in prison, police were able to confiscate his van. They tore it to pieces and they searched that entire thing for any evidence. They found obviously his DNA in various locations in the van, confirming it was his. And they also found a plethora of Brooke Wilberger's DNA, confirming that she was in his van, a green van which was seen speeding away from the apartment complex the day she was taken. Police looked further into his phone records from the time of you know, this happening. Once again, they were able to trace his cell phone usage to the exact location into where she you know, disappeared from at the same time. However, Brooke still hasn't been found. They haven't found her body anywhere. And when they put all of this kind of on Joel, he at first said, I had nothing to do with it, I'm innocent. But then police made him a deal. They said, we will let you serve out your prison sentence for this in New Mexico if you confess. So he did. Joel Courtney would admit that he abducted her from the apartment complex. Nobody else was around. He then drove for about 12 miles or so where he sexually assaulted her. He had her tied up in his van while he just got food and ate. He then drove her to a, a secluded location where he then killed her. And then he would bury her body. Part of this deal he would receive would be that he has to reveal where her body is. And so he does. They go to the exact location and they find her. She was found in a very secluded location, just covered by, you know, trees. And they confirmed that her cause of death was homicide and her family got her back. And thankfully they were able to lay her to rest. And so in 2009, he pleads guilty to first degree murder and he is sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. An arrest has been made in the murder of Corey Shearer. Hello, true crimeers. This is a case update and a very good one. To see the full details of this case, you can click on the comment to go back to my original video. I am posting this update on my main page because that's where I told the original story. But Corey Shearer was killed in 2022 at a house party as he was leaving. And the only real like evidence of who it was they had was the CCTV footage caught by a neighbor. And as of today, February 26, 2024, they have finally found who this man is and they have made an arrest. He is 19-year-old Amius Kugler. He would have been 17 at the time he committed the murder. From what I can tell in one of the articles, they said it, there was some DNA evidence that was collected that was able to be linked back to him. He had been arrested, I guess, back in 2023 with, like, weapons charges. Then he was arrested, I guess, a month after that for robbery. According to one of the articles, it says that he will be tried as in juvenile court at first, I guess. You know, because he was 17 years old at the time, he was a juvenile. And yet, if he committed the murder, what, a couple months later, he would be an adult committing that crime? I mean, he committed a murder. Let's just treat him like a big boy. But that's the, that's the update for now. It's a very positive update. At least this person who killed, allegedly, killed Corey Shearer, is off the streets. His mom messaged me here um, a little bit ago about it, and I was just so happy for her. Sometimes you just wonder, like, are these things, these cases ever going to be solved? Are they ever going to find the person who did it? And I know that it's probably really easy to lose hope, but I know Corey's mom has never lost that hope. And uh, I just, just want to say she's a really incredibly strong person. And uh, justice is finally coming her way and Corey's way. So that's, that's amazing. A mother of four disappeared just a couple of days ago and her family needs your help to find her. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Chalice Welch. Viewer discretion is advised. Chalice Welch is a 24-year-old mother to four young children, and they lived in Arlington, Texas. On February 2nd, 2024, Chalice Welch had gone to a party, and that was at the Embassy Suites, and that was the Irving, uh, Texas location. A birthday party was going on there, and I guess Chalice would eventually leave the party, and then she was seen getting into a vehicle of an unknown man. I guess nobody recognized who it was. Ever since that moment, nobody has seen Chalice at all. Nobody has heard from her at all. Chalice had left a few of her personal belongings behind in the hotel room like her jacket. When she would be reported missing, the police would eventually be able to ping her cell phone. But they determined that her cell phone had not pinged ever again after 12.30 a.m. the morning she disappeared. And that was from the location of the hotel is where it pinged. 
Since then, her mom and her stepdad have been on the news pleading for the public's help in trying to get Chalice home. They have said that she would never do this because she absolutely adored her kids. She had four kids that she that meant the world to her and she wouldn't just you know pick up and leave them like this. They do believe that Chalice is gone involuntarily because one of her kids had a birthday during this time frame. She would never miss her birthday. So the Irving police are asking for the public's help, especially directly in that area. If you saw anything, if you heard anything, you need to go forward to police immediately. This only happened, like for me filming this, about four or five days ago. They are hopeful that she is safe somewhere and are pleading to whoever may have her to please let her go. The police have stated that our criminal investigations division is working diligently with the family and possible leads and we have confidence in our investigators in their continued efforts. That's about all they've really said publicly about this case. They have kept most other things pretty much close to the chest. But this mother of four is missing. She may have gotten into the car willingly, but then from that point on, she may have been kidnapped. Hopefully that's not the case, but someone has to know something. And hopefully there's still time to get her home to her kids safe. If you have information, please contact the Irving police at 972-273-1010. That's the case number right there. She is five foot seven to five foot eight, 24 years old with green eyes, sandy blonde hair with a highlight in the front. She was last seen wearing black leggings and long sleeved mesh top. Please help Chalice's four kids get their mom back as soon as possible. A poodle falls out of a window and three people die in one of the craziest deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. This story occurred in Buenos Aires, Argentina in 1988. This story feels like something that was pulled directly from a Final Destination movie. The absolutely insane events happened here at this building. It starts 13 stories up when a poodle who I guess is on the balcony and he's living in the apartment of the Montoya family Something happens and the poodle falls off the balcony and it falls all 13 stories. A 75 year old woman named Marta Espina was at the bottom of the building at the worst possible moment. The poodle collides with her, killing both her and the poodle on impact. Wild enough story as it is, but it's not done. Immediately as this incident occurred, there were onlookers. One of those onlookers was 46 year old Ida Sola. All of her attention was focused on this wild event that just occurred in front of her eyes, when all of a sudden a bus comes flying down the road, colliding directly with Ida Sola, killing her on impact. She was so fixated on this event that she was not paying attention to where she was walking. And it's still not done. A third individual, a man whose name is unknown, he witnessed both the incident with the poodle and the incident with the woman being struck by the bus. He was an older man, and it said that the shock of witnessing both events caused him to, well, collapse. And this is because he suffered a heart attack. And you have to backtrack to how on earth did this poor dog fall off of a balcony that high up? Apparently there had been some recent repairs done on the balcony, but I guess the repairs weren't good enough. Three people, one poodle. I don't, I don't know if it gets any more strange than that. Hello, True Crimeers. This is the case of Christy Stevens. Viewer discretion is advised. This story happened in, I guess, the Somerville, Georgia area, specifically in Chattooga County, and it has very little information. 13-year-old Christy Stevens was an eighth grader at Somerville Middle School, and it was October 1st, 1990. Christy was supposed to go to school that day, but she was feeling sick, so she stayed home. Her dad left the house at approximately 7 a.m. to take her grandmother to work. He then gets home shortly after that, and then Christy is gone. What was more alarming was they found her like sneakers just sitting in the driveway. So police were called and they reported her missing. When the police searched the home, they found, I guess, some letters written by Christy suggesting that uh, I kind of just want to leave this place. And so this gave police like, uh, maybe this was a runaway situation and she'll be home soon. But they did still continue to look for her all the same. Unfortunately, three weeks later, she would be found. The body of the 13 year old girl was found about 300 feet off of a road about two miles from her home. 
Her body had been covered deliberately, so they know that this was someone who did this to her. Her death was ruled a homicide, but her body was so badly decomposed that the coroner could not determine how she was killed. Police had obviously questioned like the neighbors in the neighborhood. They even questioned like the bus drivers who would go down that road, but no one had seen her. No one saw her walking down the street. No one saw her in her driveway where her shoes were found. Like nobody saw or heard a thing about who took her. Clearly someone took her because they murdered her, but the police there in Georgia have absolutely no idea who did it. From what I'm reading, I guess they do have some uh, swabs that they did of her body that may potentially have DNA. But as of now, in 2024 at least, they, those swabs or anything haven't come to any kind of solution. There are no DNA hits or anything like that. And in terms of suspects, they don't have any. This was a 13-year-old middle school girl. Now, I know the father was the last person technically to see her alive, but... You know, I don't know if they've looked into him, because I know people will probably ask that question, but I think they cleared him and that he had nothing to do with this. So did a stranger come upon her in the house? It's just so baffling. She was home alone, sick. Like, how did the, the shoes in the driveway is kind of unsettling, and the fact that nobody saw or heard anything just makes it even more terrifying. Somebody somewhere out there knows the truth about what happened to Christy Stevens, and maybe that person is you. If you have any information, please call 706-624-1424. Help get Christy justice. In the end, you really kind of have to ask yourself, was Craig really ever missing? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Craig Williamson. Viewer discretion is advised. On October 7th, 1990, 46-year-old Craig Williamson, he got married to 41-year-old Christine Reinhardt in Lake Tahoe. This was only after knowing each other for a month. The two of them wanted to start a business, specifically a fish business. So they ended up purchasing some land near Clintonville, Wisconsin, where Christine was from, and they built a farm and they were going to be raising tilapia. And they planned to, you know, sell it and make this a very fruitful business. Craig purchased this old bus that was, he was going to use to transport the tilapia because his plan was to go across the country selling it. On August 28th, 1993, he would leave Wisconsin in this bus with fish, and his destination this time was Colorado Springs, Colorado. Christine was really worried about him, though, doing this because a couple of weeks prior, he had suffered a concussion. He was having, like, dizzy spells, and he was in a lot of pain. But nonetheless, he got on the bus, and he drove to Colorado Springs, and he arrived around August 30th. He rented a car, got himself a hotel. At 9 p.m. on that August 30th night, he spoke to Christine on the phone, and that was the last time she ever heard from him. She expected him home like a day or so later. He never got home. 675 miles south of where he was last known to be, Craig Williamson's credit cards were found in El Paso, Texas, the day he was supposed to be home in Wisconsin. And then two weeks later, his vehicle was found in Mexico. It was abandoned. Craig, nowhere to be found. No evidence of a struggle. Craig just poofed into thin air. He was gone. Did he meet with foul play? Christine thinks he did. Christine thinks that he had been attacked by someone in Colorado Springs, and because he had a concussion, this did something janky to his brain. As Christine and police are both investigating this, a nurse named Judy Inman talks to Christine, that's, and she says, I think I may have seen Craig. While traveling from Montana to Washington, she saw a disheveled-looking man talking nonstop about fish. And according to her, he looked a lot like Craig. However, unfortunately, this really didn't lead to anything. In May of 1994, Craig's case airs on Unsolved Mysteries. They got no hits the night it aired, but then it re-aired in July of 1995. And somebody noticed Craig Williamson. Someone recognized him. Who? Craig Williamson did. Yeah, himself. He was all the way in Key West, Florida. He said he got mugged in Colorado Springs, which gave him amnesia, made worse because he had a concussion. He woke up in a hospital, he thought his name was Ron, and then he wandered throughout the United States until he found his way in Florida. And so he was reunited with Christine. Police believe he's lying. He was in debt, trying to escape that debt. The two of them soon divorced, and they've both gone their separate ways. <sighs> Okay. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of this creeper, Dalton Fletcher.
Viewer discretion is advised. 15-year-old Dalton Fletcher, pictured here. Well, he lived with his family in Washita Parish in Louisiana. It was September 10th, 2010, and this was the Fletcher home. It was the late evening and everyone was asleep. 15-year-old Dalton, armed with a 12-gauge shotgun, would walk into his parents' room, Tammy and Johnny Fletcher. He pointed the gun at them and he pulled the trigger. He shot and killed both of his parents. Dalton had an older sister who basically witnessed this entire thing happening. Dalton then pointed the shotgun at her and forced her back into her bedroom and basically told her, if you do anything or call anyone, I'll shoot you too. He took her cell phone so that she couldn't call anyone and she had to sit in her room basically if terrified and crying while Dalton just went to sleep. Ugh, okay champ. He woke up the next morning, got into the car, he put the 12 gauge in the car with him, and he drove to school. He attended West Washita High School. He went into school, acted like nothing happened, went to his class. He left the gun in the car. But because he finally left the house, his older sister was finally able to basically get out. She goes to a neighbor's home where she contacts 911 immediately. Police arrive at the home and they find the bodies of both of the parents. They then essentially go to his school and put the entire school on lockdown because they don't know if he maybe has a gun on his person or not. So obviously everyone's in crazy panic mode, but they do successfully manage to get to him and they arrest Dalton without any incident. And he is charged with two counts of murder for killing his parents. He writes a letter while in prison and he sends it to his, I guess, girlfriend. And in that letter, he says he regretted what he did. Well, specifically, he says, I regret not causing them more suffering. He basically confessed to it. He said he did it. Showed absolutely no remorse. Now, he claimed that there was abuse in the house, but it sounds like there wasn't enough evidence to substantiate those claims. He never told this to anyone ever before until now. Dalton had some mental health issues but they weren't at a place where he wasn't able to discern right from wrong. He knew what he was doing and he basically planned it. I'm not 100% sure what his motive was, but they tried him as an adult, good, and he was convicted of two counts of second degree murder. The teenager was sentenced to two life sentences without the possibility of parole. Oh well. Why you got that look like you got danked real good last night? Like splatter time danked. What? What is that? What is that? <laughs> Does that mean playing PlayStation 5 until 2 o'clock in the morning? And then falling asleep on the couch watching uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000? Is that what danked means? Because yes, then I did. Very much so. I'm gonna Google it right now. I'm gonna find out what it means because, hold on. Okay, so Urban Dictionary says to preform the act of smoking marijuana and becoming intoxicated. See also blazed and chronicized? 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 The quote they use is, don't tell Tan I danked. Or, okay, what? This entry was put into Urban Dictionary by a user named BushDid911. <laughs> Danked may refer to a incorrectly mated connector or electrical, it should be an incorrectly grammar, come on now. Mated connector or electrical outlet, damaged goods. You stupid ass, you totally danked that outlet. You calling me stupid at electric, elect, electro, electrical stuff? Let's see, according to a classmate of mine, dank dank is some, quote, some fire ass weed, end quote. Oh, then no, 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 no. I didn't, I did not get danked. But I dank you very much for your uh, comment. Yeah. Not today. <laughs> <clears throat> A man calls his friend from this payphone, and then within eight minutes after, he would be stabbed 24 times. 
Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of David Breckenridge. Viewer discretion is advised. This photo of David Breckenridge was taken on the morning of August 10th, 2002 in St. Leonard's, which is in New South Wales, Australia. He was maybe a little hungover because the night before he has celebrated his 28th birthday. David, pictured here with his parents, was one of three kids. He was described as incredibly charismatic, a lot of fun. He was super intelligent. And they would say that this was someone who always avoided trouble if he could. He never got involved in, like, the wrong crowds or anything like that. And nobody was aware of any potential enemies he may have had. So moments after this photo was taken, David would leave the flats and he would go to the hotel where he worked as a bartender. He started work at about 10 a.m., and then by 11.29 p.m., he had left his employer. He would get on a bus and he would head to Lane Cove. At 11.46 p.m., he purchased a six-pack of beer at a local tavern. At 11.52 p.m., he goes to this payphone where he calls his friend. His friend was named Philip Noyce. And then David, I guess, makes another brief phone call. But when he talks to Philip, he says, hey, I got a six-pack for us. I'm going to head over there. I'll be there shortly. It would have been about a 10-minute walk from the payphone to Philip's place. But David never made it. Because within an eight-minute window of time, David would be stabbed 24 times. At 12.04 a.m., the bloodied body of David Breckenridge was found. And it was here at the corner of Berry Lane and Pacific Highway in St. Leonard's. The six-pack of beer he purchased, unopened, was just resting on a short brick wall. David was just covered in blood and he was pronounced dead at the scene. The coroner determined he had at least 24 stab wounds. And this was a very close and like frenzied attack. But who did it and why? So they were able to kind of retrace some of David's steps when they found CCTV footage of him entering the tavern where he purchased the beer. So he entered the tavern around 11.40 p.m. and the purchase was made at 11.46 p.m. And this right here is that purchase. And what's so haunting about this image here is that he doesn't know that in 14 minutes he will be dead. He appeared to be happy and was in really good spirits. You know, he was just planning to continue his birthday festivities with a friend. I guess they found out that about two nights prior to this, he had gone to a girl's house and slept over. Police uncovered the fact that there may have been some kind of love triangle. The other potential guy in this scenario was named Paul Stapleton. Apparently he had an alibi that night though. However, later one of those alibi witnesses stated that he was not with Paul. And then the second witness says they don't remember anymore. Paul Stapleton has never been arrested or charged, however, because they have no evidence. But one witness said there was a black car seen driving in the area. Well, the woman who was involved in this potential love triangle stated that Paul Stapleton owned and drove a black vehicle similar to what witnesses described as seeing kind of speeding away from this area where the body was found. But still, police can't with 100% certainty place Paul Stapleton in the area. And like I said, they don't have physical evidence like DNA or anything like that to also place him at the crime scene. Love triangles are a very common motive for murders. And to stab someone 24 times, you know, usually you'll hear them say that that's extremely personal, that that's an attack out of anger because nothing was stolen from him. I mean, there was no money taken. His beer was left behind. That's someone who hated David. And so this guy makes sense, but it doesn't mean that it's him either. Just because it looks like something doesn't mean it's always that something. Police did uncover that, you know, he may have been involved in like recreational drugs from time to time, but there really wasn't anything that stemmed from that that would lead them to any kind of motive or a suspect. Because for the most part, David was just always kind of in a good headspace. He was, he never got into any kind of trouble with the law. And, and so they're just, they're just, they're at a loss, really. There may be someone in this image right here that might have followed him out of this tavern after he left with his beer. There may be someone in this image who is his killer. Or maybe they are in this image here. There is a point where like someone over here is kind of talking to David for like a little bit, but didn't appear to be unfriendly or maybe and it's no one from here the crazy part is is this was a really busy tavern and then the area where he was found was right off a road that at that time was still pretty busy with some you know cars and the fact that nobody came forward to state they saw or heard anything is just bizarre this was a violent attack and nobody saw it and nobody heard it 
Nobody heard the screams. People saw a car speeding away, but they don't even know if that was connected to the crime at all. Were there witnesses and they're afraid to come forward? Were there witnesses who didn't stop what was happening? Well, you'd like to think not, but... The murder of David Breckenridge has gone unsolved for over 20 years. New South Wales has offered a $250,000 reward for any information that helps lead to the capture of his murderer. You are doing no one any favors by protecting his killer. I don't know how it works in Australia, but I know here that you can always report your information anonymously, so hopefully you can do the same thing there. If you do have information about the murder of David Breckenridge, you can contact Crime Stoppers there at 1-800-333-000. There's also an online form you can fill out if you Google his case. One of the first links has a story about this that you can report your information to. Listen to the crowd. Uh, to be great in their last <laughs> I would rather really have that than have it like Holland where he just knocked out the exactly. first game. The crowd was reacting to a man dying at a baseball game in one of the craziest deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. This incredibly tragic story happened in 2011 at Rangers Ballpark in Arlington, Texas, where the Texas Rangers play. This was 39-year-old firefighter Shannon Stone. On a warm July evening in 2011, he would take his six-year-old son to a baseball game. He had actually just purchased his six-year-old boy a, a brand new glove in hopes that he would be able to catch a home run or maybe a ball thrown by a player. His son's favorite player was Josh Hamilton of the Rangers. It was fairly early in the game and Shannon and his son were in the seats just above the outfield scoreboard. I'm going to play you the full video. You do not see anything graphic, gory, or bloody, but I still want to say viewer discretion is advised because what you're about to see may be distressing to some of you. Well, this is it. That's why there was time taken. Wow. So it was in between pitches or, or something when outfielder Josh Hamilton, this guy here, he threw a ball up to the stands so that uh, Shannon's six-year-old son could have a ball. And so this is when you see Shannon leaning over the bars to try to catch the ball. And he stumbles over it. He then unfortunately falls head first 20 feet to concrete ground below. He lands on top of his head. His six-year-old son had to be immediately kind of pulled away to prevent him from seeing this. Now, Shannon was still alive on the ground, but barely. He had broken both of his arms and there was a massive amount of blood coming out of his head. And according to paramedics, the first and only thing he said was, Please, someone, please get my son. Please check on my son. He is up there alone. Shannon Stone is rushed to the hospital, but it's already too late. He would be pronounced deceased. And I think in the meantime, they have then put some kind of tarp or cover over that gap to prevent this happening again. Josh Hamilton felt horrible about it. But Shannon's wife would say, please keep throwing balls into the crowd. This wasn't his fault. Sadly, it was just a freak accident. This is the one minute murder case of Don Lamont and Gail Jordan. Viewer discretion is advised. 17 year old Don and 18 year old Gail were best friends. They were from Magnolia, Texas. On the night of July 13th, 1991, the two girls decided to go see a movie. The movie was playing about seven miles away in Tomball, Texas. So they met up and the two of them left in Don's pickup truck. Then they head down Farm to Market Road 1774 and Don's truck broke down. So they decided to walk down the road to a nearby friend's house. They never made it. I believe this was after the movie. Between midnight and 2 a.m. it is believed that both women were struck and killed by a vehicle while walking down the road. Evidence left behind indicates it was a 1983 or 1984 Chevy truck or a Suburban or a Blazer. They don't know if this was a hit and run or if this was intentional, but this was murder. Their killer has never been found. If you have information, please call 936-873-2000. Try to imagine the pain of losing a child and then imagine it happening again. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Deborah and Victoria. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here is the Shelton family of Aptos, California. The two children pictured are Deborah and Victoria. And then I believe there was a third daughter that came after. Sadly, in 1966 or so, their father was killed in a tragic car accident. And then by January of 1969, Deborah Shelton is a 12-year-old who's in the seventh grade. 
and tragedy would strike the family again. It was 9.30 a.m. on January 3rd, 1969. Deborah had told her mom, I'm gonna go out and ride my bike with a couple of friends. A common thing, she did it all the time. But she was expected home later that afternoon because she had a dentist appointment. But Deborah never got home. And then Deborah's mom got a very eerie phone call that same afternoon. The voice on the other end was a man who just says, we have your daughter, we want $500 drive out to Trout Gulch Road. And then they hung up. Her mom thought it was just some stupid joke and so she didn't do anything. But then when she realized a little bit later that Deborah was missing, now she feels like that phone call may have been real because no one had known she was gone at that point. So later that day, Deborah is reported missing and the search begins. They are looking everywhere. They're, they're combing through every square inch of this area and they're getting nothing. They got some information about how Deborah was interested in an older guy and that maybe this older guy had somehow lured her away or something, but they never found out who this person was. On March 8th, 1969, the search was over. The very badly decomposed body of Deborah Shelton was found. She had been dead likely a month at least. It was clear to them that she was pretty much strangled with her own clothes. She also had remnants of tape around her to indicate she may have been, you know, tied up somehow. They could not tell if she was sexually assaulted just based on the state of decomposition, but she likely was. They just couldn't say for sure. And then, you know, the Sheltons uh, are living in their home and they're just wondering who did this to them. They just got over the loss of their father, their husband, and now this. And unfortunately, the case went ice cold. Her case has never been solved. There's never been any like official suspects named and life just kind of seemed to go on. And then three decades later, it happens again. The second daughter, Victoria, who's now known as Victoria Lee Specials, she vanished in 2001. At that time, she's 44 years old, living in Clear Lake, California. And she had just gotten out of a relationship with a guy that I guess they just weren't getting along recently. But apparently, this ex-boyfriend was going out of town and he asked Vicky if she would watch after his dog and she agreed to do it, allegedly. As far as her family knew, Vicky went to the house to take care of the dog, but she was never seen again. Several days goes by and Vicky's mom uh, contacts the boyfriend and he apparently told her, oh, Vicky decided to go to San Francisco instead. She went there for New Year's. So her mom goes to Vicky's place and she sees that Vicky's purse is there. Her ID was in her purse, her wallet, her money, all the money she had was there at the house. How on earth did she go to San Francisco without any of her money, her cards, her cash, her purse, her wallet? And so police also feel like that's very strange. The police have labeled her case as essentially suspicious and that foul play is very likely involved here. Vicky's mom, truly believes that, you know, Vicky is dead. It's now just a matter of finding out where she is so she can be laid to rest, why she was killed, and who did it. I mean, it kind of sounds like they have an idea, but I don't think they have any evidence or anything like that at this point. You know, she disappeared in December of 2001. It's 2024 now, and they've gotten nowhere on this, unfortunately. And I bring it back to this image here. Two sisters close in age who were best friends, one of the sisters had to deal with, unfortunately, the sudden murder of her other, you know, her sister. And then 30 years later, her mom, who already had to deal with the loss of one daughter, now has to deal with it all over again. And then, you know, burying a daughter next to her other daughter and her husband. But first things first, they need to find Vicky. They need to know what happened to her. And they need to catch the son of a bitch that did it. If you have any information with regards to Vicky's case, please call 707 994-8251. If you have information about Deborah Shelton's murder, please call 831-454-2847. This poor family, this poor mother here has been through enough. Please help her by getting the justice for her two daughters that she rightfully deserves. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Deborah Wrinkles. Viewer discretion is advised. Deborah was born on August 10th, 1962, and she was the loving mother to two children. Her children meant everything to her, and she was described as the perfect mom. Very nurturing, kind, and just a good person. 
And Deborah would do anything to protect her kids, even if it's from their own father. Deborah had been married to this guy here, Matthew Eric Wrinkles, who would go by Eric. But by 1994, the two of them had separated after some very erratic and very frightening behavior from him. And he could be quite scary. After he and Deborah had separated, his mom tried to have him committed to a psychiatric hospital. And the hospital took him in, but I guess he didn't meet the criteria for them. They then sent him to a different facility, but then the psychiatrist there said, nah, he's okay, he's fine. And they just released him out into the world. He wasn't fine. Deborah and the kids had moved in with her brother, Tony Fulkerson and his wife, Natalie. So initially in the divorce proceedings, there was a protection order against uh, Eric from seeing the kids. But after a July 20th hearing, that protective order was then removed. However, if they were going to ever meet and he was gonna see the kids, it would basically need to be in a public place like a restaurant. On July 21st, they had an arrangement to meet at a restaurant, but Deborah had to cancel. And apparently that was the last straw for Eric. He would dress himself in camouflage clothing. He put face paint like he was, you know, at war. He went to the neighborhood of where Tony lived, parked his car about a block away. He got to the house where he covertly cut the phone lines and then armed with a 357 handgun, he busts down the door, goes immediately to Tony first and shoots him four times. He was in the bedroom. Eric then goes around to the back patio where Natalie is, and before she could do anything, he shoots and kills her. Deborah then found herself in the hallway of the home, basically trying to like figure out what was going on. Eric comes in and he fires several rounds into her chest and kills her. The children were left unharmed. Mentally scarred probably for the remainder of their lives, but they weren't hurt. Eric was then arrested at a cousin's house not too soon after this because obviously he was the one who did it. At that residence, they found the 357 handgun, which they would forensically test to make sure, and it was the exact gun that was used in the murders. So Eric was charged with their murders, and he would end up being convicted and sentenced to death. His final meal consisted of prime rib, loaded baked potato, pork chops, fries, rolls, two salads, and on December 11th, 2009, he was executed. Not much of a loss if you ask me. It would be mud that led them to the bodies, but who on earth would kill this elderly couple? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Derek and Eileen Severs. Viewer discretion is advised. Derek and Eileen were a very wealthy and retired older couple, and they lived in Hambleton in the UK. They lived here in this home, which they nicknamed the Bungalow. While both of them were retired, they still kind of both would, you know, be involved with the community as much as they could. On November 13th, 1993, Eileen was actually at a charity event, and then she was seen leaving, and she told everyone, I'm on my way home. That same exact day, Derek, he was having a fresh pint at a local pub. He would leave there around 3.30 p.m., and he told his friends, I'm going home now. But Derek and Eileen Severs would never be seen alive again after that day. After about five days of missing appointments and not responding to friends' phone calls, friends would end up reporting them missing. So police would go to their home and they would actually talk to their son. And his name was Roger Severs. He told police, oh, they've gone on holiday to London. They're, they're gone for a little bit. He said, yeah, come on in. You can check the house. It's fine. Police checked the house, they didn't see anything unusual, no signs of a struggle, no forced entry, no blood, or anything like that. And so they left. A day or so later, police would end up going back to the house where they had a warrant to search the yard. They found that their garden had recently been excavated, and they saw signs of a big burn pit, and so they searched through all of that. They found, like, fibers of, like, potential blankets or maybe clothing items, but they didn't find the couple. Roger said, well, they had gone to the train station, and so that's where they should, they could maybe ask there. And so police do go there, armed with plenty of photos, and no one from the train station can recall ever seeing Derek or Eileen. They found no records of any purchases of train tickets or anything. They were then beginning to suspect that Roger may have had something to do with her disappearance. That's when police noticed that there was mud caked onto all four tires of Roger's vehicle. 
forensic smarty pantses uh, would take that mud and they would forensically analyze it. And that they found things that said that this car was near a chestnut tree and that it would have had to have been parked next to a chestnut tree for some time. So after doing a thorough examination of all the mud and all the stuff inside that mud, they pinpointed it to certain locations where chestnut trees would be located. And that's how they came across a place called Armley Wood. And there, unbelievably, they found the bodies of Derek and Eileen. They had been wrapped up in a blanket. Fibers from that blanket matched fibers they found in the home and a string of fiber they found on Roger's clothing. They were also buried underneath a chestnut tree. Not only that, but the soil found next to the area where the body was, uh, bodies were buried was the exact same soil found in all four of Roger's tires. So they knew his vehicle had been within feet of where the bodies were found. They were also found buried with roofing tiles, roofing tiles that matched the same roofing tiles that were being used at the Severs' home. Police discovered that Roger would have been the beneficiary to a large life insurance benefit at the expense of their deaths. There is stories that he had been asking his parents for money for quite some time, but they kept telling him no. And maybe this eventually led to an argument in which he ended up killing them. At first, he denied having anything to do with their deaths. But it's believed that his mom had come home first that day. He must have hit her over the head with something and then hid her body in the house, waited for his dad to come home from the pub and then killed him, then dragged their bodies to the car and then brought them to the location where he ended up burying them. Once he was charged with both of their murders, he confessed. He said, I killed my parents with a steak mallet. Fully admitted to doing it. And so he was found guilty of their murders and he was sentenced to life in prison. He killed his parents because he wanted money. I hope he rots. A wife and mother suddenly disappears and a couple of days later, her husband vanishes. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Donna Morrow. Viewer discretion is advised. Donna and her husband, Joseph Morrow, lived in Menlo Park, California, and the two of them would have a few children. Donna was described as just an all-around nice lady. She was a wonderful mom, and she was just a beloved member of the community. And regardless of where she was, everybody loved her. Donna would never just suddenly leave her kids either. But that is what apparently seems to happen around Christmas of 1991. Donna's siblings who lived in Missouri had called around Christmas Day to, you know, wish her a Merry Christmas. But it was Joseph Morrow who answered the phone. Gee. Oof. That is not a good look, my guy. Joseph Morrow, I swear this is Joseph Morrow, not... He said, well, uh, she just picked up and left the kids and me. She's gone. He said, uh, she left six days ago and I just haven't seen her and I didn't tell you guys for some reason. Donna's family was like, no, that's not like her. And that she would have called us or come to us or something. So they immediately felt something was wrong. Joseph Morrow at that same time was actually about to go to prison for two years for a fraud case. And then shortly after everybody finds out that Donna is missing, Joseph Morrow goes missing. So now they're looking for him and they're looking for Donna. Both of them nowhere to be found. Police had suspected he had involvement in Donna's disappearance, but without any kind of you know, body or anything, they, their hands were kind of tied. It didn't stop them from looking for her or for him. And the case basically goes cold for about 10 years. In 2003, Joseph Morrow was found all the way in the Philippines. Police discovered that he took out a passport in somebody else's name. He then went to Europe and spent some time there, and then he traveled to the Philippines. I don't know exactly how, but in one article I saw, it said that his own daughter would end up turning him in. So I'm guessing she must have found out where he was, and then she told police. So that same year in 2003, police then began searching another property that Joseph, I guess, owns nearby where they lived in Menlo Park. And then Donna's body was found on that property in Los Gatos, California. And so Joseph Morrow was charged with her murder. The day his trial was to begin, he would end up pleading guilty. 
He said it wasn't planned. It was a heat of the moment type of thing. They got into an argument and he killed her and they can't prove otherwise. So he was sentenced to 25 years to life. This three-year-old boy is currently missing in Wisconsin. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Elijah Vu. Viewer discretion is advised. Elijah Vu is a three-year-old boy who lives in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. Elijah was last seen on Tuesday morning, February 20th, 2024, at approximately 8 o'clock in the morning. And it says he was last seen by his adult caregiver. And then he was reported missing to 911 about three hours after that by his adult caregiver. Elijah was last seen wearing gray pants, a long sleeve dark shirt, and then red and green dinosaur slip-on shoes. He is described as having sandy brown hair with brown eyes, approximately three feet tall, and weighs about 45 pounds. He does have a birthmark on his left knee. He may also have been carrying a red and white plaid blanket. I believe it's actually the one in this picture. The exact circumstances behind his disappearance, I, I believe, aren't really known. But he was last seen at these apartments, which was on the 3900 block of Mishicot Road. I do also want to say that the police have requested that people please not share any kind of, like, misinformation or rumors. Please don't spread theories. Whatever the information the police are releasing, please share that information. By spreading information like guesswork or your own theories, you may end up hindering this investigation. This is a three-year-old boy who is missing, so please just present the facts. I do know that earlier this morning on February 22nd, they had been searching a nearby landfill, but nothing has been announced as of yet if they found anything. I'm filming this at 9.24 p.m. on February 22nd, so in case I post this and there's new information, that's why. They've gotten hundreds of volunteers who are combing the entire area where he was last seen. They are going door to door, knocking and asking anyone for any information they may have. They have been literally walking through the woods and searching and screaming for his name. And so far, they have found no sign of him. Police were seen collecting a slip-on shoe that looks like it was probably little dinosaurs on it. But I do not know if this has been confirmed to be his shoe or not but they have said they have collected this. His mother, Katrina Bauer, as of this morning at least, she has been arrested, as has a man named Jesse Vang, who I guess lived at that address with them. I see that the mother is being charged with relations to child neglect, but as of me filming this video, no criminal charges in terms of causing his disappearance or anything like that has been filed. I don't know yet what his relation is to the situation or if he's being charged with anything. If you have any information about the whereabouts of three-year-old Elijah Vu, please call 920-686-7200. He would drop the little boy out of this 14-story window to his death. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Eric Morse. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Eric Morse was just five years old. And this was Eric's eight-year-old brother, Derek Lemon. The two boys grew up in Chicago, Illinois, and from what I understand, there were, you know, issues with their parents not always being present. But they were both described as really sweet kids, just really nice, and were both very honest. It would be honesty that would lead to a horrific event. On October 13th, 1994, Eric was approached by two older boys, 10-year-old Jesse Rankins and 11-year-old Tykees Johnson. I don't have younger photos of those two. They asked Eric, hey, go steal a piece of candy for us for, from this shop. Eric said no. He told them stealing is bad and it's wrong and he won't do it. Later that same night, the two older boys found Eric Morse and his brother Derek Lemon. And they said, hey, do you want to come see our cool clubhouse? It's on the 14th floor of this building. And the two kids were like, okay, sure, yeah. The apartment was vacant and it was just open. So all four boys entered the apartment. This is when the two boys would lift up Eric and they would dangle him outside of the window, 14 floors up, as punishment for not stealing the candy earlier. Eight-year-old Derek immediately tried to go rescue his brother. He grabbed his arm, but the two boys threatened to hurt him with a brick if he did anything, so he let go. They dangled Eric out the window again. 
his brother tried to save him once more. And then one of those kids literally bit his hand so hard that the pain made him let go. And then the two boys, while hanging him upside down, they let him go. They dropped Eric Morse from the 14th floor window. What is especially heartbreaking is that Derek immediately ran down 14 flights of stairs because he would later say he thought he could catch his brother before he hit the ground. But when he got there, I mean, Eric was, he was dead. He was on the ground, blood just everywhere. The two older boys were pretty much arrested almost right away. And Illinois had recently passed a law that allowed children 10 years and up to be tried for murder. And so both boys went on trial for murder and they were both convicted. They were only allowed to be sentenced, however, to a maximum of five years apiece. Derek was never the same again. He considered himself worthless because he couldn't save his brother. A therapist would say that Derek became emotionally dead, haunted every single day by what he witnessed and what he couldn't do. He thought of himself as a complete failure. He would never be the same. This is Tykees and this is Jesse. Jesse Rankins would end up getting an additional nine years added to his sentence for assaulting a prisoner. But eventually both men were released. But then after that, both men would be in and out of prison. Derek would end up getting a $1 million settlement from the Chicago Housing Authority. And I think that had something to do with the fact that this building was, well, the kids shouldn't have been able to get into it. They shouldn't be able to get into that apartment, but they did all the same. When Derek was 24 years old, he would attempt to assault a female family member at a barbecue where his aunt's boyfriend then tried to intervene to help the female out. And Derek took out a gun and he shot the aunt's boyfriend and he killed him. He would be convicted of that murder and sentenced to 71 years in prison. His life could have been drastically different had this trauma not occurred doesn't really sound like he truly got the help he probably should have gotten as well. And so the unfortunate reality is, is on that October 13th, 1994 day, both brothers ultimately died. Another thing I found interesting about this case is that Jesse Rankins, while in prison, well, he had Eric Morse's name tattooed on his chest. He said to immortalize him and to remember him. The boy he helped murder and threw out of a 14th floor window. Honestly, this is just a really, really messed up story. You can't see it occurring, but a man in this video was just crushed to death on his first day at the job. Hello, true crimeers. This is another craziest deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. This is a photo of 20 year old Day Davis just hours before his first shift at his very first job. He got a job as a temp at the Bacardi factory. August 16th, 2012 was his very first day. That is him right there pictured just moments before the incident. So all of this here is essentially a palletizer. And this is used to palletize just thousands and thousands of bottles of Bacardi. Now, typically what happens is sometimes the Bacardi bottles fall you know, underneath the machine and they break, they leak, they spill. And so sometimes people have to go underneath the machine, the palletizing machine, and clean up all of the bottles. Well, they gave this job to the temp, Day Davis, on that particular afternoon. So this is video of the actual day in question. You can see that Day in the orange is being asked initially to go down underneath the machine to clean. He, the workers, they're telling him what to do. So in the corner, you see Day Davis entering underneath the machine, and then he would crawl underneath it to clean the glass. He comes back up and asks a question, this guy here says, uh, go get another pair of gloves, you know, to help you clean. And then he sent him back underneath the machine. And then the two workers there, they are seen basically kind of cleaning off the little, uh, the grids, the, uh, the rollers that the bottles will go on. And then they start the machine, not realizing or remembering that Day Davis was literally underneath it at the time. Within seconds, they hear blood curdling screams because Day Davis had just been crushed by a pallet of Bacardi. 2,000 pounds worth on one pallet had fallen on top of him, basically. Again, it was his first day on the job. This guy is trying to get a bar to lift the pallet, but it doesn't work. 
So Davis was underneath, I guess, the hoist portion of this palletizer. They were not utilizing the lockout tag procedure. Because do they ever? It should have been utilized while there was someone underneath the machine. That way there isn't an accidental start of the machine that would put someone at risk. Well, they said, man, eh, fuck it. So the bottles are coming out over here. They're going onto this pallet and they're stacking on top of each other. And then it goes over where Day Davis was working. And this is a very tiny space. And I'm not exactly sure what 100% happened, but the pallet crushed him. And this is thousands of pounds worth of, of, of pressure. He stood no chance. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Bacardi would end up paying a very hefty fine. It doesn't look like anyone was charged though. Just a very unfortunate accident, I guess. It started with a mysterious ring of the doorbell and it would end with a man dead in his bed. Hello, true crimeers. This is the still unsolved mysteries case of Eric Tamiyasu. Viewer discretion is advised. Eric Tamiyasu was born in Hood River, Oregon on November 23rd, 1959. At the time of this case, Eric is 41 years old. He is a very successful businessman. He actually owned a fruit orchard in a remote location near the Hood River, Oregon area. He also owns this really beautiful home just off of the orchard. On June 25th, 2001, Eric would invite over a good friend of his, Diana. The two of them had been friends for many years, but on this particular evening, they were actually on a date. And the date would actually primarily be at Eric's house. They were having a good time. They were, you know, kind of getting to know each other better. They were just laughing, having a couple of drinks. When all of a sudden they heard a couple of knocks just outside the kitchen. At this point is late at night. This is a very remote location. He doesn't really have direct next door neighbors. They don't really think much of the knocking and then they kind of go back to having a conversation when all of a sudden a doorbell rings. Eric goes to the front door and he hears the sounds of running footsteps in the dirt. When he opens the door though, there is nobody there. When Eric and Diana go outside, they notice that there is a single shoe print in the mud that was the direction the person likely would have run away after ringing the doorbell. Diana and Eric would wrap up their evening. Diana would get into her vehicle and Eric waved goodbye. And that was the last time that anyone would ever see him again alive. A week goes by, nobody really sees Eric. No one hears from him. When his friend and business consultant, Don Dixon, got to the house, he saw Eric's truck was parked in the driveway. He knocked on the door and called out for Eric's name. He got no response, the door was locked. He had a spare key to, I guess, a door around the corner, and so he uses his key to enter the home. He walks in, everything seems in pretty decent condition. Nothing seems to be rummaged through, nothing is broken, nothing like that. He kind of slowly goes back towards the back of the house where he gets to Eric's bedroom and that is when he notices a very strong odor and the sound of flies buzzing around. When he finally gets in the bedroom he sees his friend. Eric is lying face down on his bed and he is completely motionless. Dawn gets closer and he notices that Eric is dead. Dawn Dixon calls police Police arrive, and this is where it gets stranger. Initially, the Sheriff's Department, led by Sheriff Joe Wampler, they look at the crime scene and they say, there's no signs of foul play. Nothing appears to be out of the ordinary. He must have died naturally in his sleep. Sheriff Wampler goes to Don Dixon, who is still outside, and says, hey, we're gonna be bringing out his bed and his bedding. Can you take it out and can you burn it for us? We want to do this just to kind of spare the family having to do it because obviously Eric just died in his sleep of natural causes. There's nothing to investigate here. And so Don Dixon obliges. He thinks, okay, they, they know what they're doing. And so he takes all of the stuff that they bring out, his mattress, his, his all of his bedding, everything that was on the bed when he was found and Don burns it and leaves nothing behind. A couple of days later, the coroner comes back with some information that's quite honestly a little perplexing. Eric Tamiyasu didn't die of natural causes. He died of three gunshot wounds to his head. How on earth the sheriff or any of the police officers couldn't tell that? 
from the moment they saw him, how they didn't see any kind of dried blood. Three gunshot wounds to the man's head. That's a little, it's a little funky, a little weird. And also the gun wasn't there. There was absolutely no gun anywhere even in the house. There are three suspects in this case that the public know about. The first suspect that came to mind was the sheriff himself. Sheriff Wampler. You see, there were rumors that Eric Tamiyasu had been dating an older Polynesian woman. Sheriff Wampler just so happens to be married to a Polynesian woman who would have been older than Eric. And so the first person that was suspected as kids to killing him was the sheriff himself. This would play into the fact as to why he specifically wanted to have the bed, the bedding, and everything around it burned the moment the body was found. That makes him being a suspect at that point extremely obvious. He's the sheriff. He did nothing to attempt or sway the coroner to say that he had died of one gunshot wound or lie about what he found. The coroner reported that, you know, Eric Tamiyasu died of three gunshot wounds to the head and the sheriff was like, okay, this is a homicide. If he was the one to have done it, I know it's kind of strange that he burned everything, but why would he call that much attention to himself and then not try to hide the evidence of these gunshot wounds to Eric's actual body? The sheriff would take a polygraph test and he passed. Doesn't really mean much. The second suspect is a man named Eric Smith. Eric and Eric had been really good friends. As a matter of fact, Eric Tamiyasu had been in Eric Smith's wedding. They were like brothers, he said but they were also in business together. John Dixon, Eric Tamiyasu, and Eric Smith, they all worked in the same office building. A few weeks prior to Eric Tamiyasu's murder, Don Dixon says he heard an argument between the two Eric's in Eric Smith's office. They were arguing about something involved with money. Eric Smith says that argument never happened. He says that Eric Tamiyasu didn't owe him money and he didn't own Eric Tamiyasu any money. There was no nothing between them like that. He actually says that there was no financial issues between them at all. He also took a polygraph test and he passed as well with flying colors. Again, it doesn't mean a lot. The third suspect is the man who found him, Don Dixon. There is this belief that Don Dixon lied about this argument he overheard between the two Eric's and he maybe did that to cast suspicion on Eric Smith. Eric Tamiyasu's sister Ramona got a phone call from Don Dixon within minutes of Don Dixon finding Eric's body. And he told her, she says, that Don Dixon said that when he found the body, he couldn't find any exit wounds. And she was like on the phone like, what do you mean exit wounds? I don't know what you're talking about. You found him dead, exit wounds, what? Don would later confirm he did say that to her on the phone before anyone knew how Eric Tamiyasu died. He said that, he, you know, Eric Tamiyasu had been depressed recently and he thought that maybe when he discovered the body, he said his first thought was, oh, he committed suicide. He took a polygraph test. His test came back as inconclusive. Again, doesn't mean much. Diana Anderson, the woman who had last seen him, you know, told police about how they were kind of being harassed at Eric's home with the, the knocking on the side of the house the doorbell ringing. What was that about? Someone had to have gone out there to deliberately do that knocking and doorbell ringing. Was this person doing that to scare Eric? To maybe get Diana to leave so that they could murder Eric? Could it be completely different and random and unrelated? It could be. The odds are it's probably that it was Eric's killer. But the question is, is who? Because all of that evidence, that pertinent evidence, if the bed was completely burned and destroyed, all of the evidence they could have had to help find a killer was gone. There was no fingerprints in the house. There was no forced entry. There was nothing. That shoe impression that Diana said was outside the house after all the harassment was gone before they found the body. Several years later, detectives would announce that there was a fourth suspect, Diana's ex-boyfriend. This is a guy who apparently had issues with stalking behavior in the past. He may have followed her and found out that she was with, you know, Eric Tamiyasu and got pissed off and decided he wanted to do something about it. There are four suspects total. The sheriff, Don Dixon, and Eric Smith. And then this fourth suspect has not been publicly named, but he is considered higher on the list. In February of 2024, no one has ever been arrested. No one has ever been charged with the murder of Eric Tamiyasu. Someone came into his house, 
shot him three times in the head while he was in his bed, and then left like a ghost. And somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth, and perhaps that someone is you. If you have information about the homicide of Eric Tamiyasu in 2001, please contact the Hood River Sheriff's Department and tell them anything you may know. You can always report your information anonymously, and you can help Eric Tamiyasu and his family get the justice he rightfully deserves. He buried her in somebody else's grave, and it would take a Mr. Big operation to finally catch him. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Aaron Chorney. Viewer discretion is advised. Aaron lived in Brandon, which is in Manitoba, Canada. Aaron was described as outgoing and also a little on the rebellious side, which sometimes got her into some trouble. One of those rebellious things was dating a man named Michael Bridges. Michael was an abusive person, mentally and physically, and Aaron's parents said, listen, we don't want you going out with him. But she went out with him anyway. The last time anybody saw 18-year-old Aaron Shorney was on April 21st, 2002. She was reported missing about a week later by her parents on April 27th. I guess it wasn't like totally uncommon for her to kind of just go away for a couple of days. Aaron was 18 years old, and so it wasn't like something totally out of the ordinary. But once police were officially notified, they wanted to talk to this boyfriend, this on-again, off-again boyfriend, Michael Bridges. Michael said he saw her on that final night that everyone saw her last, but he had dropped her off at home and then he hadn't seen her since. Well, police found out that there was an incident about a month prior where Michael literally choked Aaron and slammed her against a wall. His mom had to break it up for him to stop choking her. And when police questioned him, he had no emotion and his, his answer seemed scripted, like he was prepared for them. That's when the family of Aaron and then police started getting these handwritten letters, essentially apologizing for what happened to Aaron. Eventually, it sounded like these letters were being written by a potential killer. But where was Aaron? These letters never stated where she was. And so this image that I've been showing of him is actually from a Mr. Big operation. I don't have time to go into exactly what it all is, but essentially in Canada, they do this undercover sting where the undercover officers pretend to be like a crime organization and they lure in potential subjects like him and they try to get him to confess to a crime he did in the past in order to be accepted into their organization. And it basically works. At first, Michael actually admitted to killing Aaron, but said it was an accident. But the Mr. Big guy said, we need more than that. Then he changed his story. He said, it wasn't an accident. He said he choked Aaron that night, but she didn't die right away, so he drowned her in a bathtub after they got into some fight. He then took her to a cemetery where he dug up somebody else's grave and put her body in it after he wrapped her in a blanket. Police go to that gravesite because he remembered the name, and they dig in sections. And eventually, they find a piece of blanket sticking out of the dirt, and they know they found her. They dig more, and they recover the body of Aaron Chorney. He doesn't know they've done all this yet. He thinks he's about to talk to the boss now, but then the cops come in and arrest him. They already had his confession and he's charged with first degree murder. He is convicted and he gets life in prison, but he could ask for parole after 15 years. I say let him rot forever. She was cheering her brother on playing football and then she was taken. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Gabby Doolin. Viewer discretion is advised. By 2015, Gabby is just seven years old and her family was living near Scottsville, Kentucky. Gabby was described as a young girl who loved bright colors, and her mom said that really kind of showed in her personality. She was very bright and vibrant. She was sweet and loving, free-spirited, got along with everybody, which included her brother, Alec. Alec would say that he loved his sister and that she was this great little girl who would never hurt anyone. He says he remembers her for always being happy and smiling and just making sure everyone else was happy. And Gabby loved her brother so much that she wanted to be a cheerleader for him when, you know, he was playing football. On November 14th, 2015, that's exactly what the family was doing. They were watching 14-year-old Alec play a game of football. And that was at the Allen County Scottsville High School. Gabby was there, she had seen her friends, and she was playing with her friends. And at one point, they were playing hide-and-go-seek. At about 6.50 p.m., a group of these kids would go up to Gabby's mom and say, Hey, have you seen Gabby? They said, we were playing hide-and-go-seek, and we can't find her. 
so her mom and dad, they begin just searching this entire area for Gabby. And then just within minutes, they call 911 to report her missing. And then at 8 p.m., approximately an hour and 10 minutes after the kids had approached her mom, searchers were near this, I guess, creek behind the high school. And they found the body of a little girl face down. She had been sexually assaulted and she was strangled to death. And they confirmed that this was the body of seven-year-old Gabby Doolin. Police immediately begin to question everyone at the football game to say, hey, have you, did you see anything odd, anything that stands out? And that's when several people would say, yeah, Timothy Wayne Madden was there because he had a son who was playing in the football game. Timothy, pictured here with his wife, well, they would approach him at his house and they asked him for the clothing he was wearing that night. When police got the clothing, there was blood on them. On November 20th, 2015, a DNA match came back from the blood found on his clothing. They also had, you know, DNA found with her body and all of it linked back to him. And so Timothy, who looks like a fucking broken pencil with a goatee, he was charged with her murder. They were going to approach this as a death penalty case, but then he takes an Alford plea. Basically, he won't admit he did it, but is acknowledging there is enough evidence to convict him. And so he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. And I hope he drops the soap often. This is the one minute murder case of Gavin Hunter. Viewer discretion is advised. So this particular story happened in Etobicoke, which is in Ontario, Canada. Unfortunately, there is virtually no information though about the case. But on Friday, October 12th, 2001, here at 53 Silverstone Drive, near Finch Avenue West and Martin Grove Road, there was a Honda discovered with a passenger inside who appeared to be deceased. That passenger was 22-year-old Gavin Hunter. The body was discovered at 8.05 a.m. and it was clear that he had been shot to death. And according to local police, people just were not cooperating at the time of the investigation. And that led them to really get nowhere with this case. And unfortunately, that's all the information I have on Gavin's story but Gavin deserves justice. So if you have information, please call 416-222-8477. Gerardus Cornelius Spruitt. Pardon moi, I did not realize I was in the presence of the fanciest fucking name of all time. The hello, true crimeers. Viewer discretion is advised. This is the only photo of Gerardus Cornelius Spruitt that I can, his name sounds like a curse from Harry Potter. Mm. He is from the Netherlands. Specifically, I believe, from the Amsterdam area. Growing up, he was a predator. He would prey on other kids. He forced them to play, like, sexual games with him. In 1941, he was actually sentenced to prison. And this was for indecent assault. In 1952, he is convicted of sexual assault of a child. But by the early 1970s, he was out and about. Free as a bird. He became known as the Donald Duck Culpator. Like, I don't know if that meant, like, the Donald Duck from Disney or what, but he would, like, sell magazines, candy, etc. And, like, in exchange for that stuff, he would convince younger kids to do very inappropriate things with him. On August 4th, 1971, he lured this boy, 10-year-old Bastian Blomena. He lured him to his home, where Spruitt would sexually assault him, and then he strangled him to death. He then wrapped his body in a big piece of cloth. And then two days later, his body was found by a couple of fishermen. And so police would, I guess, purchase another cloth that was identical to the one he was found in to see if anyone would recognize this. What police find out later is that Spruitt's wife, he was married with kids, she did recognize it, but she didn't say anything at first. The day after he had taken Bastian, he took another kid. This time it was 10-year-old Helene Isaac. He mistook her for a boy, and when he got her back to his house, he was mad. And so he strangled her because she was a girl. He then just dumped her body like she was trash and went about his day. She was found a day later. Witnesses had seen Spruitt near the area where she had been dumped. They also determined that Spruitt had a large gap of time where he wasn't working when he was supposed to be working. And so he was arrested here at his house that he shared with his wife and kids. This is the home where he killed two children at least. 
Once he was arrested and brought in, he confessed. This is a guy who had a lifelong history of sexually abusing younger people. Even when he was a younger person, he was still doing it. And it just never went away. This was someone who probably never should have been released, but I guess the law is the law. On April 3rd, 1975, he goes on trial for the two murders. He was essentially sentenced to life from prison, but he was eligible for parole by like the mid to late 80s. He was denied a couple of times. On December 12, 1989, the day after he was denied again for parole, he ended his own life in his jail cell. Just another minion for Satan now. Oh my God, y'all. What? I think we're right. But what? I think we're right. I what? think we're right. I think Ryan is Gypsy's brother. What? Look at this. How? It's so small. My binoculars. I don't, how do you see it? It's so blurry. Oh, this can't be. Because it isn't. Yo, I can't make this up. This is why I had to show you this. You just Because I know you wouldn't believe me because this is so <sighs> far-fetched. <sighs> so now what do we have to say? Because we're someone else. It's amazing to me that you still actually have this video up and don't allow stitches or duets for obvious reasons because you're wrong. But your video has one and a half million views. So you would think integrity would still say, okay, I was way wrong. Let me take this down. But no. So I get it, you don't understand how family trees work. That's fine. Uh, pro tip number one, if you're going to show something as definitive proof of what you're saying, make sure your audience can actually see what you're talking about. You see, because you only ever show this little tiny square and you, can, you can't make out anything on it. We can't see what you were saying. What you should have done was you should have taken this image and blown it up behind you like a green screen or just showed it and then talked over it. I had to zoom in and like screenshot this and the, it's still blurry as a motherfucker. She got this off of a website called genie.com which is not exactly the most reputable site from what I understand, but you have to pay to see this stuff and I'm not about to pay money just to see this. Some people have called this website like the Wikipedia for genealogy and websites. But anyway, family trees don't work the way you're trying to say they work. You see right here, you got Dee Dee Blanchard. You know, she's a, not a good person. We get it. And then a line going to the father, and then that line goes down to this one. That one says, I don't even know what the fuck it says up top. And then it says Anderson and then Blanchard in parentheses. So that's Gypsy Rose because Blanchard was her maiden name and Anderson's her married name. And then this little line right here goes boop over to this one. This box that's not connected directly to any other person. You know what that means? That says something Anderson? That means that's her husband. That's her spouse. The way this works is if a parent on a family tree, if they have children, there's going to be a solid line connecting directly from the parent to the child. That doesn't happen here at all. She only has one direct line directly down to Gypsy Rose. That's how these things work. So this family tree is literally proof that they're not brother and sister. And yet you're saying it is proof that they are. And you have so many people in your comments going like, oh my God, I thought they looked alike. Oh my God, you're right. She isn't. It's wrong. She's wrong. Good job at creating more trauma for her. <laughs> it honestly disgusts me how people would actually try to do this. She's 100% capitalizing off her mom's murder. She could have got the fuck up on her two perfectly working legs and walk straight to the police. Question for you, do you have that same energy towards domestic abuse survivors? Do you tell women who are being constantly beaten by their husbands or their boyfriends, just get out, just leave, idiot. They could have just gotten out, easy. What about to the victims of domestic abuse who didn't survive? Do you go to their graves and say, well, you wouldn't be dead if you just gotten out? And before you try to say things like, well, I was a victim of domestic abuse and I got out, Good for you, if that's the case. That's not the case with most people. Dee Dee Blanchard managed to convince professional doctors that Gypsy had all of these sorts of different ailments, leukemia, stuff like that. And she was treated for all of these illnesses with medications and treatments that she did not need, which did a number on her body, to a point where she was forced to live her life in a wheelchair. She convinced people to have them remove Gypsy's salivary glands. Her teeth were removed. They put a feeding tube into her. She has so many invasive procedures done on her body that she didn't need. 
She went through absolute hell and torture. She went through so much physical and psychological torture that she had the mind of a seven-year-old, even as she was significantly older. Her mom would say like, oh, Gypsy, you had another seizure last night while you were sleeping. It's funny you said she could walk on her two legs, but her mom essentially, like I said, forced her to be in a wheelchair. And Gypsy was at a point where she was terrified to get up out of that wheelchair because she didn't know what Dee Dee would do. She didn't know what further hell she would force her to go through. Oh, one time Gypsy tried to escape and so her mom chained her to a bed for two weeks. Hence why she didn't get the fuck up off her two legs and try to go away. Do you know anything about her story at all? You and I have no idea what it was like to go through what she went through. Most of us don't. Munchausen's by proxy is a very, it's not something we're all very used to. We don't really hear about it much. However, I can have empathy for a person who's been through what Gypsy went through. And I can have understanding that it's not as simple as just going away, calling someone. And I circle back to the domestic abuse thing. I dare you to say this to a woman who's being constantly beaten by her husband or her boyfriend, who is petrified that if she tries to call police, she'll be murdered because so many other women have literally been murdered for trying to get out. It's fair to say Gypsy had that same exact mentality. And so she did the thing she thought she had to do to get out of it. She got caught and she went to prison. She served her time. So instead of going on the internet and judging a victim of abuse that you cannot even possibly understand or relate to, maybe just don't say anything like this at all. So the mystery of who Gypsy's husband is has been revealed. It's not a mystery. And you're never gonna fucking believe it. But you sure so will. So this lady went and looked online yeah? at her mother's DNA profile. It wasn't with DNA. Turns out she had a brother. No. Listed as Ryan... Anderson motherfucking Blanchard. It did not say I that. I can't make this shit up. You just did. Oh my God. She married her brother. She did it. I tried to blow it up, y'all. It's there, though. It is. It's there. It's verified. It is not verified. Screenshot it, blow it up, whatever. You can't read. I did. But it's there. You're blind. All this. You people are a new level of deplorable. You care not about actual people. Do you not understand that Gypsy Rose for the entirety of her life was tortured and abused? Oh, by the way, that woman's original video is no longer available. Probably because it's full of nothing but lies and BS. I don't know about you, but you know, at least the schools in California pretty much taught me how a family tree works, I think in the second or third grade. That's how basic that information is to learn. But you other full-grown adults with nothing but time on your hands should be able to Google this information, but you don't. So once again, this is Dee Dee Blanchard, and then it says father, hmm? They create this line that goes down to this person. It says something Anderson and then Blanchard in parentheses. A parentheses on a family tree indicates that it's a maiden name. Anderson is the married name, her current name. So this is Gypsy. And then this one just says something Anderson. The only line connecting this person to anyone on this tree is this Little line right here. You want to know why that is? I'll say it slowly for you. Because Gypsy and Ryan are married, making them family. So that woman believed that the one that says Anderson Blanchard, that must be Ryan. And then she just ignores the one that just says Anderson as if it's not there. If Dee Dee was Ryan's mom, there would be a direct line from Dee Dee's box to this box. And also from a father directly to this box. You see how there's no line connecting him directly from a parent? That means they're not brother and sister, you dingleberry. And then people flood the comments like, I knew it, I knew it, I knew they were related. They look, he looks just like Dee Dee. He kind of also looks a little bit like Gypsy. First of all, I don't see it. Our brains, the way they work, when you're told something is something, even if it isn't that thing, you're going to see it. It's kind of like that Yanny and Laurel thing, right? When you're told what the word is that's being said, your brain is going to start making your ears hear it. Like, have you ever heard an EVP, like a ghost EVP? You can't understand what they're saying. But then when somebody tells you what it's saying, you suddenly hear it perfectly. That's how our brains work, also with visuals. Yeah. Do you know how many people are on this planet? There's over eight billion of us. Eight billion. There's only so many ways a human can look. Do you know how many times people tell me and ask me, are you Cam from Modern Family? Are you Chris Farley? 
I get compared to a couple of different creators on this app, one male, one female. People always tag me, are you making a true crime or brother? Uh, oh my God, you look just like making a true crime or I can't remember their, their usernames at the top of my head right now. But if you guys know who I'm talking about, feel free to tag them so people can look. This is because every single one of us on this planet, we all have at least one nearly identical twin. Obviously not related by blood, but we just, we look exactly like another person. We also tend to look very similar to many other people. All of us do. For fuck's sakes, I look like him. We've got the same no chin, just neck fat right down to our... <laughs> I guess he's my brother. Hi, Gypsy, or I guess you're my sister too. These people say this like I knew they were brother and sister because he looks just like Dee Dee. They say this as if they have no knowledge of the fact that we all have lookalikes. Like when movies or television shows are trying to cast like the child version of adult actors to show in flashbacks or vice versa. They, go, they purposely go out and look for people who look very similar to the other actor because that's life. That's, that's humans for you. You are all believing this based on your lack of understanding of how this works. And because you guys are imbeciles who refuse to be educated on something as simple as a family tree, it's just more fun for you to believe that Gypsy Rose is married to her brother. How slow can you possibly be? And how sad is your life? Really, truly. Maybe instead of calling a victim of abuse and torture for their entire life, maybe instead of calling them a bitch numerous times, maybe try to imagine what it was like to be in her situation. Fun fact, you probably can't even begin to imagine it. Most of us can't. Gypsy Rose was a severe case of victim of Munchausen's by proxy. Google it, look it up. Because none of you seem to have an understanding of what that is and what that can do to a person from birth until her mother was murdered. Literally is how long it lasted. Gypsy Rose served her time in prison. And because she's not doing the things you want her to do, well, let's drag her down and make up a bunch of bullshit lies. Let's add, because she's going to see these videos. Let's pound more trauma onto this woman. Let's mentally abuse a victim of abuse. You're bad people. Seconds later, two people would be dead from one of the craziest deaths at theme parks. Viewer discretion is advised. This incident took place at an amusement park called Kishkinta, which is located in India. And this is a, it's a pretty messed up story. So this is another variation from a different theme park, but this is called the Disco Dancer. You basically saw what it did at the beginning. You have people who appear to be standing up and the thing spins as it goes kind of back and forth. It seems relatively harmless. Well, at 7.30 p.m. on an evening in May of 2016, the park management here would force about 25 to 30 of its employees to do a test run on the disco dancer. The majority of them would later state that they did not want to do this. They did not want to be the guinea pigs, but the management made them do it. So they go through two test runs and it goes fine, but then they want to do one more test run. And you know what, in a dark way, it's kind of a good thing they did it a third time, but also it's really horrible that they did it a third time because a problem would arise. I'm gonna show you the video, but I'm gonna put myself over the majority of it because obviously it's TikTok, but the incident was captured on video. So viewer discretion is advised. Nothing truly graphic is shown. The ride just completely flew off of its track and it, it essentially rolled and scraped along the concrete, meaning that the people kind of hit the lower end were brought and drug along the concrete with it. 
10 people were very seriously injured. One person was pronounced dead at the scene, and then a second person would die a few days later after succumbing to their horrific injuries. In some horrible way, it's like, well, I guess now they know, so they weren't able to open the ride to the public, but at the expense of these people, these innocent employees who didn't even want to do this, it's just shitty all the way around. The park's owner and I think an HR representative were both arrested. I know the owner was charged with some kind of manslaughter, but I don't know the updates since then. Hopefully someone got in trouble and hopefully a lot of money was dished out. This is the one minute murder case of Homer Abel. Viewer discretion is advised. This particular story happened just a couple of miles east of Rifle, Colorado, and it was off of Highway 6 at the Azamara gas station. On February 27th, 1984, Homer Abel, who was a gas station attendant there, he was found shot and killed there at the gas station. They believe this occurred during a robbery. The suspect was described as a young white male, approximately five feet, eight inches tall, about 150 to 170 pounds. He had dark hair with a dark beard and a trimmed mustache. They believe he may have been driving a dark colored, full-sized American-made pickup truck with a white camper. It's been about 40 years, so the suspect would likely be in their 60s now. If you have any information, please call the Garfield County Sheriff's Department at 970-945-0453. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Nurse Irene Duffy. Viewer discretion is advised. This particular case happened in Glasgow, which is in Scotland, and it occurred, I believe, in June of 1995, I cannot find a lot of information about this case. It is so pretty there. One day, I, f I really do need to visit. At the time of this case, Irene Duffy was 32 years old and she was the mother to one child. And she was a nurse here at Stob Hill Hospital, which I think from what I understand is now abandoned. The father of her child was this man, Stephen McGowan. They had, they had been boyfriend and girlfriend, but had been separated for some time. During an evening in June of 1995, Irene was working her shift at the hospital as a nurse. As she was working in her ward, somebody approached her and stabbed her 41 times. She was rushed into surgery once they found her and she told the doctors, quote, I am not going to die, right? Please don't let me die, end quote. She would not make it. They did everything they could, but she just could not be helped from the 41 stab wounds. This is the aspect that I'm not 100% sure on because one article says that this was this happened in the presence of like 20 or 30 uh, patients. And her ex-boyfriend, 30-year-old Stephen McGowan, he worked at the hospital too. He was an electrician there at the hospital. Over the previous months, Many witnesses would come forward to state that Stephen had threatened Irene on a number of occasions. One day he passed by her in the hall and did this gesture to her. He told someone after the murder happened that, quote, she wouldn't let me see our wee boy on Father's Day, so I killed her. He also said, quote, when I saw her in the ward, I just couldn't take it anymore. She has a new boyfriend, so I stabbed her. He told people out of frustration, I barely ever get to see my kid. This is because the courts ordered it that way. And police, obviously, this was a motive to them. I, I have to believe that these patients witnessed the stabbing and were easily able to point him out. And so he was arrested and charged with the murder. Steve McGowan would be convicted of the murder. He was sentenced to life in prison, but with the option of getting parole eventually. This son of a bitch only served 12 years and was released early. He, st he stabbed her 41 times and he only got 12 years in prison. He would end up falling in love with a new woman. This woman ended up getting the head teacher position at a school, but the public found out she was dating this murderous monster and they demanded she not be allowed that job. And the public won. She had to step down. Maybe don't date and move in with people who stab their girlfriends. Along with Elijah Vu, there is another missing child in Wisconsin. Hello, true crimeers. This is the missing persons case of Isaiah Kramer. Viewer discretion is advised. 16-year-old Isaiah Kramer was living in the Vernon, Wisconsin area. 
I believe this is in Waukesha County. The 16-year-old was last seen on February 4th, 2024. He was staying at a residential treatment center for mental health issues at the time. However, on the evening of February 4th, he just seems to get up and he walked away from the center. Isaiah also requires daily medication in which it's been confirmed he does not have those with him. His last confirmed location was on Maple and Center. But according to police, there have been tips that have ranged from like Manitowoc County in Wisconsin and also in Illinois. Police also received a tip that he may have been seen on February 5th near the intersection of Edgewood Avenue and Center Drive. They have gone to that location, they have searched, but they have not found anything. The community has chipped in, the police are obviously also looking and they are searching everywhere they can for the 16 year old boy. They have brought in dogs to see if they can pick up his scent, but it does not sound like they have been able to get anything. I also know they are, they've been utilizing drones too. His mom has gone on the news just kind of pleading to him if by chance he is out there. She is just pleading for him to come home if he sees any of these news clips. And obviously they are hoping for the best. I am filming this though on February 23rd, 2024. And again, he went missing on February 4th. He has been missing at this time for approximately 20 days. Again, he is 16 years old. He is five foot 10, approximately 220 pounds with black hair, brown eyes, he was last seen wearing dark colored sweatpants and then a dark hooded sweater. Police and his family are urging anyone, if they have any information, please contact them immediately. You can remain anonymous if you need to. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. So if you have information about the missing 16 year old boy, Isaiah Kramer, please contact 262-446. 5090, there is a $2,000 reward. Please help Isaiah get home. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Jackie Hartman. Viewer discretion is advised. Jackie was born on October 15th, 1987. I really can't find a whole lot of information on her, but her family would say that they will always remember her for her smile, her commitment, and her devoted love that she embodied kindness. Jackie, at the time of this case, was 19 years old and she was actually a nursing student, which honestly would just kind of show the type of person, you know, that she was, someone who wanted to help people. It was January 27th, 2007. That night, I guess Jackie had met a man named, oh God, Jonathan Ian Burns. They went out on a date that night. That same night, Jackie would later call her sister, Randy, and her sister said she seemed that Jackie seemed a little off, maybe a little nervous. And then Jackie had asked Randy, hey, can we meet at this you know, particular gas station? And Randy said, yes. Randy gets to the Diamond Shamrock gas station and Jackie never shows up. Randy waited hours and nothing. The next day in Mesa, Arizona, a maintenance worker had noticed something in one of the dumpsters at an apartment complex that he worked at. There was a purse, a blouse, a bra, underwear, and sandals, and they were torn up and there was blood. Police collected those items and they tested the blood and it was confirmed to belong to Jackie Hartman. Police would arrest Jonathan Burns pretty much right away because he lived at that apartment complex where those items were found and they know that he had been with her that night. In his car, they found blood-stained clothing that was his clothes, but it had Jackie's blood on it. They also found an earring that belonged to Jackie in his truck. In his home, they found a case to a nine millimeter, but the gun was missing. Three weeks later in the Sycamore Creek area and in the desert, a body was found. Soon confirmed to be the body of 19 year old Jackie Hartman. She had at least two gunshot wounds to her head. There was also clear indications that she was sexually assaulted and there was male DNA left behind. That DNA would match Jonathan Burns. Jonathan's cell phone records also placed him in that area where the body was found the night she went missing. So he was charged with sexual assault, kidnapping, murder, and he had weapons charges as well. Oh God. He would go on trial and the evidence against him was overwhelming. And without fail, he was found guilty of the murder 
and he was sentenced to death. He also had a girlfriend named Mandy who got two years in prison, basically buying him the guns when he was on parole from a different crime. He's still awaiting his execution. The family started the Jackie Hartman Memorial Foundation, meant to help with other missing people, and therefore Jackie will live on. She was just stolen directly out of her home, and they are still to this day looking for the answers. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Jamika Porch. Viewer discretion is advised. Unfortunately, there is very little detailed information about this case and virtually no photos to go with it. The story happened in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and on August 14th, 1994, four-year-old Jamika Porch was over at her grandma's house and she had been put to bed and she was supposed to be sharing a bed with her cousin. When Jamika's grandma went in there in the morning to wake her up, she noticed that Jamika was not in the room. The grandma, however, wasn't like freaking out about it because she just assumed that Jamika's mom had picked her up in the in middle of the night. And so when the grandma calls Joyce, the, you know, Jamika's mom, Joyce says, I did not pick her up. And so they go into panic mode and they start searching for her. It wouldn't be until seven hours later. So I guess there was a gap of time, seven hours between when she was first noticed missing between the time where the police were called, seven hours. So when police arrive, they come to the conclusion that the potential crime scene here may have been, you know, meddled with, not intentionally or deliberately, just that people had been kind of in and out of the house in that seven hour time frame. They found out that there was a plexiglass panel that had been removed from a door the morning they discovered her missing. But the police were told that that plexiglass was then put back into place because this was something that I guess everyone did all the time for whatever reason, I don't know. They know now it's been handled by multiple people and so any usable evidence off of it is probably gone. They search all over Chattanooga. I mean, they're looking high and low for this little girl. She's all over the news. Eventually her case gets to Unsolved Mysteries, America's Most Wanted, and unfortunately it just does not yield any tips or information. The police's investigation really doesn't get them anywhere. Unfortunately, like I said earlier, I don't have many details about this. So if they investigated people from the family, the neighborhood, friends, I'm not 100% sure. What I do know is that unfortunately, five years later in October of 1999, there were some workers doing a tree trimming service when they came across skeletal remains of a very small person. And this was at the Riverside Industrial Park off of Amnicola Highway, or Amnicola Highway, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. The remains were collected and they were examined and dental records were brought in and they confirmed that those remains were in fact Jamaica Porch. They were able to confirm that her cause of death was ligature strangulation. And this was a murder. But who murdered this sweet, innocent girl? That is still a mystery. And so the police need your help. If you have any information at all, please contact the Chattanooga Police Department immediately. You can always report your information anonymously. Please help catch Jamaica's monster. This is the one minute missing or murdered indigenous woman case of Janice Marie Hannigan. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Janice was a 16 year old high school student. She was a member of the Yakima Nation and she was living with her father in Wapato, Washington. She was one of seven children. Her parents had recently separated. Her six siblings stayed with their mom while she remained with her dad. On December 21st, 1971, Janice would enter a hospital because she had a bunch of bruises on her. The only records that still remain says that she was released from the hospital on December 24th, 1971. The cause of those bruises is unknown. They said she left the hospital in good condition. What hospital she went to is also unknown. But she left and then just disappeared off the face of the earth. At one point they thought maybe she was a runaway, but now she is presumed dead. The police also misgave her disappearance date by a lot. If you have information, you can call this number here. Unfortunately, both of her parents have since passed away, never knowing what happened to her, but someone out there can help. So if that person is you, please help. He left his house to blow off some steam and go for a walk, but he has never come home. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Jim Kimball. Viewer discretion is advised. Jim Kimball lived in Oak Park, Illinois with his family. Big family, because he had five siblings. As a kid, he was always described as pretty shy, quiet, reserved. And then sadly, in August of 1982, his dad passed away suddenly 
from a heart attack. And that seemed to make Jim's mental state, you know, worsen. He became more quiet, didn't seem to show any emotion with his dad's passing. And then a couple of years later, he was in the garage, I guess, playing a band with his brother. And all of a sudden he got really angry. He took the drumsticks and he like chucked him at a wall. And so his mom took him to the hospital. He was treated for some time and he would be seen by a psychiatrist and he was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. He had told the psychiatrist that he was in fact very angry about his dad dying and also he was hearing voices in his head. It got pretty bad uh, and he needed medication constantly in order to you know, level him out and balance him out. He had to go into the hospital several times over the years, but he managed to get through like high school. He got a job or two after high school. He was doing okay. And so now that takes us to April 13th, 1993. Jim is now 24 years old and he's living in a halfway house about 10 miles away from his family home. He was visiting his family home on April 13th when something about the stereo they had just bought, it really pissed him off. And he got really like demonstrative and just loud and uh, he showed his temper. And so he said, I'm leaving, I'm gonna go take a walk, I'll be back. Jim Kimball walked out the door and his family would never see him again. His family would report him missing to police and they really just didn't get anywhere with this. You know, they were searching hospitals, they were searching halfway houses. They, you know, talked to any and all friends he may have had in the area. There was nothing, no signs of him at all, no indications where he might be or where he would have gone. He just vanished. According to Unsolved Mysteries, in 1994, in March, a man was seen walking down a, a road in South Bend, Indiana, who was incredibly intoxicated. This is 90 miles from where Jim Kimball's home was. The officer gave him a sobriety test, but then released him. Many months later, that officer saw the missing persons poster and, and they, he says, I think that may have been him, but he's also not sure. And nobody's sure. Nobody has seen him. Nobody knows where he is. And so if you have information on his whereabouts, please call 708-343-4244. The video you see behind me are the final fatal moments of a few people who are doing something that you should never ever try at home. This is another craziest deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. Dry ice is not a toy. It's also not your standard ice. And it's certainly not a substance that you should just throw into water, especially in areas where there is no ventilation because it turns into a carbon dioxide gas. The story took place here in this, I guess, bath and sauna center, and this is in Russia. Yekaterina Dedenko, I am so sorry if I said her name wrong. She was celebrating her 29th birthday at that location, and there with her was her husband and some friends. She, I guess, is an Instagram influencer. While several people were in the sauna, they got really hot, and they said they wanted to cool off. And they had this idea of dumping dry ice in the pool. The pool's located indoors where there is no ventilation and it's a small room. What you are about to see is the actual video leading up to the moments of the deaths, but there is no graphic imagery. There's no blood, there's no gore, there's nothing, but just in case, viewer discretion is advised. You can see that it basically and immediately turned into a giant cloud of gas. And some of the people had just dove right in. It was 25 kilograms worth of dry ice, or I guess about 55 pounds worth. There are no windows. And so immediately this gas cloud will be inhaled by everyone in the room. And several of those people immediately began to suffocate. And this kind of thing can take usually a couple of minutes. And honestly, it sounds like they weren't aware that this was going to happen when they did this. But at the same time, they were also aware enough to wear protective like gear. 
So pretty much everyone in that room began to suffocate and some of them were like choking pretty bad. And again, this is lasting a couple of minutes. At least three of those people would end up falling unconscious. Those three people would die. They died slowly. They died somewhat painfully by choking to death because they had inhaled a massive amount of this. Her husband was one of the people who died. So if anything, please let this be a lesson. Dry ice can be extremely dangerous and it can lead to death. So please remember that. Allegedly, he climbed down a snowy hill to get help, but he's never been seen since. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Joseph Helt. Viewer discretion is advised. This story happened here in Ellensville, New York. And this was 17-year-old Joseph Helt, who would go by Joe to everyone. Joe was described as your typical 80s teenager. He loved, like, heavy metal music. He loved partying. He loved going to, like, bonfires. And he was also a really talented artist. Joe was also really excited because he recently got a job at a place called The Auction Barn, something he really loved to do. He loved earning money, and he wanted to get as much money as he could. And so when he didn't show up one night to work, it made everyone very, very suspicious. It was January 17th, 1987. Joe failed to show up to his job. His work will call his mom and say, hey, he didn't show up. Is everything okay? His mom was like, well, that is very strange. I haven't, you know, I haven't seen him. This is because Joe had gone out the night before on Friday, and it was extremely common for him to sleep over at a friend's house, crash, and then just stay there throughout the day and then go to work. You know, she didn't really think much of it at all. But when she found out he didn't go to work, that's when she was like, what? So on January 16th, 1987, that night, Joe and some of his friends would go to this abandoned ski lodge near Ellenville. It was just like a super popular hangout spot. They were just partying and having a good time. It was just a fun night. Then Joe gets into a car with a few friends. John LaForge, who's 21, and then fellow teenagers Wade Marks and Kelly Diaz. And they were in John LaForge's Subaru. It was incredibly snowy that night. And at one point, their vehicle gets stuck in the snow. And you can see here kind of on this map. So according to the other three, Joe gets out of the car and he's trying to like help dig the car, you know, out of being stuck. Joe gets really frustrated and I guess he says, I'm just going to go down the hill. I'm going to walk down to go get help. And that was it. Joe was gone forever. He's never been seen since. Once he was reported missing, again, he is a teenager. The police go out there and they are looking high and low for him. For the rest of the winter season, they are looking everywhere they can. They are going through treacherous areas up and down hills, looking in snow banks, but they find nothing. They even wait for the, the snow to thaw completely and search all over again. Again, nothing. Not even a piece of clothing, a shoe, nothing. Did Joe fall in some crevasse somewhere, never to be seen again, buried underneath feet of snow? Well, when it melted, he wasn't anywhere. I know what you're thinking, because I'm thinking it too. The friends seems kind of sus, right? Police say that none of them are considered suspects at this point, because they have no evidence. They have no body. But rumors circulated. Rumors related to, like, illegal substances, if you know what I mean. However, those are just rumors circulated by, you know, other teenagers at high school. Rumors of uh, he fell in the snow and he, he's buried somewhere. Uh, the friends must have killed him after getting in some kind of fight over drugs. There's this, just a laundry list of things that people have said could have happened to him. But the truth is, is nobody knows. Those three friends have been questioned thoroughly. They've been investigated. And again, police just do not have evidence to suggest they did anything to him. They need a body first before we can really move on with this. It's just kind of amazing that they haven't been able to find him, especially if it was like an accident. Like if he fell down this hill or into a crevice somewhere and they didn't find him at first, then they let the snow melt and he still isn't found. Could animals have gotten to him? Sure. But usually there's at least something remaining that they find. How far could he have gotten? His family, they just want answers. They want closure and they want to lay him to rest if that is the case. They haven't stated officially that foul play is in play here, but there is always that possibility. And if you do know something, it's your duty to go to police and tell them. You can be anonymous. You don't have to say who you are, just say what you know. So if you have information about the disappearance of Joe Helt, please call 845-626-2800. You can also call 1-800-843-5678. Please help bring Joe home to his family, and if a crime was committed, help him get the justice he deserves. She would vanish from a rest stop late at night. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of June Streeter.
viewer discretion is advised. This is the only photo that I could find of anyone involved here. June had met a man named Lawrence Streeter sometime around 1969 or so, and they traveled together as a singing duo for like a, like a traveling carnival. They would travel a lot, and June also had two children from a previous marriage. But by 1973, June is apparently tired of all the traveling, and she kind of just wants to settle down. According to June's family as well, June had tried to leave Lawrence on a couple of occasions because he was abusive. At one point, he even threatened her with a pistol if she left. And as many times as she was able to get away, she would always go back to Lawrence. We have discussed this many times. It is extremely difficult for someone to leave a relationship like that, especially when there's children involved and you think someone could die if they leave. In October of 1973, June, Lawrence, and her two kids would travel down to Alta, Florida. They did this by car. And then on October 8th, 1973, they were on their way back home to Penn Yan, New York. They also had their two dogs with them. On the night of October 8th, 1973, they would pull off at a rest area in Widawi, Alabama, and they were going to just sleep there that night. They were in a situation similar to this. This is not the actual setup. But the two children would end up sleeping in the car that night. Lawrence, June, and the two poodles were sleeping in the camper. According to police later, there was a noise complaint coming from the rest stop near, I guess, where the trailer was parked. The police had gone out there. They checked. They didn't hear or see anything suspicious, and so they just left. The following morning, Lawrence wakes up, he tells the two kids, June left, she's gone. He says she just took off while everyone was asleep. The dogs were in the trailer, they were barking up a storm, but he would not let the kids inside that trailer. As a matter of fact, he unhooked it from the car, he then drove the two kids to a, I guess, a nearby city, he literally put them on a bus and sent them back to Bath, New York, where the children's father lived. Lawrence never reported her missing, as a matter of fact, he just went about his life. By 1974, like early 1974, her family reports her missing because they haven't seen or heard from her. The police question Lawrence and he gives them permission to search this trailer. They do find a 32 caliber pistol in some of June's clothing, but nothing else, no blood or anything like that. They searched Florida, Georgia, Alabama, found no traces of her whatsoever. Her family believes that she is likely deceased. She was probably murdered that night. Lawrence has since died. But if you have information on her whereabouts, please call 315 536 4426. The search ended here. Five year old Justin Turner was dead. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Justin Lee Turner. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Justin Turner was just a five-year-old boy living in Berkeley County, South Carolina with his dad and his stepmom. On the afternoon of March 3rd, 1989, Justin's parents would report the little boy was missing. When police arrived, they questioned the two parents and they said that Justin had gotten onto the school bus that morning, but then he never returned home. And so right away, a search began. You had police, you had volunteers, all searching this entire area. They combed through every part of the property that the Turners lived on. And you know, at first they weren't finding anything, no sign of Justin at all. But two days later in this camper, which is on the Turner property, the discovery was made by his own father. The search ended here. Five-year-old Justin Turner was dead. You may feel inclined to have sympathy for this man because he went into that camper and he found his dead son. Don't have sympathy for him. You see, Victor Lee Turner, he literally just stepped into the camper and within a moment he did that on the news. My son is in there. And he said basically that he was dead. However, Victor didn't actually really go all the way into the camper. He just peeked his head in and saw him. And then here's the other significant issue. That trailer had been searched more than once already. So how, two days later, after it's been searched, how now are they finding the body in there? And why was it the father, who just was the one to miraculously discover him? The five-year-old boy had been strangled to death. He had ligature marks around his throat. 
the trailer was dirty and all of this, and, and according to how he was found in his body, by the evidence, it appeared he had been placed in that trailer literally just before he was found. He had no, like, dirt or dust or anything on him. But who put him there, and how did they do that during the search? At one point, they arrested his stepmother, Megan, because they had discovered that she lied about where Justin was that morning, about the bus. However, they did not have any other evidence at the time linking her to his death. So they basically dropped charges and they released her. And then, just a couple of days ago, in January of 2024, they announced that they have arrested the killers. Killers, yes, plural. 69-year-old Victor Lee Turner and 63-year-old Megan Turner are arrested and charged with Justin Turner's murder. A cold case team who had reopened this case really recently, and they were combing through all of the evidence, they were combing through all of the affidavits, they were combing through all of the witness statements. They noticed a massive amount of discrepancies in their statements. First and foremost, they said that Justin had gotten on the school bus that morning. But, according to witness statements, numerous witnesses said he was not on the school bus that morning. He wasn't even at school that day. Nobody, nobody had seen Justin Lee Turner that morning, the morning he was reported missing. They also found physical evidence on his body that back then in 1989, they did not have the scientific technology to really kind of look at it. But now in 2024, our technology has advanced a lot. And so physical evidence connected both of the parents to his remains. Also, over the course of that 35 years where this case hadn't been solved, not one time did either parent ever call to inquire about his case. Not once. They never asked, where are you guys in this? They didn't say a peep. That's a little concerning. The three-day search is over, but not in a way anyone wanted to see. St. Brian TV2 Action News Update, Monk's Corner. He crying for her. You did it. Ugh. You know, the news, you know, showed his clip of him crying and sobbing and because they found his son. And it was fake. It wasn't real. This wasn't real. This was a show. He had killed him. He and his wife strangled that little boy, hid his body somewhere, and then two days into the search, moved his body to the trailer so that, you know, they could find him. And police never had any other, like, viable suspects. I mean, they looked into people, but... It always came back to the two parents. And so finally, just a couple of days ago, they finally got the answers they needed. This case is not closed. The trial for these two obviously has not even happened yet because they were just literally both arrested like a week or so ago, maybe less. So this will be like one of those kind of cases that, you know, we'll have to get an update on later. But it sounds like little Justin Turner is finally going to get the justice he rightfully deserves. Corey Foster has gotten away with murder because he is chums with the police. Hello, true crimeers. This is the incredibly frustrating case of Katie Palmer. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this story, Katie Palmer was a 38-year-old mother and a teacher. She taught middle school science in Denison, Texas. She was very happily married to John Palmer, and they had two very wonderful children together. Katie was the light of their lives. She was an incredible mother. She was also an amazing teacher and her students loved her dearly. But on April 21st, 2020, someone would take all of that away and he doesn't even get a slap on the wrist. It was fairly early in the morning on April 21st, 2020. Katie and her husband, John, decided to take a walk down this road near their home in Denison, Texas. When all of a sudden a man driving an F-250 was driving recklessly down the road, he swerved and he made contact with both John and Katie. John was launched 70 feet and he was literally knocked out of his shoes and so was Katie. She had been launched 75 feet. John couldn't walk. He had to crawl over to his wife to see what the damage was to her. John ends up with a broken back. Katie is airlifted to a hospital, but there was no saving her. She would be pronounced deceased. This wonderful teacher, this mother, this wife, was killed by a man driving a truck recklessly. The man behind the wheel was Corey Foster. I guess he was a neighbor to them. Police arrive and from the get-go, they are unprofessional. State Trooper Tarif Al-Khatib 
He uh, administered a breathalyzer test. Corey blew a .06. The legal limit is .08. But then he didn't do anything else. He didn't arrest Corey. He also didn't take him to get a blood test. Despite being caught on body cam talking to this state trooper, literally stating, I was like, dude, he's probably drunk. He also said he knocked the f out of her, dude. He claimed he didn't know Corey, yet he's caught on camera also saying he sells medical equipment. He knew where he lived. He knew that Corey Foster was a drunk. He knew all this stuff about him. So what did Tarif Akatib do? He drove Corey Foster home and said, sleep it off, champ. Turns out Tarif and Corey Foster were kind of chums. And then the line of succession, we're talking like the DA, stuff like that, all had connections, familial connections to him. But because he's chums with Corey Foster, well, <sighs> these two kids just have to deal with their mom being dead and no one getting in trouble for it. The DA did try to get an indictment against Corey Foster, but the jury said, nah, no indictment. Turns out the people in the grand jury also had connections to Tarif. Shocker. Also, from what I understand, the according to the cell phone data of Corey Foster, he was literally in the middle of typing in, manually typing in a phone number on his cell phone while he was slightly intoxicated, maybe not the legal level of, of drunk, but he wasn't even looking at the road, he was looking down when he then basically, with a combination of all of this, swerved and careened into John and Katie, going, I think, at least 30 or so miles per hour. Texting and driving in Texas is literally against the law. And they had proof that he was typing in that phone number or something on his phone at the exact same time he hit the couple. But no, I guess yeah, that's okay. It's okay, I guess, for him. At the very least, you have a form of negligent homicide, manslaughter, something along those lines that he can be charged with. But they're just, they're just, they just won't do it. They won't do it. He killed a person. He killed her and almost killed another person. And what? We're just gonna give him a big hug and say, ah, oh, it's okay, bud. Maybe next time you won't kill someone when driving intoxicated and trying to text on your phone, you know? She's looking for the evidence she thought would never be found. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Keith Gentry. Viewer discretion is advised. Wayman Keith Gentry, who would go by Keith to everyone. He was born on September 2nd, 1974 in Waco, Texas. He was one of three kids. He also had two sisters, grew up in a really loving home, and eventually he would meet this woman here, Darlene Doskasil. They had been dating for a while, but then they broke up, but then they kind of rekindled that, and then they ended up getting married in 1999. And they would go on to have three sons. Darlene was a former prom queen. She was also a former beauty pageant winner. She had started to go to school for to become a dental assistant, but then eventually she ended up getting her nursing degree. At first, the family seemed to be a nice, big, happy family. They would end up purchasing a property that was next door to Keith's parents' house, and they built this home. And then eventually, it sounded like their marriage began to kind of deteriorate a little bit. Everything wasn't so hunky-dory. It was 6.15 a.m. on November 9th, 2005. Darlene Gentry calls 911 to say someone broke into their house and that her husband had been shot. She also said it appeared that their guns had been stolen. Keith Gentry was found on his bed in a pool of blood, but he was still alive and so he was rushed to the hospital. It appeared he had been shot in the back of the head while he was sleeping. The gun cabinet, which had all of their guns, was not broken. It had a glass cover. It was just opened. The key to it was always on the top of the gun cabinet, and that was used to open the door. There was no forced entry in the house. The person seemed to have entered through a back door, but nothing was damaged. It's as if they just walked in. And then, just outside the house, kind of towards the corner, they find all of the guns. Just there, on the ground. Why would the robbers go in there with this intent to steal these guns and then just leave all of them on the front lawn? What? Darlene claims she was actually sleeping in the boy's bedroom that night because the 18-month-old had woken up and was having a hard time getting back to sleep. So she kind of just, you know, slept next to him. And she woke up after all of this. She didn't hear anything. She didn't see anything. Meanwhile, at the hospital, the doctors worked tirelessly on Keith. But unfortunately, they could not save him, and Keith Gentry passed away. He died of a single gunshot wound to the back of his head. It was determined to come from a 22 caliber uh, weapon. 
The one and only gun that was missing from the pile of guns was a 22 caliber. Keith was likely shot by one of his own guns. Apparently, in a trash can in the home, detectives found a pair of latex gloves, along with the casing of a 22 caliber bullet. The latex gloves had DNA, DNA that came back to both Keith and Darlene. And police just weren't believing Darlene and Darlene's story. A lot of it just seemed very off. The fact that there was no forced entry into the home, all but one of the stolen guns were just sitting there on the front lawn, the gun cabinet wasn't broken into, it was opened with the key, and then the DNA with the glove found with the, the casing, they arrested Darlene Gentry and they would charge her with the murder of her husband. They discovered two different life insurance policies on Keith that would all get paid out to Darlene, somewhere around like $800,000 or so worth. Now, Keith's parents didn't believe that Darlene had done this. They actually were fighting for Darlene and they ended up posting her bond. And then from what I understand, Darlene purchased like a property that was sold to her by one of Keith's relatives. That property had a pond behind it. And at first Darlene's like, oh, I love the pond, let's keep it. But then she suddenly changed her mind. She said, you know what? Let's fill in the pond. Why? The person who was selling the property to her said, oh, this is kind of weird. And so he contacted police. They searched the pond out of curiosity, the police. What did they find? TikTok is weird about showing all of this, but a 22 caliber revolver. It was the gun they confirmed that shot and killed Keith Gentry. How did it end up in this pond? Well, police decided to do a little sting operation. They put cameras on the pond and then told the owner that, hey, tell Darlene that you're gonna drain the pond. So he does. And Darlene says, oh shit. And they set up cameras and lo and behold, Darlene Gentry shows up to the pond on camera and she makes a beeline to the exact location that police had found the gun already. Here she is looking in the water. What's for Darlene? Literally just sifting through the water, trying to find something. And this was just more evidence for police. So she goes on trial and they have a mountain of evidence against her. She claims her innocence. And still, you know, Keith's family was like, well, we, we believe Darlene. I think that is until they saw the footage in court of her looking for the gun. And the jury was convinced she was guilty of killing her husband, likely for money. It was a rocky marriage there towards the end. So this was her way out. So the jury there in Robinson, Texas, found her guilty of the murder. Darlene was sentenced to 60 years in prison for murdering her husband and the father of her children, Keith Gentry. She will first be eligible for parole in 2037. He said the voices in his head told him to kill the young girl. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Kristen Jackson. Viewer discretion is advised. The story happened in 2002 and Kristen Jackson at the time was 14 years old. Kristen was described as talented, intelligent. She was a sweet and loving young girl. She could be shy at times, but when she was with friends and family and classmates, she was a very fun, entertaining young girl. She was an aspiring musician who loved playing the drums. And she was a member of the Northwestern High School Marching Band. On September 9th, 2002, Kristen would attend the Wayne County, Ohio Fair. She had gone there with her sister and then a couple of friends. At one point, it sounds like she got separated from her group and she would end up leaving the fair and began to walk home. Unfortunately for Kristen, the same time she was walking home, this man, Joel Yaki, was in his vehicle driving down the same road. Joel had just literally gotten out of prison not too soon before this. He had served 15 years for the sexual assault of a 17 year old. He had just lost his job. He had a 28 year old son who basically wanted nothing to do with him. He was depressed and he was a loose cannon at that point. He just so happened to see what he thought was a young boy walking down the side of the road. But when he realized it was a young girl, he decided to stop his car and ask her if she wanted a ride. He managed to convince her to coax her into his vehicle. He and Kristen had never met each other before. He said he was taking her home, but then he drove down a rural road where she then began to panic. He parked in a dark area where he then tried to force her to take off her clothes. 
She begged him and said, my parents will pay for my return. Please don't do anything to me. He then says he heard voices in his head and they said, you need to kill her. You need to rape her, hurt her, and then kill her. He says he tried to snap the 14-year-old girl's neck, but it didn't work. He had a piece of string in his truck that he took and he wrapped it around her neck and then he strangled her. And that was after he had actually sexually assaulted her. He puts her body in the back of his car. He goes home, then he leaves, and he cuts up her body and disposes of her body parts in various places in a swamp nearby. The next day, he sees his mom with a flyer about the missing girl, and he, like, panics. Within a couple of days, police are at his doorstep because he was the closest sexual offender in the area to where she disappeared. And he confessed, and he said that voices told him to do it. They would eventually find the pieces of her body. He would be convicted and sentenced to life in prison. In 2007, he died a horrifically painful death in prison. He had a torn bowel that led to a massive infection, and they said it was a very painful death. Leaving Los Angeles and moving to California to start over. What route did the plane take? Do you think your wife's still alive? I have to think she is, because when you give up hope, that's when you, you stop doing anything, and I'll never stop doing it. So yeah, she's alive. She's alive somewhere, and I'm going to find her. She wasn't. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Lisa Solomon. Viewer discretion is advised. Lisa Weaver was born in 1965 in Long Island City, New York. At the time of this story, she is a 21-year-old bank employee. And around that time, she met a steel worker named Matthew Solomon. They started to date, and then they soon got married. They married in October of 1987. On December 25th, Christmas Day, 1987, approximately six weeks after their wedding, Matthew would call police to report his wife missing. He told police that the two of them had gotten into an argument the night before and Lisa had apparently stormed out of the house wearing nothing but a t-shirt and underwear, despite it being below freezing temperature, and she never came back home. And so he thinks something must have happened to her. Immediately, police go door to door. They start asking neighbors questions. They are searching everywhere for her and asking as many people as they can for any information. Michael goes on the news, that clip I played at the beginning, saying he has to believe his wife is still alive. He is seen in the news searching for his wife actively. He appeared to be playing the role of a very concerned newlywed husband whose wife is missing and he just wants her home. Six days later in this field here, which was not too far from behind their house, the body of Lisa Solomon was found in a large trash bag. When they found her body, Matthew collapsed to the ground and it was all very theatrical and he was rushed to the hospital, but he was fine. They would then question him with regards to his wife's death because it appears she had been strangled to death. And while he's being interviewed, he confesses. He says the two of them got into a fight that night. She was physical to him. He was physical to her. He ended up putting her in just kind of like bear hug, chokehold thing and wrestled her to the ground where then she just suddenly stopped moving and stopped breathing. And so he panicked and he hit her body in a bunch of trash bags and then dumped her. So he was promptly arrested and charged with her murder. His defense said this was a crime of passion. It was a heat of the moment thing, but the coroner would determine that the strangulation that occurred was not from like some kind of like bear hug thing. It was like a strangulation. And so the jury found him guilty of second degree murder and he was sentenced to 18 years to life. His dad was very theatrical after he was found guilty. Jack and then Matthew's sister blew up in court as well after the verdict was read. He killed someone. This is what happens. He served 30 years in prison. He married twice and had a child. And he was paroled in 2019. $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is a butter topic. Who is it? Was that the actual voice of a kidnapper? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Margaret Ellen Fox. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this story, Margaret Fox was just 14 years old. She lived here in this neighborhood in Burlington, New Jersey. In June of 1974, Margaret would take out this exact ad. 
saying, babysitters, experienced, teen girls, love kids, work at your house, call, and then there was a number there. Margaret was hoping to get her very first work, and she very quickly got a call. The call came from a man who said his name was John Marshall. Eventually, the two of them would arrange a time to meet. And so on June 24th, 1974, the 14-year-old girl would get on a bus, and her family would never see her again. The plan was for her to get to a certain location, and then this man, John Marshall, would pick her up in a red Volkswagen. This is the exact street where Margaret got off the bus and entered a store pictured here on the right. There were witnesses who confirmed that Margaret Fox made it to this location, but nobody appeared to see what happened to her after that. And so when Margaret never came home that evening, and she never called, her family reported her missing. The police immediately began their search for her. They tried to find out who this John Marshall person was. This is 1974. They didn't have, like, the call tracing abilities we have now. And so I guess they could not discover what number the man called from. Very soon after she was reported missing, the family would receive this very quick but very chilling call. $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is a butter topic. Who is it? $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is a butter topping. This was a supposed ransom call. The man never identified himself. He never gave proof of life. He never called back. And Margaret Fox has never been found. Police were eventually able to discover the phone number that was used to actually call her. It took some time, but they finally got it. And it came from a payphone. This is a description of a man who may have been seen in that area around that time of the call. This man, I believe, may have also been seen in the area when Margaret was probably kidnapped. They don't know if this is the actual guy or if this is just a random person, but they figured put his image out there, maybe someone recognizes him. More importantly, maybe someone recognizes that voice. Margaret would look something like this if still alive today but the belief is that she was probably killed around the time she was kidnapped. There is still a $25,000 reward, and if you have information, you can contact the New Jersey FBI office. Someone has to know something. A man is mysteriously shot dead in a parking lot, and police are wondering, is the person driving this car his killer? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Matt Flores. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this story, Matt Flores is 28 years old. He had been a military officer for some time. And then soon after that, he would marry Denise. And then they had a baby girl named Danielle. They were a very happy family. There did not appear to be any issues. Matt was as happy as could possibly be, especially being a new father. He also had gotten a new engineering job, a job that he loved to do. And that was at a place called Applied Materials Incorporated in Silicon Valley, California. All of the images I'm about to show are all recreations from Unsolved Mysteries. On March 24th, 1994, he had only been at this job for nine days. Matt Flores parks his vehicle right here, and then a couple of cars down, there is a woman in her car, uh, I guess, getting ready before work. All of a sudden, she hears a loud pop, and then silence. She gets out and she notices a man basically slumped to the ground with his head resting on the driver's seat of his car. As she gets closer, there's blood everywhere. This man had been shot dead. Police arrived within minutes and the man was identified as Matt Flores. He died from a single gunshot wound to his head. Nobody saw his killer. Not one person. There were, I think, 20 people that they found out were actually in this giant parking lot at the time of the shooting but not one of them saw or heard anything relevant. They heard the, the gunshot, but didn't see like a car or anything. So police go to CCTV footage. This is again recreations. 20 minutes before the shooting, police see a Ford Explorer enter the parking lot and park. Matt's vehicle is then seen coming into the parking lot and driving past that car. Once Matt's car goes by, the Explorer packs up and then follows him. Then, that Ford Explorer is seen leaving the parking lot. Then, it comes back in. Then, they see Matt's car and the other woman's car who found him. They see both of them coming back into the parking lot. Within a minute of him parking, Matt Flores is shot dead. And then 20 seconds later, the Ford Explorer is seen leaving and it never comes back in the parking lot. Police believe that that is his killer. 
But the question is, who and why? They investigated him thoroughly. He had no enemies. Nobody disliked him. They couldn't find any reason for someone to have done this. And this was like an execution style hit job. Police would eventually come up with the idea that this was likely a mistaken identity case. The killer followed the car thinking it was their target, but in the end it wasn't. I know they've looked into the wife, obviously, but there seems to have been no leads from that. You know, like, did she have him killed? But as far as I've seen in, in various articles, there is absolutely no proof or anything like that to back up that kind of theory. Police also have speculated maybe this was a road rage incident. Maybe Matt pissed off someone on the road, that person followed him in and waited for the opportune moment and just shot and killed him. I mean, that makes the most sense if he was being targeted, because there's no other reason for that, for him to be targeted. They've looked into, is it related to his military career? Is it related to his job? Police discovered that in 1993, a man disappeared, a Sergeant Nicholas Ganji. Ganji? Well, he had served under Matt in the military, but he somehow disappeared in 1993. But then he was soon found dead in what they would describe as mysterious circumstances. And then not too soon after that, in 1994, Matt Flores is shot dead. Is there a connection? They don't know. It's just really guesswork. And to this day, nobody knows why someone pulled into a parking lot where Matt Flores worked and shot him in the head once and then left. This was, it looked like a hit job. It looked like a professional, like, execution style thing. But who on earth would do that to him? Was this mistaken identity? That is a very strong possibility. It has happened plenty of times before. I also think this could have been a road rage thing, like the police said. That makes the most sense to me. But they just, they need something. They need help. They need information. Somebody somewhere out there knows the truth. And perhaps that someone is you. If you have information, please call 408 241 9495. Matt Flores cannot be forgotten. His murderer cannot continue to get away with it. His family and his daughter, who is now an adult, they all deserve justice. She was helped by a so called Good Samaritan in this pickup truck, but then she would be found in a shallow grave. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Melissa Gosel. Viewer discretion is advised. Melissa Gosel was born on March 31st, 1972, and she was from the Boston, Massachusetts area. At the time of the story, Melissa was 27 years old. She was a teacher. She was a rape crisis counselor, and she was an aspiring journalist. And on her free time, she loved to ride her bike. And riding her bike is exactly what she was doing on July 11th, 1999. She loaded up her bike into her car, and then she drove to the Cape Cod Canal, where she would ride her bike for some time. When she was done and she was about ready to leave, her car would not start. As luck would have it, a good Samaritan noticed that her car wasn't starting and offered to assist her. This man here, Michael Gentile, who apparently was delivering newspapers, he noticed Melissa was in her situation and he allowed her to use his cell phone. She called AAA. AAA, they never showed up. He apparently offered to try help to fix her car, but he couldn't do it. Then he offered to take her wherever she needed to go in his green pickup truck. She actually even bought him gas for his vehicle with her credit card. Then Melissa, using his cell phone, would call her mom. Melissa had made a joke to her mom on the phone that said, I hope I'm not with a serial killer. The last time anyone heard from her from her family was at 8.22 p.m. that night. This man she was with was going to drop her off at, I guess, this hotel where she would meet her stepdad and her mom. She never got there. That same night, Michael Gentile called his newspaper company and said he was not going to be able to deliver. He said his truck broke down. And then Melissa was never seen again. She would be reported missing by her family. And I'm not exactly 100% sure how they linked him, but they discovered that Michael Gentile was the last person to see her. They would use his cell phone data to track his movements. They discovered that the story he told the newspaper company about his truck breaking down was a lie because his cell phone had been pinging in different locations after that. They searched his truck. They searched all around his home and property, including the swampy areas behind his property. They went into the waters looking for her. They searched on foot. They had dogs being used. Eventually, they found her bike. It had just been abandoned. They found twine with her bike. 
which is odd because the same exact twine was in the bed of Michael's truck. Michael also had small amounts of blood and like mud on his clothing. That blood would link back to Melissa. He said the two of them had consensual sex. He even told that to a friend and that it was menstrual blood that was what they found. Well, according to doctor records and all of that personal stuff, they determined that, that could not have been the case. Eight days after she was reported missing, her body was found. Her foot was sticking out of a shallow grave. Two individuals had discovered this grave and the body was found near Pembroke Reservoir. She had clearly been stabbed m numerous times. They were able to identify her because of a piece of jewelry she was wearing, but also because later on dental records. It was Melissa Gosel. Now at that point, they had actually already detained Michael Gentile, just based on the small amounts of evidence they found and with like the cell phone data. Well, when they're looking up the cell phone data, they discovered that his cell phone was pinging in the exact same area where the body was found, despite him saying his truck had broken down, but his cell phone was in that location after he said his truck broke down. Then the blood they found on his clothing, the twine that was found in his truck and with her bike was also found with her body. They, you know, forensically analyzed the twine and determined that it was the same twine. So at that point, he was arrested and charged with the murder. Police were able to gather that he had basically kidnapped her after he offered to help her. He brought her to a secluded location where he tied her to a tree, sexually assaulted her, and then he stabbed her, first by slitting her throat and then stabbing her numerous times. He then would find a location to bury her body. He did not do a very good job because her foot was sticking out of the grave. And the amount of forensic evidence they were able to link from him to her, it was just, it was plenty. So he went on trial and he was found guilty of the murder and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. This was just a chance encounter. She was in the wrong place at the wrong time and his motive was sexual in nature. Also, he had a very long list of a criminal history and convictions. And then later the family would help develop Melissa's law it was essentially like a three-strike provisional type law, meaning that repeat violent offenders could not get parole. But that's what happened with Michael. He was a violent offender who was given parole. Had that never happened, Melissa would still be alive. Melissa's family would also end up filing a lawsuit against AAA because AAA never showed up to her car. They had plenty of time to show up before she left with Michael Gentile. There was one report I read that the driver in the area said he was just too busy, which I mean, it could be true. I do know that they settled out of court and so that amount is private, but AAA had a good point. I mean, because it was essentially a wrongful death suit, but Michael Gentile was her killer and he was convicted of that murder and has been put in a prison cell for the remainder of his natural life until never breathe free air again. And so in the end, Melissa, got the justice she rightfully deserved. He suddenly ran into the woods only to never be seen again. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Michael Dillard. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Michael Allen Dillard was a 15 year old boy living in Calvin, West Virginia with his mom. Everyone described him as being very vibrant and well loved. His friends described him as sweet, funny, caring, but Michael was also battling issues with depression. As a matter of fact, he had recently spent about a year or so in a, uh, a mental health hospital for, for younger people. This was after his family had discovered a suicide note, and so they, they brought him to get help. But by all accounts, Michael did seem to be making a lot of progress. Pictured here is Michael's sister, Brittany. The two of them were really close. She was living on her own at this point and she was living not too far from, you know, where he was living with his mom. Michael and his mom went to go visit Brittany on January 12th, 2018. She said he did seem a little down that day, a little different, which was weird because I guess a couple of days prior, he was like super jovial, he was happy. He told his sister that he was just having just the best day of his life. But unfortunately with, you know, things like depression, that kind of flip happens a lot. After he and his mom were done at his sister's house, they went back to their home. And at about 4.30 p.m., they arrived back home and he helped his mom unload some things from the car to the house. And then suddenly, without any warning, 
Michael just runs into the wooded area behind his house. This is not the actual photo of that. I mean, like he, I guess he just like bolted into him and then he's never been seen since. Michael's mom called his dad and his sister to come help look for him. They couldn't find him anywhere, so they called police by about 5 p.m. There was a ton of snow that day, but it made searching difficult, but they still searched. It was 22 degrees below zero. He was wearing this big, I guess, orange jacket, but that jacket wasn't found until about a week and a half later by his dog. And it was roughly 300 yards from the house. He didn't have his cell phone on him. His cell phone, when they investigated it, showed no signs of him planning to run away or any kind of suicide notes. There was no notes left at all. The jacket was the only piece of evidence ever found. Police also can't find any signs of foul play. There were rumors that maybe Michael got into a car, he hitchhiked and went somewhere. Even after the snow melted, they still could not find his body because there's always that you know potential of hypothermia. It was very cold. He didn't have his jacket on him. He could have burrowed somewhere for warmth, and that may be why it's hard to find him, but even after the snow melted, nothing. There is currently a $3,000 reward for information that helps lead to finding him. He may look something like this now. If you have information, call 304-872-0800. Oh, where are you going? Why don't you have shoes on? I'm gonna be sick. Oh, it's spinning around. Oh my god, your feet are scraping the ground. Uh, this is another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here behind me is the Fireball. This was at the Ohio State Fair. The ride I showed at the beginning was at a different location. Legitimately though, watching that footage of them spinning around, it just, ugh, I cannot do rides like that. So basically you are put into one of these little sections on this claw thing and they swing you to and fro. It looks like the claw from the claw machine, like, you know, the claw. And you're like upside down, you're going side to side. It spins, it's a wild experience that I never want to have. On July 26, 2017, the fireball at the Ohio State Fair was in full swing. Well, one of the arms attached to the full spinner thing, it literally snapped and it fell off. It basically, from that point, the riders who were in that portion were thrown Somewhere's about, they were about 20 to 30 feet up off the ground and they were launched several feet forward and they would all land on the concrete below. And then the arm came crashing down here on the concrete. Seven people were very seriously injured, immediately rushed to the hospital. Some of them had spent time in the ICU. Some of them had, go in, had to go into emergency surgery. But an eighth individual, an 18 year old, would be pronounced dead at the scene. The incident occurred because of severe corrosion to the arm, and it was clearly not really inspected that well. From what I can see, there was a lawsuit filed by the survivors and also the family of the individual who died, and they reached a settlement somewhere around like one and a half million dollars or so. But unfortunately, no amount of money can replace their lost loved one. Some variations of the fireball, including this one, would be labeled defunct and have been banned in multiple states due to multiple incidents. He was last seen here, but then never seen again. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Myron Trailer. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Myron Tamel Trailer was just 13 years old and living in Phoenix, Arizona. On July 27th, 1988, he and his mom were actually walking to his grandma's house. And that's when they came across this little store here called the OK Fish and Chips. Myron decided he wanted to stop in there and purchase a quick snack. And so his mom said that she would just go ahead to the grandma's house. Myron was last seen outside of this stand at approximately 6 p.m. on July 27th, 1988. But after that, Nobody has ever seen him again. Myron had just finished sixth grade here at the Sierra Vista Elementary School. 
Myron just loved to draw. He loved art and he loved to read. Myron never got involved with any of like the bad kids at school. You know, he never experimented with like alcohol or drugs, even yet 13, that does happen sometimes. He was just always a really, really good kid who never got into any kind of trouble. He would actually be a regular at the church nearby and he would go to all the services he could. He went to Sunday school. He was a member of the choir. He was a part of the youth group there. He was also not anyone to ever just like pick up and go somewhere without telling his mom. And he was never late to anything. And so what happened to him here at this store? That's still a question to this day. I guess Myron was carrying a full bag of like dirty laundry. He plans to do laundry, you know, over at his grandma's house. But to my knowledge, that laundry has also never been found. There has been no trace of him ever found. And it doesn't sound like there's really many witnesses who can say they saw him leave or if he left with someone. Police did have a suspect, this man here, who was at the time the boyfriend to Myron's mom. His name is Geddes Leroy Mintz. He was apparently one of the four witnesses who saw Myron at the fish and chips store. And then shortly after the disappearance, his arm was in a sling. Something had happened to his arm. He got hurt. Mintz was heavily involved in the drug world. Some speculate that he and Myron saw each other at the fish and chips place and that Myron may have said something about his involvement in drugs. You know, like a kid saying like, oh, you shouldn't do that. And maybe that just pissed him off. And so he did something to him. Fast forward to 2009, uh, he is arrested and charged with second degree murder because he stabbed and killed his girlfriend. He got 42 years in prison for that. He has refused to talk about Myron's case with police. In 1991, police got a tip to search a property that his remains might be there, but they were not. If alive still, Myron would look like this. If you have information, please call 602-495-5394. Hello, true crimeers. This is the missing persons case of Nancy Brannon. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Nancy Brannon was 34 years old. She had never been married and she never had any children. She was always just described as the really cool aunt, the aunt that all of the nieces and nephews loved to go visit and hang out with. Nancy was kind of like the life of the family at times, and she just made everyone happy. There were rumors, I guess, that Nancy had started to date a coworker who was married. According to an interview on NBC with her family members, there is this rumor from them that Nancy may have possibly been pregnant with this man's baby. Not confirmed whatsoever. It's just kind of a theory. Nancy had gone out on the night of November 24th, 1986. She would go out all the time with friends to have a drink or a bite to eat. That's exactly what she was doing that night. She was last seen by her friends at 11 p.m. leaving, I guess, the restaurant they were at. They were at this bar and restaurant here, which name has changed over the years. And as far as anyone there knew, Nancy got into her car and drove home. Nancy worked at a hospital and she didn't show up to work the following day, which was very much unlike her. By that time, her family had essentially realized that they couldn't locate her and so she was reported missing. Nancy's car, which looked pretty much just like this, was found, I think, the following day. And it was parked in her apartment complex, which is here. And this is in St. Louis, Missouri, by the way. In her car were all of her belongings. And then roughly 10 to 12 feet or so away from her car, her purse was found. It looked like it had been thrown. Her purse, though, had everything in it as well. All of her money. Nothing was taken. There was no sign of a robbery. Inside her apartment, it was clean. Nothing appeared out of sorts. Her bed was made. Didn't look like it had been slept in the night before. No signs of a struggle. No forced entry in her apartment or in her car. But Nancy was just gone all of a sudden. And ever since, there has been no sign of her, no trace of her, nothing has ever been found. I don't even see that there's been, like, possible sightings of her. The speculation kind of goes back to the fact that she was dating a married man, and there was a theory that she was maybe pregnant. And that is a motive to make someone disappear. At least, you know, in the experience of telling true crime stories. However, I don't know who that man is. And it doesn't sound like police have ever actually considered that man an actual suspect, only because there's no evidence. There's no evidence of anything connecting it to anyone. She was just there and then she was gone with no signs or physical evidence or anything. They're relying on the public's help. 
If you have any information about the disappearance of Nancy Brannon, please call 314-647-5656. Help bring Nancy home. Whatever happened to those fictional true crime shows and movies, like actual whodunits that don't have these like vague conclusions, what, what happened to them? I feel like every season of True Detective now ends with this just vague like, oh, that's what it was, okay. No one's getting arrested, no one's charged, it's not some crazy serial killer, okay. A big example is that show that was on this year, Murder at the End of the World, where it was like being built up as like this murder mystery, right? But then it just has this like, blech, conclusion where like nobody actually gets in trouble and, oh, spoiler alert. <laughs> And there's always like these, it's always like, oh, this person found out about a pregnancy and so they had to kill one person, but then the other person found out and they had to kill that person. Or it's like, ah, oh, it's just, um, they're being murdered because of a business deal or, or politics or something. Whatever happened to movies and shows where there was just a guy or a lady going around murdering people and you as the audience had to just figure out who you thought it was, and then in the end it was actually a person going around killing people for no really amazing reason, just because they're a crazy person. You know what show I always go back to? A show that I absolutely loved, and maybe people will laugh at me for saying this, but a genuine whodunit murder mystery where people die every single episode and then you're like, oh my God, I think it's this person. No, it can't be that person. They just died. Oh, maybe it's this person, it's this person. And you're like, who could it be? It was the show Harper's Island. It was on CBS. It only lasted one season. It was a, I think a 13 episode show where it was people on an island. For, they were there for a wedding. And then people started getting whacked. They started getting killed in brutal ways. And then in the end, there's like four cast members left. They like killed like literally 25, 30 people in the show. And it was like a main character that was the killer. And they were murdering because they were cuckoo, cachoo, wackadoo. There was like a little obsession, of course, but mixed into the motive. But like, do you know what I'm talking about? Like where shows and movies nowadays that are like true crime inspired, they always have like the same reasons behind the murders and it's always like no one's ever like gets in trouble for it. Do you, am I making it, do you know what I'm even saying right now? <laughs> like just give us a freaking murder mystery, a genuine murder mystery. And at the end, the main bad person is caught and arrested or they're killed in a showdown with the hero of the show. Like none of this whole like, oh, I'm running for political office and I've had to, you know, off a couple of people or uh, such and such got someone pregnant and oh, we, we can't have the public knowing about that. It's like the same boring motives just regurgitated. Can we just go back to murdering people on TV and movies and getting a solid conclusion in the end? Hell, oh, God. Ugh. Oh, I think I'm gonna be sick. A guy would brag in prison that he killed someone that was on Unsolved Mysteries. Oh, go away. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Nancy Manny. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Nancy Manny was 33 years old, and she was actually one of the only females at the time that was a part of the Seafarers Union. This would take her basically all over the world. She was also attending this school, the Harry Lunderberg School of Seamanship, where again, she was one of the few females. But this was something she absolutely loved doing. She said, you know what, I can roll up my sleeves and be just like one of the guys. On August 30th, 1993, a body was found floating in the Chesapeake Bay near Maryland. It was the body of a female, and she appeared to have died by drowning. Eventually, the coroner would determine that she, in fact, did die from a drowning. But sadly, the body was identified as 33-year-old Nancy Manny. They could not determine if this was like an accidental death or maybe she was killed by someone or she did it to herself. But police did seem to kind of be leaning more towards the murder aspect. They found nothing in Nancy's life to indicate that she was depressed or had even considered taking her own life. She knew how to swim. Uh, I mean, this she worked on boats and it just didn't make sense for her to die. Of, I mean, it's possible, obviously, to die of a drowning still if you know how to swim, but it just didn't seem right. Police would actually first question an, an ex-boyfriend of Nancy's, Billy Mesmer. He was interviewed in Unsolved Mysteries, by the way. The dude doesn't, he doesn't seem like a real person. <laughs> but anyway, Billy had written her a lot of poetry. Poetry. 
One of them they found was called Night Stalker. One of the passages even says, no one will ever hear your screams as the predator begins to bite. Sign, sweet dreams, Billy. So he seems suspicious, obviously. Police would really dig into him. I mean, they really kind of, it felt like they wanted this to be him, that, that he did this. He was this obsessive ex-boyfriend. He even admits that he was obsessive. He told police, look, you're looking at the wrong guy. You should be looking at the people in the Seafarers Union. You know, she's had some issues with them. Which is true, she actually wrote a letter to a friend once, basically stating that she was getting death threats from the men who were there. Nancy apparently had been dating someone in the Seafarers Union, and so he too became a suspect. I guess he told Nancy one time, I'm going to make your life really difficult here if you don't do what I tell you to do. There were rumors that this boyfriend may have been involved in illegal substance trafficking, and maybe Nancy threatened to reveal that. And I guess she served on the SS Mayaquez with this particular individual, and so police would question everyone on there. They questioned everyone they could at the school. And while they had suspects, like her ex-boyfriend and whoever this boyfriend was there, they had no proof or evidence to suggest that any of them had actually murdered her. And they also really couldn't establish an actual motive. Both men would claim to have alibis, which, for what I understand, did check out. And so Nancy Manny's death, who they believe was murdered, it just, that case just seems to go cold. Her story then airs on Unsolved Mysteries in February of 1996, and that is when a breakthrough comes in. Well, about a year or so after it airs. A man in a Polk County, Florida jail apparently confessed to another inmate that he killed a girl seen on Unsolved Mysteries. He was bragging about it. He was proud of it. That man was holy shit. I get Uncanny Valley vibes from this dude, and this is gross. Close your mouth, please. Ugh. Well, that was this guy, John David O'Mara. He had no connections to Nancy whatsoever. He did not go to the school. He was not a part of the Seafarers Union. Police go to question him in the jail, and he says, yeah, I was with her that night. Uh, we, I met her at a bar, and then she accidentally drowned. That was it. But he told the prisoner in the, in the prison that he tried to have sex with her. She said, hell no. And then he basically threw her in the water and let her drown. Or he drowned her in the water. And then apparently he also ran over her with the boat a couple of times. Which I guess there was evidence to suggest that actually happened. And police, I guess, were able to corroborate this and confirm that he was her killer. And without a fight, he pleads guilty to second degree murder. And he was sentenced to a whopping... 15 years. He served his time, he was released, and then in March of 2019, at the age of 55, the son of a bitch died. It may not have been the best justice of all because her killer eventually was free for quite some time, but I guess in some way, shape, or form, Nancy Manny did get some form of justice. Family of four is shot dead, but was one of those murders justified? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Nugabauer family murders. Viewer discretion is advised. The Nugabauer family consisted of the father, Ronald, the mother, Maureen, and their three children, Michelle, Ryan, and Michael. The family lived here in this home in Minokin, which is in North Dakota. Ronald was a farmer, and he was also the president of the elementary school board. Maureen worked at the University of Mary in Bismarck. On the afternoon of January 27th, 1992, 15-year-old Michael Neugebauer would go to his school and he would meet his girlfriend, Jackie Heeb. He asked her, do you want to run away with me right now? She said yes. And so the two of them got into a vehicle and they started to drive away from North Dakota. The first night they were in a hotel and Michael would confess something to Jackie that sounds like it came straight from a nightmare. His entire family was dead. All of them shot and killed. Who did it? He did. He says to her, I remember shooting my father, but the other three, I don't recall doing that. And so what Jackie didn't know until right now was that she was actually on the run with Michael. The bodies were discovered fairly quickly and police immediately began a manhunt for 15 year old Michael Neugebauer. And they pretty much knew he was the likely culprit in this. Ronald Neugebauer had been shot three times. His daughter, Michelle, was shot in the back and was laying over Ronald's body. The youngest boy, Ryan, was shot in the corner of his bedroom as it appeared he was cowering, trying to hide. And then it appeared that Maureen had been shot twice in the back as she was trying to run away. 
There was plenty of evidence to show that a gun had been fired multiple times, broken windows, and this was just this was just a horrific crime scene. They said that this at the time was one of the worst murder cases they've ever had in North Dakota. Michael and Jackie were on the run for about 12 days when they were finally found in Florida. Information would come out not only from Michael but also from Jackie and other family members about what was going on in the Neugebauer house. Michael was subjected to a lot of abuse in the house. His father physically abused him just all the time, leaving bruises, and he also emotionally, you know, abused him every day. Jackie basically tried to get Michael to go to a domestic abuse shelter, and he did. But then the abuse shelter called Michael's dad, and according to Jackie, that just made the situation ten times worse. Ronald actually confronted Jackie and said, like, stay out of our business or else. He then ran over her dog and made Michael clean up the body. And the abuse wasn't just coming from his dad. Unbelievably, and this is not something I've heard a lot of uh, while doing these types of videos, but his sister was also abusing him. Sexually abusing him. Confirmed by Jackie, confirmed by another family member as well. Jackie had tried to tell, you know, people what was happening in this house. Because the youngest son was also getting physical abuse from the father. But every time they reported abuse or anything like that, it just fell on deaf ears and nobody helped Michael. Nobody intervened. So on that January 27th, 1992 morning, Michael says that he and his father got into an argument. Michael knew what was about to happen, more physical abuse. He had a gun on his person because he decided to carry a gun, he said, for his protection. And that's when he pulled out the gun and he shot his father three times. And then at that point, Michael, pictured here after his arrest, uh, he says he does not remember the rest of the murders. He doesn't remember shooting his mom, his sister, or his brother. He actually at one point tried to say that his dad killed all of them, and that he just killed his dad. There were, you know, psychiatrists assigned to Michael during, you know, after the murders, and they, it was obvious that there was some mental something happening with him. They were, like, considering, like, is he, does he have PTSD? Does he not? They really couldn't determine for sure. Now, the prosecutor at the time was like, I don't believe Michael. I don't believe there was any abuse in this house. But there was. All the, There was. Many years later, I guess a new prosecutor of the DA's office would say that, they no longer refute the claims of physical abuse by his dad, and they don't refute the claims of sexual abuse by his sister. So it sounds like now they're like, okay, that probably happened. But he also killed his mom and his little brother. You know, a psychiatrist would say that sometimes when these things happen, it's not just like this cookie cutter response that we would have. That once you pulled the trigger and shot his dad, there is that chance of going into this like blind psychosis where you just have no idea what's happening anymore. And then he just kept, you know, pulling the trigger. And so this comes down to being a really complicated case. Many people would say his dad deserved it. Some would say his sister deserved something. But his mom and his little brother who was also being abused that's where this becomes a much bigger issue. And so it became very difficult to balance this and decide like, well, what, what do we do here? Because this was cold-blooded murder all the same. He had a gun on him days before, which shows premeditation. And so if he premeditated killing his mom and his little brother as well, then this is just a cold-blooded quadruple homicide. So what essentially happens at that point is Michael Neugebauer pleads guilty to the murder of his dad. Then he takes an Alfred plea on the murders of his mom, his sister, and his brother. Michael Neugebauer is sentenced to life in prison where he could ask for parole after 25 years. As the years go by, he gets older and he tries to appeal his case, but he's always denied. He primarily wanted to appeal to get a lesser sentence. And a lot of that stemmed from the fact that this, all of this stemmed from the physical and sexual abuse going on in that house. And one could argue that that put him into the psychological, you know, haze where he ended up just kind of shooting and killing everyone. He should definitely be punished for doing that. But like if it was just his dad and that was it, 
you you could reasonably look at this in a different you know from a different viewpoint maybe even like the dad and the sister right you can be like okay there's some kind of justifiable you know self-defense in a in a gypsy rose kind of way right but the mom and the brother that's at any rate he has always been denied uh, a lesser sentence every time he tries and i have to kind of agree like i think that's for the best which is also really tragic to say because there's no doubt there was some horror happening in that house the dad with abuse killing a dog threatening his girlfriend his sister sexually abusing him like i don't i can't under, i don't know what that's like i can't imagine what that does to the a person's psyche but to this day michael nugebauer is still in prison in north dakota he has not been paroled but what do you guys think? Do you think he deserves to be paroled and to be released? Or do you feel like this was more premeditated and that this was cold-blooded murder across the board and that he should spend the rest of his life in prison? Me? I am 100% unsure. I just, I feel really bad, especially for the mom and the little brother. I just, I don't know. Hello, True Crimeers. This is the strange unsolved mysteries case of Norman Ladner. Viewer discretion is advised. This story happened near Picayune, Mississippi. On August 21st, 1989, 17-year-old high school senior Norman Ladner was out on his family farm that day. He had just left the family store that they operated, and he was planning to go do some hiking and hunting. He was expected home about 7 p.m. that day, but he never showed up. So his father, along with a friend, go out searching for the boy. They go out and they comb the entire farm property that they own, and sadly, they discover Norman. This is a recreation from Unsolved Mysteries, so this is not the actual scene. Norman was on his back and he was ice cold. And there was a gunshot wound to his head. His gun had been next to him and it was broken apart. When police arrived, they thought that this was some kind of accident, that Norman was probably in a tree. He fell and the gun went off and it shot him. They even told the parents, we're 90% sure this was an accident. And yet, Norman's mother was told by the coroner a couple of days later that this was not an accident. This was a suicide. Norman did it to himself on purpose. Even though they had absolutely no proof of that whatsoever. Both of his parents said he was a really happy kid. He showed no signs of anything like that. The bullet had entered his right temple and exited through his left temple. And they said it was close range, but his gun was too long for that, for him to do it to himself. Police did not bother looking for the bullet. They did not collect the gun. They didn't test the gun for fingerprints. They didn't test him for gunshot residue. They didn't do anything. He also had a large scrape against his forehead. The coroner said that came from this jagged root that he must have landed on. Problem is, Norman was face up when he was found, not face down. And so how did that happen? His family starts to investigate this because police refused to. They say it's a closed case, it's suicide, it's done, leave it alone. So they literally start digging up the dirt. They dig through their own son's blood and brain matter in the dirt, and they sift through it because they want to find the bullet. And they do find it. The bullet was not one that could fit in his gun. The bullet had blood and hair on it. Police said, nah, that's not the bullet that killed him. They gave it to police in the coroner anyway. The coroner then returns the bullet, but for some reason, it's a different bullet they returned. Again, police tell his parents, just, it's a suicide, it's done. So his father searches the woods again, because police won't. He finds, and police confirm that this existed, there was this weird homemade radio that was hanging by a string from a tree within sight of where Norman's body was found. Police said, okay, I mean, yeah, sure, it's there, but it has nothing to do with this. How would they know? They didn't investigate it. How would they know? So Norman's father goes to an expert himself. I guess Norman's father had some connections to a DEA agent, and when he showed the agent this radio, the DEA guy said, oh yeah, I know what that is. It's a makeshift radio that drug dealers use. It sends a low-range signal to aircraft, and that way the drug plane knew where to drop the, the stuff. This radio was three to four hundred feet away from where Norman was found, but police say, Whatever, that's not, it has nothing to do with it. It's completely unrelated. So the family and many people believe that Norman stumbled across a deal, something involved with these drug people. He saw something he was not supposed to see. 
and there's a good chance he may have recognized one of the people. This is a small community. It may have been someone he knew. So they had to silence him. So they killed him. To give more proof of this, Norman's mom recounts a time when she was trying to get information from the coroner. A stranger approached her at the coroner's office. The stranger told her, leave this alone. He told her, don't have police investigate this. Because if you do, your other kids are in danger. You are in danger. He told her, you're never going to find out who killed your son. To me, this is... This is... <sighs> The police's refusal to investigate this case and their downright just stupidity when it came to voicing their opinions like they said Norman was, he was definitely standing up when he was shot. But the trajectory of the bullet and when the bullet was found said there was no way he was standing up. He was definitely laying down when it happened. He was pinned down. The fact that they said, oh, we're not going to test the gun. We're not going to look for fingerprints. We're not going to check for gunpowder residue. That bullet, no, that can't be the bullet that killed him. His own gun did it. His broken gun that we don't know how it broke. Uh, he fell on a root face first, but somehow he was found dead lying uh, face up. It's clear the police have some, obviously because they always do, have some connection to this drug world. This is, again, a very small town. They'll typically have at least a few people in their pocket. And so when murders like this happen that's related to that, they need to do everything they can to say, go away. To me, it's more than obvious that Norman was killed because he witnessed something he wasn't supposed to see. The refusal to investigate is just more proof of that. The parents doing all of the work with everybody telling them to go away, that's just more proof. Somebody shot and killed Norman, and somebody somewhere out there knows the truth. The problem is, is I don't know who you would go to to tell your information if you have it. You certainly can't go to that police department. Maybe you can contact an FBI office in Mississippi or a neighboring police department or sheriff's office. You know, someone who actually cares about solving this kid's murder and not protecting drug people. So if you have information, please come forward. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Paige Johnson. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this story, Paige Johnson was 17 years old and she was living with her family in Northern Kentucky. Paige was described by her family as just a beautiful and very special person. She was an awesome sister and an incredible friend. She was looking forward to what life would bring her. You know, she was close to turning 18, but unfortunately, she would never get to find out. The last time anyone from her family saw her was on the evening of September 22nd, 2010. She left the house and she asked her mom if she could go to her sister's place in Covington, and her mom said yes. But then her mom and her sister and her two-year-old daughter would never see her again. She never showed up at her sister's place. An acquaintance of hers named Jacob Bumpus had actually picked her up from her mom's house that night. He then says later on at approximately 1 a.m., he had dropped Paige off at 15th and Scotts Street, which was just a couple of blocks away from her sister's apartment in Covington. So that would make him the last person to really see Paige Johnson. But unfortunately, they didn't have any evidence connecting him to her potential disappearance because they don't even know where she is. The community went out with police and they were searching all over for her. Police had obtained warrants to search certain properties, but never came up with anything. And 17-year-old Paige Johnson was just yet another person who seems to have just fallen off the face of the earth. But... We all know that can't happen. There was just a lot of suspicion around him, but nothing anyone could do. And then in March of 2020, police would get a call that a skull was found. I guess this was near State Route 276 and Mathis Road in Claremont County. They had taken the skull, but they also were excavating the site because the entire body wasn't there. I mean, they like dug into the earth to see, just to get anything they could find. But dental records of the skull were able to confirm without a shadow of a doubt that this was the remains of Paige Johnson. Unfortunately, they have not really found her entire body, and so they cannot determine how she died. I know they suspect that this was probably a homicide, but they have absolutely no way of proving it, unfortunately. They started looking into the cell phone records of Jacob Bumpus. His cell phone records would show that he was near Paige's home at about 1 a.m., and then at about 4.13 a.m., his cell phone pinged in the direct area where the body was later found. 
Then it shows him basically going back to his home and his cell phone records never show him going back to that area ever again. So he was arrested and charged with abuse of a corpse and tampering with evidence. He was convicted and sentenced to just four years in prison. They cannot charge him with murder because they do not know how she died. But I know that they are still fighting to find out. This man here would die while burying his murder victim. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Patricia Dent. Viewer discretion is advised. Unfortunately, I do not know much about Patricia. I do know at the time of this case, she is 65 years old and she was actually a twin. Patricia was living in this home here in Trenton, South Carolina with her boyfriend. <laughs> Sorry for the jump scare. This guy here, Joseph McKinnon. Well, in early May 2022, 911 there would get a phone call about a man who looks like he had maybe collapsed in front of his home. And that man was Joseph McKinnon. When authorities arrived, he was found lying on the ground in the yard and he was dead. An autopsy would show that he died of a heart attack. Police were informed that he did live with someone named Patricia Dent, but she was nowhere to be found. They discovered that Patricia had failed to show up for work in the past couple of days, which is very unusual for her. She wasn't responding to anyone's emails or messages or anything. So when police search inside the home again, they do find some traces of blood. And of course now they think, well, the worst, but where is she? Well, they had found Joseph's body kind of next to a nearly filled up pit. So they go to that pit out of curiosity and they start digging it up. And lo and behold, in that pit, they find a body. And the body was wrapped in black trash bags. Later confirmed to be the body of 65-year-old Patricia Dent. She had been strangled to death. And so Joseph McKinnon died of a heart attack next to the pit where her body was found. He had not completed filling in that hole. And so police determined he died in the process of burying his murder victim. She was badly bruised as if she had been beaten. Police had never been called to the residence for any kind of domestic abuse situations. From what I can tell, he was someone who had issues with being faithful to his the women in his life, but no one apparently saw the signs of something like this potentially happening. But they were able to determine that he, without a shadow of a doubt, killed Patricia. And then he died trying to hide what he did. The crazy part is, is if he did not die of a heart attack there, would Patricia have ever been found? I would like to think so, just given how much we've advanced over the years, we would be able to go, well, let's search their backyard first for this woman who lives here, but who knows? It may not have been legal justice, but in some way, Patricia Dent got justice. That son of a bitch died burying her, so. I like to think Patricia had some kind of say in that. I just wish it happened to him before he took her life. A young boy in Ireland would vanish off the face of the earth and the only clue they ever found was his backpack. Hello, true crimeers. This is another global cold case. And this is the case of Philip Kern. Viewer discretion is advised. Philip Kern was part of a large family there in Ireland. And they lived in, and I'm probably going to say this wrong, so I apologize in advance. They lived in an area called Rathfarnham. And at the time of this case, Philip is just 13 years old. It was October 23rd, 1986. Philip would go to school that morning, and then he would come home for lunch, then he would leave his home to go back to school. This was the secondary school he attended. I'm not even gonna to begin to try to pronounce that because I know I'll get it wrong, but he never got back to school that day. 13-year-old Philip left his house at approximately 1.30 p.m. to go back to school. But what happened? Because he didn't show up to school again. Literally, the moments after he leaves his house, he is not spotted by anyone ever again. And when I mean nobody, I mean nobody. There were no witness sightings who either physically saw or heard anything. This 13-year-old kid walked out of his home and just vanished. And so he is reported missing fairly quickly. So the search begins. They are searching through the wooded areas. Police do a thorough search of his home. They are checking any water sources nearby. They have volunteers searching and helping, but he shows up nowhere, no sign of him at all. Now they had searched this particular alleyway already before. 
which makes what happens next very strange. Six days after Philip disappears and after they've searched this alleyway, this little object shows up. It's a backpack. And when police investigate it, it has Philip's name on it. And then it is confirmed to be Philip's. Inside the book bag was essentially everything. His pens, his pencils, his notebooks. There were a couple of like lesson books missing. And apparently police were able to get some kind of DNA off of this book bag, but have never been able to match that DNA to anyone. They also need to know who put it there and why six days later, because it was not there, literally even the day before it was found, it wasn't there. So it was placed there deliberately by someone. Philip's parents have gone on the news a few times, but they've remained relatively private during all of this. By the way, they were cleared of any kind of wrongdoing involved in this. But they've come out and said that unfortunately, like the news media sometimes gives a lot of misinformation about this case. But the issue is, is there's just, there is nothing to go on. There's no witnesses. There's no real evidence. He's just gone. So many different theories have floated around. Accidental death or he was abducted and killed. The, this guy, Eamon Cook, was a suspect at one point. He was a convicted pedophile. The DNA from the book bag, though, did not match him. But the authorities are still stumped. What happened to Philip? Could she have pulled the trigger herself? That's the biggest question that remains in this still unsolved mystery. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Ray Ann Mosser. Viewer discretion is advised. It was February 4th, 1986 in Salem, Virginia. 21-year-old Ray Ann Mosser had arrived to the home of her ex-boyfriend. She went there because she wanted to see if they could reconcile their relationship. But there, he told her, no. According to what the boyfriend says, Ray Ann then threatened to end her own life right then and there. She had allegedly attempted previous times to end her life in an event that was witnessed by, you know, people. This is a recreation from Unsolved Mysteries. Calm down, TikTok. At 7.57 p.m. that February 4th evening, police would arrive at the boyfriend's home. Ray Ann had been shot and killed and she was lying next to her boyfriend's car. The actual weapon she used was lying on the trunk of the car next to her body. And yes, this is a very long shotgun. And according to the boyfriend, she did it to herself. She took a shotgun, she put it to her chest and pulled the trigger. The coroner didn't even do an autopsy. Just ruled this a suicide and, and called it a day. But Ray Ann's mom and her dad felt this was definitely a murder. The first thing that came to their mind was the gun was just far too long for her to have put it to her chest and then pulled the trigger herself. This is her actual parents recreating it with a broom. They measured the length of the, the gun and the, where the trigger would be, and then they had the length of Ray Ann's arm. They determined it was physically impossible for her to reach the trigger. The police were like, no, she did it to herself. It's done. It's over. The parents get her body exhumed. They have a new forensic examiner look at her body. The initial incident reports the coroner, who again didn't do an autopsy, but did look at the body, they determined that there was a contact muzzle wound on her chest. To them, that indicated that it was pressed directly against her skin. And there were powder burns on her left wrist. Well, Dr. John Butts here, sorry about your name, buddy. He came to the conclusion that the coroner was wrong. The, the muzzle was actually several feet from her chest. And then the powder burns on her left hand were from her grabbing the gun. And so the medical examiner changed the cause of death from suicide to pending. But then police never continued to investigate this at all. The parents then hired another forensic expert and he did tests with the actual gun. You can see here how long this is. And this woman was about the same size as Rayanne, same arm length. She couldn't reach the trigger and keep the gun straight to her chest. They noticed this. Again, TikTok, this is a recreation. This isn't real, educational purposes only. But you can see that her body had to naturally twist in order to reach for the trigger. And so if she managed to fire, it would have grazed past her. It's impossible. She could not have done it. They hired another expert. God, I took a really unfortunate screenshot on this one. He wanted to test this theory that people had that maybe she accidentally shot herself in the chest. Maybe she dropped the gun. And so he cocked the gun and he started to bang it against the ground, trying to get it to fire. He threw it. He knocked it, you know, on the ground. Nothing. Didn't, didn't go off or anything. And so finally, in 1988, after all of these experts had ruled on this, the coroner changed the cause of death now from, from, you know, pending to undetermined, but still not homicide. 
The police did not look into the boyfriend or his story. They didn't investigate anything. Her parents were the ones to notice that Rayanne's car was parked across the street. The key was still in the ignition. The music was on and blaring. It appeared she kind of hurried out of the car. And then she was found next to her boyfriend's car. And how on earth did the shotgun manage to fall this way on the trunk if she's lying in this position right here with her head down here? The gun should have fallen next to her. All the signs were there that this was not something she did to herself. But sadly, Rayanne's case has just gone just away. No one's investigating it. No one's looking into it. No one's been charged. No one's been questioned. There's no suspects. There's no persons of interest named. Sadly, her mom passed away in 2015, never knowing what happened to her daughter. But her dad and her siblings continue to fight for justice for her. Personally, I'm inclined to think that this was a murder. That somebody shot her. That's what the experts say happened. Most of these experts say that someone else had to have pulled that trigger. She could not have done it herself. She could not have gotten that wound to her chest if she was holding it, the gun herself. Could it have happened? And so why is no one bothering to care about this girl? Why does no one want her to get justice? It's, it's insane to me. Is it because it's just too hard and too much work or what? And that, I mean, honestly, that's just kind of how I think it is. I think some of these investigators are just like, ugh, please don't make us work. But maybe someone out there knows the truth and maybe that someone is you. And if you do have information about this case, contact the Salem, Virginia Police Department. Hopefully they're significantly different now. Or perhaps you can contact the FBI there in Virginia. You can always report your information anonymously. Ray Ann deserves justice. If you could help provide that, do it. Was this letter a confession or a cruel joke? Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Robert Dershall. Viewer discretion is advised. 54-year-old Robert Dershall was a family man. He had a lovely wife named Ginny, and they had five children together, who were all adults by the time this case happened. Robert was a salesman. He was a great father, a fantastic husband, an all-around good guy. March 13th, 1977 was a Sunday, like every Sunday in the Dershall home. Robert and his wife, they got up, and they were getting ready to head to church. His wife, Ginny, was in the kitchen having some coffee while Robert was in the bedroom getting ready, when all of a sudden she heard a loud bang noise. Now, she thought that this was the sound of their back door slamming shut. They tended to keep their doors open, you know, in the morning time to let the breeze in, but sometimes the doors would slam shut because of the breeze. So she didn't think much of it at that moment. But then when she walks back to the bedroom a few minutes later, she finds her husband on the ground. Next to him was a shotgun, and he had a large wound in his chest. She calls 911, police arrive, and within minutes, they basically say out loud that this was a suicide. This is a recreation, but police noticed that Robert had one of his shoes off. And so what they surmised was that Robert took the shotgun, he sat on the bed, he propped the gun against his chest and used his big toe to pull the trigger. However, the way he landed, which would have been this direction, seemed a bit strange. Ginny said his shoe was off because Robert had to apply a foot ointment, a medication that he took every single morning. And he was literally in the process of doing that. By the way, this happened in Dunedin, Florida. And the police there, they said there was no forced entry inside the home, which didn't sound unusual anyway, because they even said that, you know, the, Ginny said that their doors were usually open or at the very least, they were unlocked. This was a Sunday morning. I mean, they were out and about already. So a person could easily just have walked in and without forcing themselves in. But Robert's wife and their five kids, they laid him to rest and they basically just had to accept the fact that this was a suicide. They don't know why. He was in a pretty good spirits. It came out of absolutely nowhere. The incident happened on March 13th, 1977. And then exactly 16 years to the day, March 13th, 1993, one of Robert's sons, Guy, he had gone to his mailbox, took out his mail. There was a letter with no return address on it. And inside was a note on one single piece of paper. This is that actual note. It said, I have AIDS, I am dying. I must make my peace with the Lord. I killed your daddy 15 years ago. He found me in his bedroom. I had no choice. Please pray for me. They had no idea who this came from and they didn't recognize the handwriting at all. But from this, the family themselves decided to start investigating this. They were able to get a copy of the investigation in the police file. 
they noticed a whole bunch of very strange things. The police report said that Robert was depressed due to a failed surgery. However, they don't even know where they got that information from because Robert was not upset about a failed surgery. They never so said that to anyone because it wasn't even true. They also noticed that police interviewed people who hadn't even seen or heard from Robert for like two years prior to his death. And then they didn't interview people currently in his life at the time of his death. They interviewed a nurse who called Robert a bed-ridden vegetable, which clearly wasn't even true. Robert would go fishing, he went on walks, he hiked, he was very active. They also don't understand why he would have used the shotgun, because on the nightstand next to the bed was a handgun. Why would he go to this extra length of using his big toe to pull the shotgun trigger when he could have just used the handgun next to the bed? Ginny's wife's sister was on a train one time when the sister was approached by a woman who told her, I know that Robert Dershel was murdered. This person didn't even know anything about Robert or the family. This all happened in a completely different town, a state. She said she had a psychic vision of what occurred and she wrote down what she saw. This psychic never asked for money from the family, never asked for notoriety, never asked for anything. She just came out of nowhere in a completely different you know, state and approached a woman she had never met about this case. This vision basically said that Robert was caught off guard by a stranger in their room. Then there was an, a fight that took place between Robert and this stranger, and then the shotgun went off, and then the stranger ran away. Take it for what it is, but... Then, an investigation from the family determined something big. There was a neighbor in the Dershals neighborhood, a teenager that the family knew. He had been caught many, many times breaking into homes in the area and arrested for it. That neighbor, they later found out, died of AIDS. That teenager was also frequently using the word daddy. From what I understand, they had a handwriting expert try to compare the writing between him and this note but I don't know the results of that. In 2010, a forensic expert, several of them actually, reanalyzed this case and determined that Robert died of a homicide. However, the actual police in Dunedin, Florida say, no, it's a suicide, case closed. Robert's wife died in 2000. His son died in 2019, never knowing the truth about what happened to him. But to me, this sounds like a confession and it lines up with that neighbor kid but the police won't investigate. And so Robert will never get justice. This is the one minute missing persons case of Roy Lane Jr. This case occurred in Clay City, Kentucky. 29 year old Roy Lane Jr. was last seen leaving a gas station there in Clay City, Kentucky on March 16th, 2018. Roy was officially reported missing on March 23rd, 2016. Since then, there have been numerous searches for the man, but they have come up with absolutely nothing. They have gotten a couple of tips over the past couple of years telling them to look in certain places for his body. But every time they search, every time they look and they've dug in the places where they've been told to dig, they've come up empty. They do still continue to search, but it does sound like police believe he is deceased. But the circumstances behind it are completely unknown. There is essentially no information with regards to the circumstances of how he vanished. There is a reward for information that helps lead to finding him. If you have information, please call 606-663-2226. A six car pile up because an airbag would plunge a knife into a driver's neck in one of the craziest deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. On February 20th, 2022 at 524 AM, a car accident occurred. This happened in Rancho Bernardo, which is in San Diego, California. There were six cars that collided with each other and they were all in like this perfect row. Now in one of these cars, which was a 2000 Lexus, there was a man inside and there was blood everywhere. His airbag was just drenched in blood. And so police then found a knife in the car with blood on it. They also found opened containers of protein powder all over the floor. And so what they discovered was that the man driving the car, a 28 year old man, he was using that knife, this one here, to mix protein powder into water. He got distracted and then he veered into a parked car, which caused the airbag to deploy. And then because he had a knife in his hand, the airbag with extreme force thrust the knife directly into his throat. 
The man was rushed to a hospital, but a couple of hours later, he was pronounced dead. And like I said, there were no other serious injuries that occurred. Honestly, it, it sounds like something that you would only ever see in some kind of like insane action movie, you know? But yeah, an airbag launched a knife through a man's throat while he was driving. So please let it be a lesson. Obviously, it's you shouldn't have to say this, but don't hold sharp objects like knives or scissors while you're driving. And keep your eyes on the road as well. I think this story is proof that literally anything can happen. So please, drive safely. Candyman, 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 Candyman. Don't do it. This is a true crime case that has a lot of similarities to the movie Candyman. Oh, shit. Oh, God. No. This is the case of Ruthie Mae McCoy. Viewer discretion is advised. Now, before I start, I want to say that I cannot find a confirmed photo of Ruthie Mae. However, if you look up this story, you will see this woman's image a lot. However, this is a woman named Ruthie Mae McCoy who actually passed away in Augusta, Georgia in 2017. So that image is not this victim. So I just wanted to make that clear. At the time of this story, Ruthie Mae McCoy was living in the west side of Chicago. There's not a lot of info on her. I believe she was about 52 years old or so. And I know she had at least a couple of kids. In her 20s, she started to battle with mental health issues. I know she would sometimes have issues with like paranoia and like various other issues that she was on medication for kind of off and on. And because of that, her kids were essentially raised more by her family. But when Ruthie was off her medication, she could be very like uh, verbally kind of abusive to like strangers, like she would cuss at them. But, it, you know, she was managing for the most part. She would end up moving to the west side here in this apartment building. And sh this was not her preference. She actually wanted to live on the south side. She felt that the west side was a lot more dangerous, but in the end, she essentially had kind of no choice. In 1986, and this is absolutely terrifying, this is a still image from the movie Candyman. As Ruthie was in her apartment alone, she heard a commotion in her bathroom. Two grown adult men had just crawled through her bathroom mirror, the cabinet, and burglarized her. She told the police and the Chicago Housing Authority. Both of them did nothing. And obviously this put her in a lot of fear. And she was trying to save up on her like social security income to, to be able to move somewhere else. Fast forwarding to April 22nd, 1987, Ruthie calls 911 in a panic. She was screaming, it was like at 8.40 p.m. or so at night. The 911 operator can barely understand what she's saying because she's just all over the place screaming. But eventually what they were able to discern was Ruthie was saying, they've come through my medicine cabinet again. Other neighbors called 911 reporting banging and screaming coming from the area of Ruthie's apartment. Ruthie calls 911 again saying, they're coming through my mirror. Then other people call 911 to report gunshots. The police finally show up about 10 minutes after that last call. They knock on her door. Nobody answers. They leave. The following day, a neighbor calls 911 concerned about Ruthie because they haven't seen or heard from her. So police arrive. Again, they knock but get no answer. The front door is locked, so they have to get some tools to basically open the door. When they do, they get inside and they find Ruthie Mae McCoy in a pool of her own blood. She had been shot to death. She had a total of four gunshot wounds to her body. Two young men, 18-year-old Edward Turner and 21-year-old John Hondras, well, they were seen by multiple witnesses roaming the apartment building just hours before this murder. Other witnesses had reported seeing one of these men at least carrying what looked like maybe Ruthie, Ruthie's uh, TV. And so they were actually arrested by police and they were charged with her murder. But from what I understand, the, the charges were later dropped because they had no actual physical evidence pointing to them being responsible for killing her. Despite them finding, there is literally a secret little passageway behind the bathroom mirror. And why was that even a thing? What's more terrifying is that Ruthie may, what, you know, she suffered from paranoia and, but she was having this real issue of someone crawling through her mirror, which sounds like something, you know, someone maybe crazy would say, right? But in this case, it was actually true. Somebody was coming through her mirror, two people, and then they killed her. I mean, that's a nightmare. That's a literal nightmare. 
I believe the family ended up suing the Chicago Housing Authority because of how there was this weird access behind the mirrors, but I don't know the results of that lawsuit. A few years later, the movie Candyman comes out, and it had a lot of very, you know, all the parallels to Ruthie Mae's story. It happened in the, the Chicago, you know, housing projects, and it focuses a lot on, you know, mirrors. By the way, absolutely, this movie terrified the daylights out of me when I was a kid. And now that I know it's connected to a, an actual story, I don't ever want to watch this movie again because I'll have nightmares for the rest of my life. But I hope that in some way, shape, or form, they find a way to get justice for Ruthie Mae McCoy because she deserves it. She lived through an actual nightmare and was killed. She deserves justice. Her body was found 54 years ago, but she was only identified this year. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Sandra Young. Viewer discretion is advised. This is Savvy Island, which is about 10 miles away from Portland, Oregon. On February 23rd, 1970, a Boy Scout had found like a couple articles of like clothing or a blanket or something sticking out of the ground. When he looked closer, he actually saw that there was a body there. Obviously, police were called and they determined that this person, whoever it was, likely met with foul play. There was physical trauma to her remains, and they were essentially were skeletal remains. At the time, the forensic people who were studying the remains determined that these likely came from an African-American female. But outside of that, they had no idea who it was. In 2004, the remains were looked at again, but they didn't get much evidence off of it. Then fast forward to 2018. They would do DNA uh, phenotyping using the Parabon Nano Labs. And they confirmed once again that the DNA pulled from the bones determined that she was African-American. She was likely a teenager. She had brown eyes and black hair. And then they came up with this rendering of her based on the you know DNA phenotyping. But it still didn't generate any hits or leads. In 2023, it would be someone who had uploaded their DNA to one of those genealogical websites. And her DNA had been put into the system kind of already. And then once other family members had put their DNA in, it kind of flagged it as being a potential match. After doing some further digging into it, literally just a couple of days before I made this video ago uh, in February of 2024, it came back with a positive match. The remains were finally identified after 54 years as to belonging to Sandra Young. Way back when, Sandra was living in Portland, Oregon, and she was attending Grant High School. And all I can really see in, in any of these stories is that Sandra disappeared in 1968 or 1969. Apparently nobody knows the exact time frame. And I don't know much else about the circumstances of her disappearance. I've read a bunch of articles and nothing is really talking about that. I do know that her family, some of them have come forward to state that they're very happy that she's finally been found. She's finally been given her identity back and that they are just hoping for justice for her. But how it all came to be and how she disappeared, I'm not sure. But this is now an ongoing, basically murder investigation. I don't know her exact cause of death though. I don't know if they do either. But someone out there might have information about her murder. And if you do, please come forward. You can contact the Portland, Oregon police and you can report your information anonymously. Somebody ran a woman over right here by this wall, and 40 years later, they still don't know who. Hello, true crimeers. This is another Global Cold Cases, and this is the case of Sheila Anderson. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case in 1983, Sheila Anderson is a 27-year-old mother to two young boys, and they were living, I believe, in Edinburgh, which is in Scotland. You'll tell me if I said it right or wrong, I'm sure. Now, Sheila was someone who was trying to make ends meet in order to support her two kids. But unfortunately, this led her down a path to getting involved with like illegal substances. And she herself became addicted to some of those substances. And then kind of through that, she became a sex worker. At 11.45 p.m. on April 7th, 1983, this is, I guess, at the promenade at Gypsy Bray, a man kind of across the way from here notices headlights sort of driving down this road like back and forth and it seemed kind of odd to him. So when he saw the car finally leave, he goes over there. 
he arrives to this area at 11.54 p.m. and he finds a body, one that had been pretty badly mangled. And it was the body of a woman. He calls police and they determine that she was likely run over at least once, possibly even backed over and run over again. They couldn't really tell exactly how many times. But her body was crushed and she was like mangled. They would later determine that that was the body of Sheila Anderson. What's kind of crazy is that literally 30 minutes before her body is found, two police officers actually speak to Sheila Anderson in this area. So she was seen alive and well in the company of nobody else at like 11.25 p.m. And then at 11.54 p.m. she's found brutally murdered. I guess someone saw her getting into a vehicle um, down this road here, but they weren't sure exactly who was driving it. The guy who saw the car kind of backing, driving back and forth, you know, where Sheila was found, he didn't really get a good look at the actual car itself. He really just mainly saw the headlights because it was dark. This is that pathway now where Sheila was found, but police believe that this has to do likely with, you know, her involvement in sex working and illegal substance use. Some people who worked closely with her said that she can sometimes be combative, especially if the client won't pay her. She's actually been known to stand in front of a car, kind of like slamming her hand on the hood because the guy didn't pay her money. And so what if that's the situation that happened here and the guy said, well, screw it, and then ran her over and then backed over her? The truth of the matter is, is nobody really knows. Apparently her underwear was missing and they think whoever ran her over likely took them. Her case has become known as one of Scotland's most notorious unsolved murders. But the person who did this could still be out there, which means they could still be caught and she could still get justice. So if you have information, please reach out to the local authorities. An indigenous woman was found murdered, but her family wouldn't even know that until after her killer was convicted. Hello, true crimeers. This is another missing or murdered indigenous woman case, and it is the case of Shirley Suse. Viewer discretion is advised. It was July 15th, 1980, at an orchard in Kern County, California, near Bakersfield, where the remains of a woman were found. There was no identification on her, so she was classified as a Jane Doe, and this is a more uh, recent rendering of the woman. But this woman had been sexually assaulted, and then she had been stabbed over 20 times. She had 18 stab wounds just to her chest. Unfortunately, her case would go cold very quickly because in 1980, they didn't really have the DNA technology. A couple of days later, another Jane Doe's body is found in a pretty much the same area. They would call her the Ventura County Jane Doe, and the first victim was called the Kern County Jane Doe. This was like the first rendering they did, and then eventually they did this rendering. She too had been sexually assaulted and she too had been stabbed. And then her case goes cold just as quickly. Police did not really connect the two women per se at the time just because there was no physical evidence to suggest that they were killed by the same person. And then finally, all the way in 2008, they exhumed the body of the Kern County Jane Doe and they were actually able to get DNA from her body. This was from a male contributor and when they plugged it into the system, they got a match. It was this man, Wilson Chowist. Now, they knew the first woman, the Kern County Jane Doe, they knew she was likely a native woman or indigenous. And once they had his DNA found on her body, you'd think, okay, we're going to arrest him and charge him with that murder. Nope, they actually didn't do anything. So Wilson Chowist was in and out of California prisons most of his adult life for sexual assaults where he got paroled on numerous occasions. He had been physically abusive to women and just kept getting out of jail. And he was in jail when they got this DNA hit in 2008. But it wouldn't be until 2015 when they took DNA from the other victim, the Ventura County Jane Doe. They found male DNA with her that also matched him. And then they're like, okay, let's charge him with murder. Apparently one of the DAs from in 2008 was like, eh, I don't really want to prosecute Jane Doe cases or John Doe cases. But then in 2015, this new DA was like, well, I don't, I don't, I don't need to know the victims' names. I just need to know that they were people. And so he was arrested and charged with two counts of murder. Actually, sorry, three. The Ventura County Jane Doe was pregnant and the baby did not make it. He denied having anything to do with any of these murders, but the DNA proved he did. 
He went on trial where previous victims of his came forward to testify, like women that he had sexually assaulted or beaten or both said that he is an absolute monster, he is pure evil, that you know they were lucky to get out alive. And then especially with the DNA, the jury was more than convinced. And so they found him guilty of three counts of murder and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. That finally happened in 2018. In 2020, a woman saw a Facebook post with regards to the Kern County Jane Doe. And I think they saw the like the autopsy photo or something, and they recognized her as being someone that was her family. I think it was the victim's niece. She said that that Kern County Jane Doe murder victim, the one that you've convicted someone for killing her, her name is Shirley Suse. Shirley Suse was originally from the Samson Cree Nation, and she pretty much lived most of her life in British Columbia, Canada. Shirley was someone who traveled a lot. She would do like a lot of impromptu trips. And so when she left, you know, British Columbia, and I think this was in like 1979, she said, I'm gonna go travel with some friends to Seattle. The family didn't think much of it, but then after a couple of days, they hadn't heard from her. And eventually they report her missing. Little did they know her body was found in 1980. But obviously, you know, we didn't have the, you know, technology of communicating like we do now, and especially the DNA technology, of course. And so they never knew that was, that body was her. They never even knew that body even existed. And so it sounds like that because, you know, the niece recognized the image, that's when they started to then do the DNA, I guess, familial testing to confirm that, you know, Shirley was, you know, her family. And then that's when they got that confirmed match that that victim was Shirley Suse. And so her remains that which had been buried uh, under a Jane Doe gravestone were given back to the family in Canada. And she was finally able to be laid to rest. Unfortunately, the Ventura County Jane Doe has still remained unnamed. They have started to plug in like her DNA into the genealogical websites, but, and they've gotten like, they've gotten it kind of narrowed down to potentially a certain family, but it's not narrowed down enough. And they say they still have a lot more narrowing down to do before they could probably identify her. And so maybe someone out there recognizes these images, you know, I don't have a photo of her autopsy because I can't show it here, but maybe somebody recognizes her who can identify her finally. She's gotten justice. She just needs to be returned to her family. She deserves that. And if you do recognize this woman or you have information, just contact the Ventura County Sheriff's Department in California. And hopefully, like Shirley Sue say, one day she can be returned home. You can't summon a generation just by singing a song. <clears throat> this is the song that never ends. Yes, it goes on and on, my friends. Some people started singing it, not knowing what it was. And they'll continue singing it forever just because this is the song that never ends. On the afternoon of November 27, 2004, skeletal remains were discovered. After all that time, Stacy had finally been found. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Stacy Colbert. Viewer discretion is advised. Stacy was born on February 3rd, 1975, in Chicago, Illinois. Stacy is pictured here with her mom and her sister Danielle. Her and her sister grew up, and they were really, really close with one another. They were like best friends. Stacy was described as positive, enthusiastic, she was vibrant, and she seemed to have like this infectious personality where when she was there, everyone just seemed to be in like in a better mood. Her sister and her family would describe her as warm and friendly. She was incredibly compassionate, and she just seemed to be one of those people where you just it was a hard time finding any fault with her. Stacy was just a really, really good person. Later, she would attend Ohio State University where she got a bachelor's in business administration and marketing was going to be like her dream job. As a matter of fact, one of the proudest moments of her life was when she got to intern at the 1996 Centennial Olympics. She interned as a marketing assistant for McDonald's and Coca-Cola, and then she got a job as a marketing assistant for American Electric Power. And at that point, she is living and working in Ohio. From what I understand, she had not been dating anyone or anything like that at this time. Fast forward to March 23rd, 1998. The Academy Awards had just happened, and this was the year that Titanic basically swept the award circuit. 
that evening, Danielle tried calling her sister to say, oh my gosh, you know our favorite movie? Because they were like all smitten with Leo, of course. And But when Danielle called Stacy to do all this, Stacy did not answer. She left her a message and hoped that she would call back later. She wouldn't. Within a day, Stacy's employer would end up calling her sister Danielle and say like, hey, Stacy hasn't shown up to work. And everybody knew immediately that that wasn't her, that, that something was wrong. So she was reported missing pretty quickly. They get to her apartment and they notice that the front door, it's partially open. When they get inside, they see that literally everything she had was there. Her car was there, her car keys, her wallet, everything. Her apartment didn't really appear to be in any kind of mess or disarray. She had some clothes thrown on the ground, but the refrigerator door was like not fully closed and there was a box of half-eaten breadsticks on the counter. Next to the breadsticks was a receipt from a pizza place. So the police contact that pizza place because they have the exact timestamp and they want to talk to the delivery driver. The delivery driver was very forthcoming. He remembers dropping off the breadsticks and he said he remembers feeling that Stacy wasn't alone in her apartment, but he couldn't confirm that meaning the pizza guy did not see anyone else with his eyes, you know, other than seeing Stacy. Everybody went into immediate panic mode because obviously something happened to her and this may be something bad, but there's no evidence of anything bad happening. Like there's no blood, ripped out hair. There isn't a sign of a struggle. There was no forced entry. Her car was there in good condition. Nothing was amiss in the car. And then police start talking to neighbors. And this is one of those things that frustrates the hell out of me. A neighbor woke up at about four o'clock in the morning around the time she would have disappeared. And the neighbor heard very loud screaming coming from her apartment. They also heard loud banging and more screaming coming from Stacy's place. The neighbor just went back to bed. Didn't call 911, didn't do anything. If you hear somebody screaming bloody murder, or there's a lot of noise, especially at four o'clock in the morning, let's better be safe than sorry. Because maybe in this case, Stacy just might possibly still be alive, but we'll never know. That neighbor didn't even bother to check on Stacy until two o'clock the following afternoon. He knocked on the door, she didn't answer, that's all they did. Stacy's employer became very involved and helped in the search for Stacy. The community got involved. The police had exhausted every lead they could think of. They interviewed anyone that may have potentially been a person of interest, but got nothing. They've collected and have kept all the evidence they have gotten from her apartment, hopeful that maybe one day, you know, technology advances enough where they can get something from it. And then on November 27th, 2004, Stacy was finally found. Along State Route 257 in Delaware County, about 40 minutes from Stacy's apartment, skeletal remains were discovered. Eventually, they would be identified as belonging to 23-year-old Stacy Colbert. Her remains were nothing but bones. And so, unfortunately, they cannot determine exactly how she died. But this is now a homicide investigation. Not too long ago, a new sergeant, Sergeant Bessinger, took over the case. And he seems to be very hopeful about being able to get DNA from something. He has even said that he thinks he may have an idea of who killed Stacy. However, he does not have the physical evidence to back that up yet. And who that person is, I don't know. And it sounds like her family is really believes in this sergeant. That he really is putting everything he can into this. And he is still working through it. Hopeful to get answers soon. There is a TikTok page dedicated to her case. There's a Facebook page as well. And if you have any information about the murder of Stacy Colbert, please call 740-833-2892. After an argument with her husband, a woman in California would suddenly never be seen again. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Star Hill. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this story, Star Hill, pictured here with her daughter, was a 46-year-old woman, and she lived with her husband in Middletown, California. I had never heard of Middletown before, despite being from California originally, but it's right here, so I guess it's north of uh, San Francisco. So by 2005, Star had been married to her husband, Curtis, for about five years. Curtis was a firefighter. 
by the time this story happened, her kids are adults and Star has a couple of grandkids. And she was a wonderful grandma and a wonderful mom. And she would absolutely never just leave her family, especially her children and her grandkids, without ever saying anything. Curtis and Star had a rocky relationship. There were, from what I understand, domestic issues coming from Curtis to her. So they argued a lot, and there were times where Star would leave the house for, like, weeks on end. But when she was gone, she always remained in contact with the rest of her family, and she brought items with her. And so it makes what happens that much stranger. On May 18th, 2005, according to Curtis, the two of them had gotten into a big argument. Curtis says that Star picked up and just left. He said he saw her walking down their long driveway and then he never saw her again. Star's daughter would report her missing on May 21st after she had not heard from her or seen her. Initially, she left the house, according to Curtis, and she brought nothing with her. He says the following day, he gets back home from work and he sees an angry note written on the counter. And it was from Star and she said she was leaving. She then took her purse and a couple of duffel bags, but oddly, no clothing at all. Now, her cell phone and her bank account had not been touched ever since the day she went missing. But five months after she disappeared, a vineyard employee in Lower Lake, California, discovered her cell phone just sort of tossed into this, like, bushy area. It was given to police, but police who had it forensically tested and analyzed, it gave them absolutely no clues at all. There have been like one or two potential sightings of Star in different places, but those sightings have never been confirmed. Star was a very loving and dedicated mom and grandma. Her grandkids had birthdays that happened around that time and she never showed up or called or anything. She wasn't that kind of grandma. She would always come to their birthdays. Something obviously happened to her. Curtis has only been described as a person of interest, but not officially a suspect as police don't have any actual evidence. They don't have evidence of foul play. First, they need to find Star. If you have information, please call 707-263-2331. This dumb criminal shot himself in the pecker and you'll never guess where he did it. Hello, true crimeers. This is the dumb criminal case of Tarion Pouncey. View viewer discretion is advised. It was October 31st, Halloween, 2017. 19-year-old Tarion Pouncey from the Chicago area, well, he decided he wanted to commit a robbery. So he was armed with a 38 caliber handgun, and he went to a place called Maxwell Street Express at about 6 o'clock in the morning. When he got there, there were two employees inside. He pointed the gun at both of them and demanded basically all of the money. They gave him the money from their till, but also their wallets. During the commotion, the money spilled all over the floor, and so Tyrion continued to point the gun at the two gentlemen while he was, like, picking up the cash. If you couldn't tell by the sign, uh, this is a hot dog and, like, sausage place. And so Tyrion was running out of this hot dog place, and as he was putting his gun into his, uh, his waistband, he basically accidentally pulled the trigger. And he shot his own... he shot his own wee-wee. Yeah. He was robbing a hot dog place and then he accidentally shot himself in the, the, the dick. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Um God damn it, you cannot you can't that's poetry. You can't write that a write a better story. Tried to steal from a wiener place and he ended up giving his wiener to the place. Oh god, apparently this was all caught on camera, but obviously he was bleeding just everywhere and he, he managed to kind of run away but then he ended up just falling down and collapsing but in the hospital i'm honestly not sure you know what happened and what was to come obviously he wasn't going to be able to either <clears throat> guess this next robbery he's shooting blanks huh yeah no 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 mike i do know however that he was charged with um armed robbery and he was sentenced to 10 years in prison and honestly i i don't know if he is still uh capable of having children. I, I, I guess he's not hard up for money anymore. God damn it, Mike. Anyway, bye. <laughs> this guy sure led an adventurous life before he was executed. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Thomas Otis Knight. Viewer discretion is advised. <sighs> Swear to God.
Thomas was born on February 4th, 1951 in Fort Pierce, Florida. Yep, Florida. I don't like the reflection. He was, I guess, the second oldest of nine kids. He did grow up in a pretty shitty household, like he was beat by his dad a lot. His dad was an alcoholic, and unfortunately, he had to witness his dad sexually assault one of his sisters. Obviously, this causes a lot of trauma, and it led to kind of a life of crime pretty early on in his life. Primarily, like, burglaries and stuff like that. By 1974, he is working for a man named Sidney Gans. You know, Sidney had a lot of money. He was wealthy. On July 17th, 1974, Thomas would basically abduct Sidney Gans from the parking lot of their work. He pointed a rifle at him and said, get in the car, drive home, we're gonna go get your wife. And he complies with everything he asks. Thomas makes him then drive to a bank where he forces Sydney to go in and withdraw $50,000 in cash. He then makes Lillian drive the car around the area of the bank while Sydney is doing that. While in the bank, Sydney tells them what's happening. The bank then contacts the FBI, who then gets in contact with the Miami-Dade, Florida Police Department. And they quickly find the car that the three of them are now driving around in. But at one point, the police lose them. Within like 30, 40 minutes after this, they find the car with all the doors open. When they approach it, Thomas is gone. Lillian Gans had been shot dead inside the car. About 25 feet away, the body of Sydney was found, also shot dead. A couple of hours later, they find Thomas Otis Knight and they arrest him. He is then charged with murder, and while awaiting the next legal point of this little adventure, he's in the Miami-Dade jail. On September 19th, 1974, Sydney, along with about 10 other prisoners, they manage to break out and escape the jail. And they all go on a frickin' rampage. He himself commits about 9-10 armed robberies. During one of these burglaries, he ends up shooting and killing a man named William Culpepper. He was the clerk at this particular convenience store. Thomas Otis Knight was then added to the FBI's most wanted list, and a nationwide manhunt began. Three weeks later, he was finally found, and he was captured, and he was rearrested. In April of 1975, he is sentenced to death for the murder of the Gans, but he is not done yet. This was Richard Burke. He had worked at the Florida State Prison. He specifically worked on death row. In October of 1980, from what I understand, Thomas Knight was asked to shave his beard and his mustache, all of his facial hair off, in order to, I guess, have a family member come visit. The reason why, I'm not sure. Thomas Knight refused, but this made him really pissed off. And so that day, when Burke was escorting Thomas Knight to the showers, Little did he know, Thomas Knight had sharpened up a spoon and he stabbed Richard Burke repeatedly. Richard Burke would die. His death was brutal. It was horrific. On January 20th, 1983, Thomas Burke goes on trial for the murder of Richard Burke. He is found guilty and he is sentenced to death again. He now has three death sentences. No, lucky for him, they don't get to revive you after the first one, bring you back to life by some miracle of God, and then execute you again. He only has to go through it once. And so, for the next couple of decades, he lived here in the beautiful Florida State Prison. He lived there until January 7th, 2014. Thomas Otis Knight was strapped to a table, and he was injected with lethal injection chemicals, and he was pronounced dead. His last meal was very sweet. Sweet potato pie, coconut cake, banana nut bread, a quarter bottle of Sprite. Who needs all those bubbles? Two tablespoons of strawberries. I'm, I'm not sure what that means. Butter pecan ice cream. Good lord, my guy. Vanilla ice cream. And also some Fritos corn chips. I think bro was looking to die of diabetes or heart failure before the lethal injection took him. He made no final statement. And so his four victims, I don't have a photo of Mr. Culpepper, unfortunately. But his four victims got the justice they all rightfully deserved. Monsters is the only word I can think of to describe these two demons. Oh, okay, two words now. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Thornton family murders. Fewer discretion is advised. At the time of this story, Desiree Thornton was a 38-year-old mother to two children. She had been running her own fitness center, and she was going to school full-time, and she was going for her master's of social work. She had two wonderful children, nine-year-old Anthony, and then 16-year-old Jared, and the family happily lived in Pulaski, Tennessee. 
On the night of October 22nd, 2009, these two, William Angel and Matthew Wood, they broke into the Thornton house. Why did they do that? Because Matthew Wood here was under the impression that Jared, the 16-year-old, was somehow in a relationship with his girlfriend. Guess what? He wasn't. But Matthew felt he needed to teach Jared some kind of lesson. A fatal, life-ending lesson. So they entered the Thornton home in the middle of the night through a window, and they were armed with a folding knife. And they also had a gas can full of gasoline. They found Jared in his bedroom, and they took that knife, and they stabbed him multiple times until he was dead. They then went to Desiree's room, where they stabbed her, but she managed to run away. She grabbed Anthony and was able to run out of the house towards their vehicle. Unfortunately, Matthew Wood was able to catch up with them, and he yanked Desiree out of the car. He then stabbed her and slit her throat. The nine-year-old boy, Anthony, ran from the car, but they caught him too. They started to stab him, and according to them, he screamed, quote, Stop. It hurts. Please stop. Don't kill me. I'm just a little boy. End quote. They then cut his throat. Then they had all three bodies stacked up in the house. They dumped gasoline all over their bodies. They ran out of gasoline. So they get into their car, which they borrowed from one of their moms. They drove to get more gas, came back, and dumped it all over the house. They then set the entire house on fire. They also killed the family dog. The dog was in the car when they all tried to escape, and they closed the door of the dog inside. They set the car on fire. And then this is all that remained of the house. Matthew Wood had cut himself uh, while he was stabbing the victims, and so he left his own blood behind as well. The autopsy reports would show that all three of them were actually still breathing when the fire was set. So not only had they been stabbed with their throats cut, they were then burned alive. Matthew Wood managed to burn himself, and so he went to the hospital after the fire. And that's how police linked him to the case. The blood they also matched to Matthew Wood. They also found the victim's blood in William Angel's vehicle. So both men were arrested and charged with the triple homicide and animal cruelty and arson and robbery. They both got life without parole. Hey, here's a fun factoid. Every time I see a creator selling or advertising a product from the TikTok shop, and I don't mean small business owners who are trying to sell their own products. I mean creators who are trying to sell or advertise a product we've seen a billion times over from a billion different creators on this app. And if I really enjoy that product and I'm like, you know what, they did a really good job selling it and I wanna buy that, guess what? I immediately go onto Amazon, I see if they sell it, and I buy it from Amazon. Even if it's more expensive. Yeah. You should, you should all try that too. Yeah. Why don't they just rename the app QVC2? It's the sequel to the home shopping network that literally nobody on TikTok asked for. But hey, at least TikTok isn't going to be forcing its users to film in landscape mode and try to pretend like they're YouTube. You know what I mean? What? Shit. He would commit ritualistic murders in order to distract police from his own sexual assault case. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Toa Peyo murders. Viewer discretion is advised. On January 24th, 1981, the body of nine-year-old Agnes Ng Siu Hyuk was found. And this was in the Toa Peyo, Singapore area. The nine-year-old girl's body was found stuffed into this bag. The young girl was last seen alive at the Toa Peo Church, which was less than a mile away from where she was found. The coroner determined that she had been smothered to death and her body was mutilated. Specifically, her genitals had been mutilated. And they found male bodily fluid inside of her. Police immediately questioned 250 to 300 people in the area, but at first they came up with nothing. And then on February 7th, 1981, another body of a child was found. Ten-year-old Ghazali bin Marzuki. He was reported missing the previous day. Some witnesses saw him getting into a taxi with an unknown man. His cause of death was he was drowned. And there were indications that he was also suffocated. There were no indications of sexual assaults on him. But he did have burn marks on his back. And puncture marks in his arms. Later, the coroner would determine that he had traces of a very strong sedative in his system. 
Police found a trail of blood that literally led them from where his body was found to this apartment building. And the red strip here is just highlighting the apartment that it led to. When police were able to get inside the apartment, there were a bunch of what they consider to be ritualistic things. A lot of ritualistic and religious symbols, not only in the apartment, but also on the apartment door. Inside lived these three people, Adrian Lim, Catherine Tan Chu, and Ho Ka Hong. These two were a married couple, and this was basically his girlfriend who also lived there. Adrian Lim was a self-proclaimed medium. He claimed that he had the power to cure people's ailments, their sicknesses, prevent death, because he had magical powers to do so. He would like slip into these trances where he would then start talking or speaking in tongue. He would put on different voices and accents. He would convince women that he could cleanse all of the evil out of them as, as long as they had sex with him. And most of them agreed. He took advantage of the insecurities primarily of younger females and he tricked them into basically having sex with him while he was married and had a girlfriend at home. This is inside of their apartment, and this is eventually where they would learn the murders of those two children took place. They would find blood in the apartment that would lead back to the two kids. They also would learn that Adrian Lim had essentially tortured other people in this apartment by using, like, electrocution. He claimed that electrocution could be used to rid evil of people, and actually one person died while doing this, but it was deemed to be an accident. And so Adrian was never in trouble for it. And so not only do they find evidence of, you know, the children's blood, the two victims' blood in there, the blood that also led them to this apartment, but they also had these other things like these electrocution devices, these devices to torture people. His apart this was just a wild place. And they quickly learned that Adrian was literally under investigation for a sexual assault charge. A woman who basically wouldn't fall to his you know, tricks, he would end up sexually assaulting her because, you know, he so wanted what he wanted. And so what they would find out was that he felt if he committed ritualistic murders of these two children and possibly more, it would distract police from investigating him for the sexual assault. Meaning he thought he could convince people that this was being done by somebody else and all of the police would be looking at this and, and forget this other case. And it is believed that there were ritualistic aspects to these two murders. But it, it sounds like it was primarily just a show. Because I don't even know if Adrian truly believed any of these things. It doesn't, he probably didn't. But this is just some of the stuff they collected from his apartment. Some of it was evidence linking to the kids. Some of it were weapons. They found a lot of stuff. And they were able to really trace these two murders right back to this apartment and right to Adrian. But they also discovered that his wife and this girlfriend were very much a part of the murders as well. They were, they were very involved. They did nothing to stop it. They helped. And they assisted him murdering two children. Two children. Kids. So they were all arrested. And they were all charged with two counts of murder. The trial was one of the biggest in Singapore's history. It lasted for several months. And in the end... All three of them were found guilty and they were all sentenced to death. The apartment, the bloody apartment of horror, was eventually cleaned out and sold to a Catholic family. On November 25th, 1988, the trio were led to the gallows and they were all hung by the neck until dead. Adrian Lim smiled his entire walk to the gallows and was smiling while they placed the noose around his neck. He seemed to have no remorse. But all three of them are executed. Quite honestly, good riddance. A young boy was snatched from his crib. Or was he? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Trenton Duckett. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this story, Trenton Duckett was just a two-year-old boy. He was about three foot tall and weighed 35 pounds. His mother was Melinda Duckett. And his father was Joshua Duckett. Joshua and Melinda had a very tumultuous relationship. He and her had started dating when they were in high school, and they got married in 2005. But by 2006, they're going through a divorce. At that time, Melinda had been accusing Joshua of abusing her and also abusing Trenton. But from what I can see, there was never any clear-cut evidence of to support that. 
Later on, Joshua would come out later and say that it was actually Melinda who was the abusive one. She had been abusing Trenton. Physically abusive, verbally abusive to both of them. I guess he even claimed that he had like recordings of this. But she was able to get a restraining order against Joshua, temporary, because she alleged that Joshua had threatened her life and Trenton's life. But there was, again, no proof to actually back that up. Two-year-old Trenton seemed to spend a lot of his time with his grandparents, and sometimes he was actually in the care of the foster system. But he was back with Melinda at the time of this case. There's one other, like, interesting fact about this case that may be unrelated, but Joshua's dad... Is, oh, shit, fucks in applesauce, my guy! God, bless it! Jump scare alert, sorry. His dad, James Jimmy Duckett, a former cop, is actually on death row for murder. It was a crime he committed back when Joshua was still a very young kid. Joshua would visit him all the time as he grew up, though. On August 27th, 2006, Melinda said she put Trenton to bed at about 7 p.m. Two hours later, she goes to check on him, and suddenly Trenton is gone. His bedroom window had a big slit going through it to indicate that someone had broke into the home. And so at first, once police got involved, they believed this was 100% a child abduction. And it was all hands on deck to find this little boy. Trenton's dad, Joshua, had pretty much always been very cooperative with police. He took a polygraph test, which he passed with flying colors. He seems to have always been involved in looking for the boy. He is, you know, constantly seen out in public. He's crying. He is just out there looking for him. He's all over the news talking about Trenton. But Melinda seems to be a little more reserved. They shit. God. They did look into any connection possibly that Joshua's dad may have with this, but they found nothing. About a week or so after this occurred, the police would come out and say that they weren't positive that he disappeared the time Melinda said she did, he did. As a matter of fact, no one had seen Trenton for almost a full day prior to when she said he went missing. And that's when Melinda had picked Trenton up from daycare. She refused to take a polygraph test, but she did take a voice stress test, which she failed. In her home, they actually found in the trash can photos of Trenton, and some of his toys had been thrown away as well. Why would she do that? It could really mean nothing, but police did find it to be a bit strange. Melinda said that on the day that he would later go missing, the two of them went to the Ocala National Forest. She said she was armed with a shotgun, and there was, I guess, a shooting range there that she went to with this two-year-old kid. Then she says after leaving the forest, she got lost somewhere in that area, and it took her eight hours to find home. That's when police released the images of her car to see if anyone could validate her story. But they never had any luck. Some witnesses actually reported seeing her in the, I guess, the city of Leesburg at the time she said she was missing. Thirteen days after Trenton vanished... Melinda Duckett was found in the closet of her grandparents' home, and she was dead. She died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. She left behind notes like this. Several of these notes, she said how much she loved Trenton, but she was really um, upset by how she was being ridiculed and mocked and blamed in the news. But in these letters, she never even indicated remotely closely to where Trenton may be. Nancy Grace had basically taken this case, for the news at least, and I guess she had a really strong interview with Melinda. Like she was, you know, Nancy Grace <laughs> to Melinda. And so Melinda's family ends up suing CNN and Nancy Grace for basically wrongful death. That her pushing this narrative that maybe Melinda had something to do with it, you know, maybe that pushed Melinda over the edge. From what I understand, they settled out of court. It should be noted that Melinda had a very long history of depression and other attempts to end her life. Two weeks after her death, police officially named her as a suspect in the disappearance of Trenton Duckett. As a matter of fact, she was considered the prime and only suspect. It sounds like the investigators don't really have any evidence or proof to say that she caused him any harm or that she killed him. That, you know, maybe she gave him to someone, but that someone has never come forward. And Trenton has never been seen. There was like rumors that maybe she sent him to South Korea to basically live with, you know, her family. She was actually adopted when she was a very young child and she had been living in the States for most of her life and she never knew her birth parents. But they couldn't find any proof of that either. 
and it sounds like police just really don't know what happened to Trenton Duckett. If alive today, he would be about 19 years old and look something like this. If you have information, please call 352-787-2121. Hell. <clears throat> Sorry for being here. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the two Jimmies. Viewer discretion is advised. Unfortunately, I don't have any photos of their victims. And so this is all I got. <laughs> Jimmy Glass and Jimmy Wingo were both from Louisiana. In 1982, they were in a parish jail in Minden, Louisiana specifically. But on Christmas Eve 1982, the two of them managed to escape their jail cells and the jail itself. Once they escaped, they found themselves nearby in Dixie Inn, where they broke into the house of a couple, a married couple, Newton and Erlene Brown. Newton was 55 years old and his wife Erlene was 51. Now, depending on which one is telling the story, Jimmy Wingo says he sent in Jimmy Glass to the house to burglarize it. Jimmy Glass, however, says he was held at gunpoint by Jimmy Wingo and basically forced into doing this. But in the end, what we do know for a fact that happened was the two men burglarized the Brown home and then they stole their car. And before they left, they shot dead both people. The married couple had been tied up and they were basically shot and killed at what appeared to be execution style. Jimmy Glass says Jimmy Wingo forced him to shoot the couple. Jimmy Wingo has said, I never killed anyone. I'm an innocent man. However, they were both present at the house when these murders occurred. And in most places, you are still considered guilty of the murder, even if you didn't pull the trigger, if you were there and you are still in the act of committing another crime, like a felony. Sadly, it was Christmas morning when Newt and Erlene Brown's children came to the house and discovered their parents dead. And the house had been just completely ransacked. In January of 1983, Jimmy Wingo was found in Texas. And then also in January of 1983, Jimmy Glass was found in San Diego. Both men were eventually extradited back to Louisiana. Jimmy Glass admits his participation in killing the couple, but says he was forced at gunpoint with a shotgun. But he said that Jimmy Wingo was absolutely present and in the room when they were both killed. And it was by his order, so. Yet he continued to say, no, I didn't, I, no, no. Both men were charged with two counts of murder and both men were convicted. Both men were sentenced to death. The executions were going to be done by electric chair, which Jimmy Glass argued was cruel and unusual punishment. But both Jimmys lost their appeal. And in June of 1987, both men were executed by electric chair. What are you doing? Texting. Texting who? My sister. Hey guys, I bought the viral half-eaten bag of Skittles off the TikTok shop, and I think you should taste the rainbow with me. Did I do it? Did I fool TikTok into thinking I was, I was selling something? Huh? Anyway, how are y'all doing? <laughs> how are you? How are you? Boop, boop. How you guys doing? Shit, I forgot to do it with the landscape mode on. And so, okay, uh, fuck. Hey, okay, so this is landscape mode. This is how we're supposed to be doing it. So this bag of Skittles is now 99.3% off of the TikTok shop. And it's only $49.99 for shipping if you live within five miles of the factory, but it's $362.47 for shipping if you live like 10 miles. Oh. Just buy them. But you have to act now because you only have three seconds. Fuck, I did it again. Hi. You got three motherfucking seconds to buy this shit. Or else it won't be available in Europe. This is TikTok now. This is TikTok now. Gotta, gotta join the cult. You know, I gotta do the thing. Do you guys want to buy like a mop or something? I think I probably have one around here somewhere. I, maybe, I don't, um, 
I have a fan. I got one fan right now that I can sell you guys if you want it. I need it, but I'll sell it to you. Anyway, hi. Um, if if you if you didn't know, uh, this is where I've been posting videos. Now this is my it's very shaky. This is my my unofficial backup page. That's officially my backup with my main posting page. So if you're seeing me for the first time in a long time, hi. This is me. This is where I'm at now. This is where I'm she was last seen in the company of a young man, but he refuses to say where she is. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Victoria Marquina. Viewer discretion is advised. Victoria was born on October 14th, 2002. And at the time of this case, she's 16 years old and had already graduated high school. Victoria was incredibly intelligent and she was already getting a fast track on college. Victoria's mom said that she had already just a whole bunch of plans for things she wanted to do in life. And for the most part, she seemed happy. But just one day, she would be gone. So she was last seen by her family, specifically her mom, on October 6, 2019. The previous night, Victoria had gone to a concert, but then she didn't come home. Her mom found her car parked in a parking lot. Her mom waited for Victoria to finally show back up to her car, and when she did, they got into an argument about why she didn't come home. Victoria then got into her car, and she took off. And then her mom would never see her again. However, the 16-year-old was seen by classmates on October 8th, 2019. And then on October 9th, her cell phone pinged as it was used. However, police can't say for sure that it was her actually using the cell phone. So after her mom hadn't heard from her in a couple of days, she was reported missing. On October 13th, Victoria's car was found and it was abandoned. However, there was nothing in the car or around the car that showed any signs of foul play and the car didn't yield any evidence. Now, police would learn about this man, 21-year-old Joshua Anthony Martinez. According to at least a couple of witnesses, he was seen with Victoria somewhere between October 10th and October 13th, 2019. I guess the witnesses didn't know exactly which day. Apparently, Victoria and Joshua met online and they had some kind of relationship. When Victoria was reported missing, Joshua went to Mexico. And by every account, he is the last person to ever see Victoria. Now, this all occurred in Amador County in California. He says the last time he saw her was when he dropped her off on October 6, 2019 in Sutter Creek. And he never tried to reach out to her after that day, which is odd because they had just started seeing each other. In June of 2020, he was arrested and brought back to the States for felony charges, essentially sex crimes against a minor, which was about Victoria. But he refuses to say anything about where she is. He won't acknowledge that he had anything to do with it. Her mom is putting up these billboards and they're holding fundraisers and they're raising money, all the while pretty much knowing that this guy had probably something to do with it. And unfortunately, he probably killed her. I think police believe there's foul play. They did charge him with murder, but eventually those charges were dropped due to lack of evidence. And to this day, Victoria is still missing. And so her family needs the public's help. If you have any information, please call this number. Uh, oh, oops. Are you okay? You fall down or what? Oh, f You need a soda or? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Voldemort's lesser known eighth horcrux, William Clyde Gibson. Viewer discretion is advised. Oh, God. This looks like the reject pile at G.I. Joe. William was born in 1957 in Raleigh, North Carolina. According to him, he had a relatively decent childhood. His dad was an alcoholic, but he said he was never abused by his parents. In fact, he was quite spoiled by them. At first, he was getting bullied a lot in school, but then the tables turned when he kind of buffed out and he became the bully. William ends up dropping out of school altogether. He commits a series of like small petty crimes. He joined the army as a mechanic. He then became addicted to illegal substances. He was in prison for a year for stealing a car. By 1991, he ends up committing sexual assault. He also uh, gets involved in a hit and run, and he spends some more time in prison. And then, wow, look at it. It's gorgeous. Ah, oh, it's a shame he turned out to be such a shit.
Well, by 2002 or so, his life of petty crimes would turn to murder. On October 10th, 2002, he met this woman here, 44-year-old Karen Hodella. They met at a bar. Then she ends up going back to, I guess, his apartment. And this is in Jeffersonville, Indiana, by the way. According to him, they get into an argument over prescription pills where he ends up punching her in the face, then takes out a pocket knife and repeatedly stabs her. She dies, sadly, and then he just dumps her body just like garbage. William then gets a tattoo. God, he looks like he uses the phrase yeehaw far too often. He got a tattoo of the date he killed her and then an image of a knife. Karen's body was found a few months later. A few weeks after he committed the murder, he found himself back in jail because he was driving intoxicated. Over the next couple of, oh, yuck. Over the next couple of years, he ends up in and out of trouble. He steals money from people. He's just like in and out of jail, but he's never linked to the murder. On March 24th, 2012, he finds himself in another bar. There he meets 35-year-old Stephanie Marie Kirk. Much like the first individual he murdered, he brought her back to his apartment where they got into a fight over prescription drugs. He then proceeds to beat her, sexually assault her, and then he broke her neck and killed her, and then tried to bury her in his backyard. On April 18th, 2012, 75-year-old Christine Wittes pays William a visit. She used to be a friend of his mom who had passed away a few years prior. She actually was always there for William. She helped him. She gave him money. How did he pay her back? Well, on that day that she visited, he sexually assaulted her and strangled her until she was dead. And then he mutilated her body. He cut off one of her breasts. Then he just left her on the floor of his garage. He then stole her car. Her body would be found and William was then arrested because he was caught driving her car intoxicated. I don't know when exactly this happened, but I hope it hurt. While in custody, he would just basically admit that he killed Karen Hodella. Then he said that he also killed Stephanie Kirk and he led police to her body. And then obviously he was connected to Christine Wittitz. And then he was charged with three counts of murder. He tried to claim that an evil took over him, that he was mentally not aware of what he was doing. He's crazy. But the jury didn't buy it. He first goes on trial for the murder of Christine Wittes. He's found guilty and he's sentenced to death. His response to that was, oh well. He said it was no big deal. He then pleads guilty to the murder of Karen Hodella. Then he goes on trial for a third time. This time for Stephanie Marie Kirk's murder. Before that murder, he did this. He had death row times three tattooed to the back of his head. The courts had to make him grow his hair back out so that the tattoo would be covered before he went to trial again. He was found guilty and he was sentenced to death again. He of course has tried to appeal even though he's confessed and he pled guilty to some of these and he's just, he's just a full on wackadoo. He's been interviewed a lot of times since and he's now claimed that he's murdered 10 times more people than he was found guilty of. One point he said he's committed at least 30 murders across many different states, but nothing has been able to confirm that. William Clyde Gibson still remains on death row waiting for them to give him the, the business. God, that fucking mustache. Ugh.